Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with falafel. That's right, falafel is one of those rare foods like french fries and pizza that pretty much everybody loves. In fact, when I meet someone that doesn't like falafel, I have to admit I'm a little suspicious. I mean, what's not to like about this crispy deep fried chickpea fritter? And while I don't think there's much danger in this video, putting your friendly local neighborhood falafel stand out of business, this really did come out quite well, and I think you're going to be surprised how easy it is. So let's go ahead and get started with the star of the show, garbanzo beans. Also known as chickpeas, or as my family called them growing up, chichi beans. And for the amount I'm making, I'm going to use one generous cup of dried garbanzo beans. And check them out, they have a very cool appearance. They look like little shriveled up, let's say, brains. And what we need to do is soak these before we use them. So pro tip, if you want to make this today, make sure you do this step yesterday. All right, because what we need to do is cover these in cold water and let them soak at least overnight. Personally, I think 24 hours is better, but overnight should be fine. So like I said, we'll cover those with a few inches of cold water and we'll put that in a place where there's a pretty good chance it won't get knocked over. And as long as you've covered those with enough water, the next day they should look something like this. And then what we'll do at this point is drain those very, very well before we transfer that into our food processor and add the rest of the ingredients. All right, a blender will work sort of okay. And yes, you can make this by hand by crushing or chopping, but that's gonna take significantly longer. So try to find a food processor. I guarantee one of your married friends has one. Just borrow it for a day. Tell me you're gonna make it worth your while with falafel. But anyway, we're gonna go ahead and dump in our now very well drained beans, to which I'm gonna add some diced onion. And by the way, even though this is gonna get processed, I think it mixes more evenly if you start by cutting the onion nice and small first. So I'm gonna add in about half an onion, along with a whole bunch of minced garlic, we're also going to need a whole bunch of freshly chopped Italian parsley. Some people also like to use cilantro here, or a combination. We're also going to need some salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. We're also going to throw in a spoon of ground cumin, or cumin, as I believe it's supposed to be pronounced, as well as a little bit of ground coriander. And then we're going to shock the world by putting in a little pinch of cayenne, as well as a small touch of baking soda. No, not powder, baking soda, and a spoon of flour. Just a little, not too much. Okay, one of the big decisions with a falafel mix is do you want it more bready or more beany? And I prefer beany. So personally, I don't want to put too much flour here. And then last but not least, we're going to squeeze in a little bit of lemon juice. And that's pretty much it. And do you need to give it a mix like this before you process it? Probably not. I'm not sure why I did that, but it's too late now. But anyway, once all your ingredients are together, we're simply going to process this, pulsing on and off to start, of course. And what we want to end up with here is something that's pretty finely ground, but not a puree. All right, we don't want to liquefy this or turn it into a really fine paste. And with something like this, it's always a great idea about halfway through to take a little break, take off the lid, take a spatula, kind of scrape everything down off the sides, give it a little mix in case there are any large rogue chunks refusing to get mixed in. So I did that and recommend you do the same thing. And we'll continue to blitz that until, like I said, we have a very finely ground mixture. And instead of trying to think of a very clever way to describe it, let me just show you. This is what I think you want. All right, very finely ground, but not pasty. So we don't want to go too far, but it does have to be ground fine enough to hold a shape because we're going to form these into balls and or other shapes soon. So that's looking good. And at this point, we can transfer that to a bowl and kind of press it and pack it down. And then what we want to do is cover this and let it sit for an hour or two before we start forming our falafel. And yes, I have done these without letting it rest, and it does work. But by sticking it in the fridge for an hour or two, those flavors really are going to meld together. And it's going to be a little easier to work with, which is never a bad thing. So I did pop mine in the fridge for a couple hours, after which we're ready to shape. And I'm just going to make some small balls. I'm going to use one of these little sorbet scoops, which not only gives me the shape I want, but it also ensures these are about the same size each. And by the way, one tip, if you moisten your fingers, these are a lot easier to work with. In fact, there's an old saying in the falafel industry, damp hands make smooth balls. And it really is true. All right, so we're going to form our falafel into the shape of our choice. And at that point, they're ready to fry. So we're going to cook these in 350 degree oil for roughly five minutes. And of course, that time's going to vary with your size and shape. But for the ones I did here, five minutes was just about perfect. And I'm just playing with them here. You don't have to do this. I was just bored, so I gave them a stir. But like I said, we're going to cook those for about five minutes, at which point they should look like this. Beautifully browned and crispy on the outside. Oh yeah, those look done. So we'll transfer those onto a rack to cool for a minute. And we'll take a bite so you can see that gorgeous inside. Look at that beautiful color. And right here you can get a real good look at that texture inside. It shouldn't be too wet, it shouldn't be too dry. It should have the texture of falafel. And as you saw in our last video, I served these with some tahini sauce as a dip, which is just a very simple and very beautiful way to serve them. And I hear you out there, those look amazing. But Chef John, I don't have a deep fryer. 
There's no way I could do these. Well, I got some great news. You don't need a deep fryer. Instead of making balls, just flatten them out into patties and pan fry them for a couple minutes per side. It works beautifully. And they really do come out just as gorgeous. And as you're about to hear, just as crispy. And not only does that technique work, but if you're going to toss yours into a pita to make the traditional falafel sandwich, that shape actually works better. So I threw a couple in a pita, which I generously swiped with hummus, with some diced tomato, cucumber, and onion, and of course finished it with a drizzle of tahini. And that, my friends, for a sandwich that was not invented in America, is incredible. Just one of the all-time great fast foods of the world. And I know that's a concept that's hard for a lot of people to grasp. Healthy, delicious, and beautiful fast food. But anyway, that's it. I'm going to go finish the rest of that off. And I really hope this demo inspired you to give these a try. And what if it doesn't? I'm not going to lie. I'll feel awful. You know, some of these puns just write themselves. But seriously, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Greek lemon chicken and potatoes. That's right, I've never catered to anyone's big fat Greek wedding. But if I did, I'd probably serve this. Not only is it easy to make and incredibly delicious, chicken and potatoes are pretty cheap. So not only would everybody love it, it would be pretty profitable. But happily, I do not cater. Instead, I do whatever this is. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. And in the words of the Greek philosopher Plato, the beginning is the most important part of the work. And that is certainly true with this recipe. So what we want to do first is put our chicken pieces in a mixing bowl. And what I have here is one whole chicken cut into sections. And as amazing as this came out, ideally you're going to use all dark meat for this. And I'll go over that on the blog post. But thigh and leg sections work even better in this recipe. But alas, I had a whole chicken, so that's what I used. Did I just say alas? But anyway, no matter which chicken parts you're using, what we need to do is season them up generously. So we'll start with a whole bunch of kosher salt, followed by some freshly ground black pepper, and then we'll do some dry herb. We'll do a little bit of rosemary and a whole bunch of dry oregano. And because someone will ask, of course you could use fresh herbs in this. But this is one of those recipes where the dry herb just works better. We're also gonna to wanna to do a little bit of cayenne, as well as a fair amount of minced garlic. And then we'll finish off what's basically a marinade with some freshly squeezed lemon juice, and I repeat, freshly squeezed, as well as an equally large amount of olive oil, preferably Greek. And that is pretty much it. So at this point, if we were just roasting chicken, we'd mix this up and proceed, but we're not, we're doing chicken and potatoes. So at this point, we're gonna introduce some peeled and quartered russet potatoes. Yukon gold are also nice in this, but personally, I'd stay away from the waxy potatoes like the red ones. Those don't seem to work quite as well. And once those are in, we wanna give everything a thorough mixing, but not with a spatula. Please use your hand for this. Actually, use both hands for this. But because I'm always trying to keep my camera free of deadly chicken juices, I went with a spatula, and it was as annoying as it was time consuming. But eventually I got it mixed, and once it is mixed, you can let this sit in the fridge for a couple hours if you want, which seems to be a popular option. Or if you want, you could cook this right away, which is what I'm doing, and it still comes out incredibly good. So let's go ahead and transfer this into a lightly oiled, large roasting pan, and I generally like to place the chicken in first, skin side up, and I'll make sure those pieces are nicely distributed before filling in the blanks with our potatoes. And by the way, do not discard any of the marinade. We're gonna spoon that over in a minute. But before we do an incredibly important step, we're gonna drizzle in about a half a cup of chicken broth or water, which is gonna prevent the lemon and garlic from burning onto the bottom of the pan. It's all right if that stuff caramelizes onto the top of the chicken, but if all that stuff blackens to the bottom of the pan, when we serve this with the pan drippings later, it's not gonna have that beautiful fresh lemon herb flavor we really want. So we'll pour in a little bit of broth, at which point we'll spoon the rest of the marinade over the chicken pieces. And not just the chicken pieces, you wanna spoon a little bit over the potatoes too. And once that's been done, this is ready for the oven. So let's go ahead and transfer this into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 45 minutes or so, or until the chicken is cooked through. And what we wanna do after about 20 minutes is pull it out and give these pieces of chicken and potato a little toss in the sauce. And please note, we're just tossing. We're not flipping. Okay, we still wanna end up with the skin side still up. And by the way, you can do this three or four times during the cooking process if you want. I just did it once, but feel free to do this another couple times if you want. And once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and pop that back in and continue until the chicken is beautifully browned and cooked through, which is what I'm looking at right here. And we could at this point serve this as is, it would be magnificent, but we wanna make this even more incredible. Hey, come on, we're trying to make the Pantheon. So what we'll do is we'll transfer our chicken to our serving platter and keep that warm for a minute. Because what we want to do is switch our oven onto broil or up to the highest heat setting you have. And we'll give those potatoes one more toss in that goodness. 
and then we'll toss those back in the oven or under the broiler for a couple minutes to finish the crustification. And not only is that going to put those potatoes over the top texturally, it's also helped to continue caramelizing all that deliciousness in the bottom of the pan, which of course we're going to utilize. So at this point we can add our now perfect potatoes to our chicken pieces. And then all we're going to do to finish this off is add a splash of water or chicken broth to the roasting pan to sort of dissolve and loosen up all that goodness, which we will then strain and spoon over our chicken and potatoes. And by the way, if you want, you can put your flame on like medium here just to keep everything nice and hot while you're doing this. And of course, you could taste for seasoning at this point. You might need a little more salt, but I predict it's going to be perfect. And once that's set, like I said, we're going to strain it and spoon it over our platter. And then we'll finish off with just a little bit of freshly chopped oregano, if you have some. And my version of Greek lemon chicken and potatoes is done. And I'll admit it right now, the chicken is really just an excuse so I can enjoy these potatoes. With that brown crusty surface outside, and then that soft creamy delicious inside, which is soaked in all that flavor from the chicken and the herbs and the lemon and the garlic. And while the potatoes are my favorite, the chicken is equally delicious. In fact, I'm going to take a bite from what would be the driest, most overcooked part, that little piece of white meat from the breast still attached to the wing. And even that piece was moist, tender, and incredibly tasty. But anyway, let's plate this up properly. That was just a little tease. Although since this is Greek food, I believe it's referred to as a Socrates. But anyway, like I said, let's plate this up for the official taste. And while I usually enjoy as is with just a little bit of those pan drippings over the top, if you're in the mood, some kind of cold yogurt sauce is also very nice served with this. All right, I had a little bit of tzatziki sauce from some leftover takeout. So I spooned a little bit of that over. But just a little bit of Greek yogurt with some garlic in it would also be nice. So that's totally optional and up to you. You are the Plato of your plate, bro. So that's for you to decide. But no matter how you serve it, I think you'll find this to be one of the most delicious roast chicken and potato recipes you've ever tasted. So simple, so satisfying, and so delicious that usually when people learn how to make this, they don't just make it once. They make it like once a week for the rest of their lives. It's that good. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy shakshuka. That's right, we're doing breakfast for dinner. Although technically this was originally a dinner that became a breakfast. So I guess we're really doing dinner for breakfast for dinner. But regardless of when you serve this North African dish, it's always comforting and delicious and never not fun to say. In fact, sometimes when I'm not even making this, I'll just yell for no apparent reason, shakshuka. And now that you know about this, I'm assuming you'll probably do the same. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started. And what we'll do is we'll place a heavy skillet over medium high heat and drizzle in a little bit of olive oil. And as usual, by a little bit, I mean a lot. And then to that, we're going to add two ingredients, some diced onions, which is very traditional, as well as some mushrooms, which are definitely not traditional. And we do also want to add some salt at this point. And while the mushrooms are not a classic addition, I really think they're amazing in this. And for me, just make the dish more savory. And what we want to do here is cook these onions and mushrooms, like I said, over medium high heat, for I'm going to guess in say about 10 minutes or so, until they give up any and all excess liquid and start to turn golden. And as they start to take on a little bit of color, that flavor is going to get meatier and, in my opinion, way more delicious. So like I said, we're going to take our time and we're going to cook them until they look something like this. So those are looking pretty good right there. And at this point, we can introduce another key ingredient, our peppers. And we're going to use three kinds, even though it only looks like two. I have some diced sweet red bell pepper, as well as a red Jimmy Nardello pepper, which is also mild. And then as you can probably see, one sliced jalapeno. And we will stir that in and we'll cook that for about five minutes until those peppers start to soften up a little bit. And then once that's happened, before we add our tomato product, what we wanna do is add our spices and cook those for a couple minutes in this mixture. So at this point, I'm gonna add a spoon of cumin as well as some paprika. And by the way, any kind of ground chili pepper would work here. We're also gonna do a little touch of turmeric which by all reports is super good for you, and you should try to eat a lot of. We're also gonna add some cayenne, of course. You knew that was coming. And then last but not least, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper, and we'll stir in those spices, and we'll let those cook for a minute or two in this mixture, to, as I like to say, wake up the flavors, which really has to do with the flavor of those spices sort of infusing into the oil, as opposed to adding them after the tomatoes go in when everything's kind of wet. And does it really make that big of a difference? Who knows, but why take any chances? So like I said, we'll cook those spices for a minute or two, at which point we can finally add our crushed tomatoes. 
And of course, unless you're using fresh tomatoes, you're going to want to use those San Marzano tomatoes. And sure, I guess you could use a lower quality if you wanted. That's up to you. But remember, you're in charge of making sure your shakshuka is off the hookah. So suit yourself, but I'm going to go with the San Marzanos. And then because I do want to simmer this mixture for about 15 or 20 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and stir in a nice splash of water so things don't thicken up and reduce too quickly. And I would say about medium heat's probably the best, but you can adjust that up or down a little bit depending on what you're seeing in the pan. But I do want to let this simmer about like that, stirring occasionally for, like I said, about 15 or 20 minutes to really give those veggies time to soften up and sweeten up and just generally give all those flavors time to meld together, okay? So I let mine simmer, stirring occasionally, and approximately 15 to 20 minutes later, it looked like this. And by the way, even though we added some salt at the beginning, you definitely want to taste this for seasoning before we add our eggs on top. So make sure you check this, especially for salt. And then once we've determined this mixture is cooked long enough, what we'll do is we'll prepare the surface for our eggs. And what I mean by that is we're going to take a spoon and make sort of a depression in that sauce, one for each egg we're going to place down, which in my case is going to be five. So I'm going to make five little wells into which we're going to carefully place our eggs. And to do that successfully, here is a huge and very important tip. Do not crack the egg directly into your sauce. Crack it into a ramekin first because you're going to be able to see it before it goes in here. Okay, so very important. Crack it into a ramekin first. That way there's no possible way the yolk can break. Whoops, looks like that one broke anyway. So let me rephrase that. By using a ramekin, you can lessen your chances of a broken yolk. But it still could happen. And yeah, I probably should have stopped the camera and fished that one out and had them all come out perfectly, but I didn't. And no, it has nothing to do with ethics or keeping it real. It has much more to do with laziness. Plus, as you'll see, it's really not that big of a problem. So I really wasn't that upset, allegedly. And then once our eggs are down, we will give each one a little bit of seasoning with some salt and freshly ground black pepper. And then all we need to complete this dish is to keep simmering this on about medium heat, I'd say, until our eggs are cooked to our liking, which can be, for someone like me, very, very soft, to others who like it cooked all the way through like a hard-boiled egg. And while some people like to pop this in the oven to finish the eggs, I prefer to just do it right on top of the stove with a cover, except I don't have a cover that fits this pan. So in that case, I just use a sheet pan, which totally works fine. And this is not going to happen super quick, but you definitely don't want to go anywhere. You got to pay attention. So we'll keep that covered, and then every once in a while, we'll give our shakshuka a little looka. And right here was kind of getting close. And one thing to keep in mind here, if you want your eggs soft like I always do, you're definitely going to want to err on the side of taking this off a little too early, because that mixture is super hot. And by the time you plate this up and find some toasted bread, that egg is going to continue to cook. So I gave it a few more minutes, and then right here, even though it was still underdone, I could tell I was only a couple minutes away. So I proceeded on to the final touches, which really you could do at any time, but I tend to do it at the end here. So I'm going to finish this by crumbling over some feta cheese. To be honest, I usually prefer goat cheese, but this time I did go with feta cheese, which is very wonderful. And then besides the cheese, I'm also going to give it a little drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. It's going to add just a little bit more richness and flavor and also freak out my guests because it looks like raw egg yolk. And then last but not least, a little bit of fresh herb. I'm going to go with Italian parsley although I believe cilantro is probably more traditional. And that's it. As soon as you think your eggs are perfect, your shakshuka is done. So let's go ahead and serve this up while it's still nice and hot. So I usually recommend putting some sauce down in the bowl first, and then topping it with an egg, and then possibly more sauce. And then of course we'll finish that with the mandatory slice of toast. I mean, otherwise, what are you gonna sop up all that goodness with? You gotta have some toast. And then my final touch was a few more drops of olive oil. And yes, that was mostly for the pictures. And once I'd taken a few of those, it was time to dig right in. And you'll notice that even though those eggs were pretty soft when we pulled it off the stove, because that mixture underneath is so hot, by the time you serve this up, it should be perfect. And as I mentioned, I do like my yolk a little runny, so this was just perfect for me. Other people like to cook this all the way through, which is fine. Who am I to judge your eggs? But this is exactly how I like mine. And that is just extraordinarily delicious. That beautifully aromatic, spicy sauce. Just an amazing thing to poach those eggs in. And while admittedly not maybe the most beautiful thing to watch someone eat, this is just so delicious, so hearty, so satisfying, so comforting. It's just no surprise at all it became such a popular dish in that part of the world. Just a fantastic thing to eat, whether it's for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. 
In fact, there's an old Tunisian saying that basically roughly translates to any time is shakshuka time. And I could not agree more. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy pita bread. That's right, by popular demand, this is the pita bread that you saw in the tzatziki video. And unlike lots of other baked products, which are quite frankly better from a bakery, I mean, remember the time you tried to make croissants? Ouch. But this, on the other hand, is so far superior homemade than the stuff you get at the grocery store, it's not even close. And in addition to being delicious to eat, it's also extremely easy to make. So we're going to start by putting one package of yeast in the bowl of our stand mixer. To that, I'm going to add one cup of very warm but not too hot water. And then one cup of flour. And we're going to give that a good mix. And I'm going to let that sit there for about 15 or 20 minutes. So basically, we're doing kind of a very quick sponge here. But mostly, we're just making sure that our yeast is active. And 15 minutes later, if you see it bubbling like this, you know you're good to go. It'll start getting a little foamy, kind of like the head of a beer. Although that's not a very good analogy. But you know what? I just like comparing things to beer. But anyway, when you see those little bubbles, that means your yeast is active and you're ready for the next step. So at that point, we're going to go ahead and dump in some olive oil and some salt. By the way, this dough is actually very similar to our pizza dough recipe. So go ahead and mix in the olive oil and the salt. And then we're going to add the rest of the flour, but not quite all of it. All right, this is going to take about two more cups of flour, but I don't like to add it all at once. A supple, moist, sticky dough is very important here. So I'll add like three quarters of the rest of the flour. Of course, we're going to use the dough hook attachment. All right, I'll give it a mix, and then I'll take a look. And as you can see here, definitely too sticky, still sticking to the sides of the bowl. Needs more flour. So at that point, I'll add a little at a time until I have the perfect consistency. And what that is is just enough flour to make it pull away from the sides and form a very, very supple, very soft, slightly sticky dough. And when it gets to that point, you want to let that knead for at least five or six minutes. And again, you can always add flour, much harder to add liquid. So that's why I don't like to dump in all the flour. Okay, so after five or six minutes of kneading, mine look like this. By the way, my hands are lightly dusted with flour, and that feels amazing. You can tell when you've done a dough right. It just feels incredibly supple and sexy. At that point, I'm going to add a few drops of olive oil to the bowl. All right, I'm going to oil the surface of the dough. And what we're going to do is we're going to cover this with foil and let it double in size. That should take around two hours. Although no guarantees, might be a little less, might be a little longer, but you're going to check. All right, so that's what mine looked like, doubled in size. We're going to remove that from the bowl onto a floured work surface. Go ahead and sprinkle some more flour on top. And then we're going to press it down with our hands, and this is for two reasons. Number one, we want to knock all the air out of it. And number two, we want it into some kind of flat shape that we can cut eight pretty equal size pieces. So that's what I did here. And once you've cut your dough into eight pieces, you're simply going to form these small round loaves. Now, don't stress out too much about this. You could just roll these into a ball if you want. But the official method is to kind of pull the dough from the top down and tuck it up underneath the bottom. So I'm just turning the dough. I'm kind of stretching the top with my thumbs, tucking it up underneath. And I'm just going around and around. And what you'll get is a nice round shape with a very smooth top. And that is it. All right, once your eight little rounds are formed, you're going to cover that with some plastic wrap and let it sit there for about 30 minutes. And 30 minutes later, it's going to look like that. Yes, they will rise a little bit. And you can see my plastic sticking a little bit. You should probably oil that first. I forgot to tell you. And at that point, we are ready to roll our pita breads. So I'm going to take one piece of dough. Again, I'm using a floured surface. I'm going to pat it flat. A little more flour on top. Not too much, just enough so it doesn't stick. And then we're going to roll that out to approximately a quarter inch thick. And by the way, I'm just going to roll out one to get started here. And as they're cooking, I'll roll out other ones so those are resting while I'm actually grilling the first ones. So that's just about perfect right there. And then the last step before we grill these, I want you to let that sit there for five minutes. And you'll notice I'm covering the other dough with a towel so it doesn't dry out. All right, so once your rolled out pita bread has rested for five minutes, we're going to head over to the stove where I have a preheated cast iron skillet on medium high heat. It's been lightly brushed with olive oil. And we're going to place in our pita bread, and we're basically just going to grill it for two to three minutes per side. And that's really all there is to it. So I'm going to go a couple minutes on that side. I'm going to give it a flip, cook it a couple more minutes on that side. And then I'm going to flip it back over to the original side. And you're going to see something that hopefully you see in your pan. That would be the puffin. All right, both sides are going to kind of separate in the center. And it's going to fill with hot air, and it's going to puff up. So I'm just giving this another 30 seconds or so on each side. 
mostly just to show you the puffing. So that's completely normal and desirable. And after it's cooked for about three minutes per side, and hopefully you got a little bit of inflation, we're just gonna pile those up on a plate as we cook them. And that's pretty much it. Now what you just saw would be fairly typical of what you're gonna see in your pan. Although once in a while, you're gonna get this. That's right, the full balloon. Some of them will just separate perfectly in the center and you'll have one big air pocket. So that's kind of like your best case scenario. And I should also add that you don't have to flip back and forth as many times as I am. I'm just doing this to show off my extreme puffiness. And by the way, don't get discouraged if you don't get the full puff. You'll see when these are done, the insides are gonna look great anyway. So whether you get partial puffage or full inflation, you're gonna be fine and these are gonna be delicious. So bottom line, if you grill both sides for about three minutes and it gets kind of blistered and golden brown like that, you're good. That's all you need to do. And once you've cooked your pitas and they're cool enough to handle, you are done. And you're about to experience one of the great bread products in the history of the world. And you can see here as I tear into one, how those layers have separated in the center. And you get that signature pocket. And by the way, this was the original hot pocket. So it all started with this. And of course, the great thing about pockets, they're fun to fill. And for me, it was tzatziki on this day. But I'm sure you'll have no trouble whatsoever thinking of things to stuff your pitas with. Oh, and by the way, if there's a couple listening in the audience by the names of Mary and Paul, you guys should quit your jobs, buy a food truck, sell sandwiches made on this bread, and call it Pita Paul and Mary's. That is a million dollar idea right there. So to Paul and Mary, I say you're welcome. And to the rest of you, I say I really hope you give this delicious homemade flatbread a try. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Afogato. That's right, I believe that's how it's pronounced. Although if it was up to me, I would pronounce it afo gato, which I think sounds a little sportier. But anyway, what it is is a simple yet stunningly delicious Italian coffee dessert. But really, this is two videos in one. I'm also gonna show you how to cold brew iced coffee. That's right, a recipe and a technique for the same low price of free. So here we go. We're gonna start with some freshly ground espresso coffee beans just like you're gonna make coffee, except we're not gonna brew this with hot boiling water. We're gonna do it in cold water, all right? So I'm gonna take a measuring cup. And first of all, that's metric. Let me turn this around. So we have some logical units of measure, a system based on tens. How does that even work? What if something comes out to 11? Crazy. Anyway, we're gonna dump the coffee grounds into the container and we're gonna pour over fresh cold water. We're gonna give that a thorough mixing with a whisk and that is done. Incredibly simple, and because we're not using hot water, you get a very low acid, naturally sweet and delicious iced coffee. So we're gonna mix that up with a whisk, we're gonna wrap it in plastic, and we're gonna put it in a dark place for 12 hours. By the way, I don't know if it has to be a dark place, it just sounds right. And if you want, during the 12 hour cold brewing period, if you wanna give it a mix every once in a while, go for it. But I've done it without mixing it, and it still works. 12 hours later, we're gonna go ahead and unwrap that, give it one last stir, and then we're simply gonna strain it. Now there's lots of methods for this. You could throw this in one of those French press coffee makers. You could put this through a coffee filter, of course, but here's a nice, easy trick that works great. I'm just gonna take a funnel and I'm gonna line it with a damp, high quality paper towel. Now this does not work with those see-through, really cheap discount brands. I'm using the brand that has the guy in the mustache on it. I don't know if he's a florist or a lumberjack or something. But anyway, you gotta use something high quality, otherwise it'll just tear. And it's just barely damp, line the funnel, and then pour in the coffee. And yes, the liquid will drain through. Just let it drip and drip and drip. All right, you're gonna see all the grinds left at the bottom of your container. You could just leave those there. But pour all the liquid in. And when it gets down to the end, it kind of gets clogged up a little bit. Don't worry, just gather up the sides and the rest will drip out. You could even give it a little squeeze. Just be careful though, if it breaks open, you gotta strain it again. And once all that coffee is strained out, you have what's basically a cold brewed iced coffee concentrate. And then to make iced coffee, very simple. It's one part this coffee concentrate with one part regular water over ice, of course. And because everything's nice and cold, there's no melting ice cubes. I'm gonna put a little splash of milk in mine. And like I said earlier, because we're using a cold brewed process, you get a very low acid, very mellow, naturally sweet iced coffee. There's really nothing like it. In fact, to quote my wife, Michelle, that's the best iced coffee I've ever had, end quote. Okay, so it's really delicious, but that's not why we made it. I made it to make afo gateaux. So in a cappuccino cup, I'm gonna put a couple scoops of vanilla bean ice cream. You could also use vanilla gelato, which I think would be even more culturally correct. 
and then we're simply going to pour over our ice coffee concentrate. Do not thin it out with water. We want to use it straight. All right, traditionally this dish is made with hot espresso poured over, but I really like this method better. The ice cream doesn't melt as fast. I also love the way this coffee concentrate kind of freezes over the top of the ice cream. It looks awesome. I'm going to finish that with shaved dark chocolate, and that is a thing of beauty. And like so many Italian desserts, just really simple, super refreshing. It tastes rich, yet it's not really filling. Just a really beautiful way to end any meal. And as you eat it and stir it, it gets thicker and thicker and creamier. It's just such a great hot weather treat. So anyway, there you go. Affogato, just a really super simple summer dessert and also an incredibly easy and delicious way to make iced coffee. So I hope you give that a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy focaccia di recco. That's right, I checkoed myself before I de recoed myself and I'm so glad I did because this came out amazing. Especially since this is the first time I've ever attempted this delicious and super fun to make Ligurian flatbread. This is actually a personal food wish of mine, which might sound a little selfish, but after you see what we do here, I think you're gonna forgive me. So let's get started. Step one is a very, very primitive dough. So in my mixing bowl, I'm gonna add some all-purpose flour, a little bit of salt, a little bit of olive oil, and some cold water. And I'm gonna go ahead and use the dough hook attachment on our stand mixer. And we're gonna need that until it's very soft and elastic, but not sticky. All right, so don't be afraid to start out a little too sticky and add a little more flour as you go to get this perfect texture. And yes, you can absolutely do this by hand. I was just feeling a little lazy. But anyway, like I said, we're looking for a very soft, elastic, but not too sticky dough. So you're gonna want something that looks and feels just about like that. And by the way, I feel sorry for people that don't cook for lots of reasons, but that they don't ever get to feel something like this is one of the big ones. I mean, seriously, everybody needs to feel that at least once in their life. And ideally hundreds, if not thousands of times, okay? But anyway, once our dough ball is formed, we're going to wrap that in plastic wrap and we're just going to let it sit on the countertop at room temperature for one hour. It has to rest. It has to relax. And I'm assuming that flour has to hydrate a little bit for this dough to really work well. All right, so our dough's resting, which is going to give us time to prep our half, half sheet pan. That's right. That is officially called a quarter sheet pan. Very easy to find at any restaurant supply store or online. And it really is one of the secrets to this recipe. You can do this in other pans, and I'll explain that on the blog post, but this is the perfect pan. And to prep that, we're going to very, very lightly grease it with some olive oil, and then a very light sprinkling of cornmeal. All right, so our pan's prepped. At this point, our dough has rested one hour. We're going to unwrap it. I'm going to give it a little dusting of flour, and I'm going to divide it in half. All right, so this recipe is going to make two focaccia di recos, and then I'll cut that half in half, and we're going to take one of those quarters, and we'll pat that out a little bit, flatten it out a little bit. As usual, we're only using enough flour to work with, and we are going to do most of the work with our hands, but what we want to do to start this is take a rolling pin and just kind of start it into the shape of a rectangle. Certainly it does not have to be anything exact, but something like that. I guess that's more of an oval than a rectangle, but you get the idea. And once that's happened, we're going to pick that up with some very well floured hands and we're going to start stretching it. And note to self, next time you do focaccia di recco, wear a long sleeve shirt. But anyway, just pick it up and kind of stretch it over the back of your hands. And if you keep going around like that, the weight of the dough will kind of stretch itself. And as long as you've trimmed those fingernails, you should be okay. And what we want to do is stretch it out, stretch it out until it's large enough to fit over that edge of the pan. And as soon as you think you got it big enough, kind of stretch it over like that and then simply work it and stretch it over the entire pan. And what we're looking for is a very, very thin, almost membrane of dough. And if you get a little hole, just patch it up and keep stretching. You can do this. And like I said at the beginning, this is the first time I tried this. So I'm assuming with practice, this gets a lot easier. And once our bottom layer of dough is done, we're going to go ahead and we're going to place in our cheese. Now, traditionally, stracchino cheese is used, but around these parts, what we get is called crescenza, and it's very, very similar, very, very delicious. And I'm going to put six nice dollops in there, which is about half the amount of cheese that the restaurant that inspired me to do this uses. They use about twice as much, but I think because this was my first attempt, I wanted to go a little less with the cheese, but I promise I will use more next time. And then once we've placed in our cheese, we're going to do the exact same procedure with the top layer of dough. We're going to roll it out to a rectangle. We're going to stretch it over our hands until it's big enough to stretch over the top. We'll stretch it over the first two corners. And once you got one end stretched over, just go around and stretch out the rest. So keep stretching, keep pulling, keep sealing. And you'll notice once it's sealed, you have air trapped in there. That's exactly what you want. You want that top piece of dough stretched thin like a membrane, just like the bottom. You know what? That kind of reminds me of something I saw on a German website one time. 
Anyway, once that's stretched over and you've gone around and sealed the two pieces of dough together, simply take your rolling pin and go along the edge, cutting off the excess dough, and then just take your thumb and kind of roll down the edges like this, and those two layers should be sealed. And to make sure, you can always do a little folding over, a little pressing with the fingertips. But be careful, you do not want a thick crust of dough. This is not pizza dough. So it really needs to be ultra thin to work. So you do not want a bunch of excess dough wadded up around the edges. But that looks good right there. And then for by far my favorite part of the operation, the old pinch pull and tear. So take your fingers like this, and we're just going to tear two or three small holes. I don't know why I found this so enjoyable, but I did. And at this point, it's not going to be a bad idea to preheat your oven to 500. This is going to get cooked in a very, very hot oven. So preheat your oven. And then the last couple steps here, while we're waiting for our oven to get hot, we're going to drizzle over a little more olive oil. And we're also going to give it a little sprinkling of coarse sea salt. And that is ready for the oven. We're going to go ahead and pop that in the center of a 500 degree oven for about six or seven minutes or until it looks like this. The top's going to be browned and crusty. And don't be surprised if it puffs up in the oven. It will. And even though I was risking serious burns, I couldn't help myself. I had to do this for a few seconds. Totally worth it. And yes, a tiny bit of cheese did leak out, but that's fine. That happens in the restaurant I stole this from. I just used my spatula to push that melted cheese under the crust so nobody knew. It'll be our secret. So we're going to transfer that onto a plate or platter. We'll go ahead and cut that in quarters. And then you're certainly free to enjoy as is. But for me, it's best with a nice handful of arugula that you toss in a little bit of olive oil. And I'll put a little bit of greens on there and I'll kind of fold it up New York City style. And you have a beautiful contrast between the two layers. The top is kind of crispy and blistered and caramelized. And then the layer underneath kind of gets soaked with that melty cheese. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful combination. Anyway, good job Italians, in particular Ligurians. Like I said, this was my own personal food wish that I granted to myself. Yes, that is legal. And I really do think you're going to like this as much, if not more, than I did. So I do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Turkish eggs. That's right, I am never surprised when I come across a new way to use a certain ingredient. Unless that ingredient is eggs. In which case, I am totally shocked. Since at my age, I figured I've seen and done it all. And without seeing this, there is no way I would have thought to pair yogurt, poached eggs, and a spicy red pepper butter. I mean, it just seems so bizarre. And it is. But it's also extremely delicious, and maybe my new favorite breakfast. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our yogurt component. And for this, we're going to need some room temperature Greek yogurt. Or Turkish yogurt if you can get it. But you can't. And then to this, we're going to add one finely grated garlic clove, which I'm going to do on this microplane. And what we're going for here is 100% grated garlic with 0% grated fingernail. So when you get down near the end, please be very careful. And one little heads up here, when you do garlic this way, the flavor is going to be very, very sharp and strong. So a little bit goes a long way. And then besides the garlic, we will also add some salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And of course, a little shake of cayenne never hurts. And then we will finish up with a fairly generous amount of chopped dill. And that's it. We'll simply take a spoon and give this a thorough mixing. And other than giving this a quick taste for seasoning, the yogurt base for our eggs is done. Oh, and in case you missed it earlier, we really do want this yogurt to be room temp. In fact, some people even warm it up before they put the eggs on. But for me, as long as it's not cold, it works fine. So once that's set, we will definitely not refrigerate it. We will just leave that out at room temp, and we can move on to the other major component of this dish, which is our red pepper infused butter. And for that, what we'll do is melt half a stick of butter over medium heat, and then wait for it to start to sing, which in the business is what we call this sound. All right, can you hear that? That's what's known as singing butter. And then what we'll do as soon as our butter does reach that stage is toss in a pinch of ground cumin, along with a little bit of smoked paprika, and then a whole bunch of Aleppo chili flakes, or some other kind of red chili flake. But I love the Aleppo, because not only does it taste good, but there's no seeds. And what we'll do is quickly swirl that in the pan, and or give it a stir with a spoon, at which point we will immediately turn off the heat. And believe it or not, that's it. We will just leave that on the back of the stove, and as it sits, those beautiful red chili flakes will continue to infuse that butter with their flavor, and color, of course. And at this point, as long as you can manage to cook a couple eggs, we are pretty much ready to eat. Although I did do one extra bonus component here, which was making a little bit of a parsley and jalapeno oil. 
And for that, all we need to do is grind some chopped parsley, along with a diced jalapeno and a pinch of salt in this mortar. And then once we have that smashed down into a coarse paste, we will drizzle in some olive oil. And then we'll stir and smash and grind that for a minute to produce hopefully a beautifully colored, very aromatic and herbaceous pepper oil, which I thought would be a nice contrast with our dried chili butter. Not to mention would add a little bit of extra visual interest. So like I said, this is optional, but I thought it was a nice touch. And that's it, once all our components are ready and our eggs are cooking, or in my case poaching, we can go ahead and set up our plate, which means spreading some of our yogurt mixture down like this, making sure we form a few ridges and valleys. And then if you made it, we'll go ahead and drizzle over a little bit of our parsley jalapeno oil. And by the way, if you just handed me some bread at this point and said that's your breakfast, I would still be pretty happy. But hang on, this gets much, much better. Oh, and speaking of bread, before we place down the eggs of our choice, we want to be sure we've toasted a few nice thick slices to eat this with. And yes, yeah, some type of pita bread probably would have been more authentic here. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are after all the Wilbur of your Chilbur, and of course the Mr. Ed of witch bread. And that's it, we'll go ahead and top our yogurt with a couple steaming hot poached eggs. Or fried eggs, or over easy. Just not scrambled, please. And that's it, we'll go ahead and finish this off with a couple tablespoons of our still warm Aleppo pepper butter. Oh, and I should mention I was so distracted by how beautiful and unusual this looks that I forgot to finish with a little bit of sea salt over the top. Although, depending on how you season your yogurt, you might not need it. But it's probably not a bad idea. And that's it, once buttered, this exotic and visually stunning dish is ready to enjoy. So we'll tear a piece of our toast in half and bust those eggs right in the yolks. And of course, toasted bread dipped in egg yolks is never not amazing. But when you add in the fact that we're doing this on top of a garlic and herb yogurt spread that's been drenched in this spicy Aleppo pepper butter, it is an entirely new and pretty thrilling experience. I mean, not only do we have contrasting flavors, but just when the heat from that chili seems like it's getting a little too much, it's cooled down by that creamy and herbaceous yogurt. So while this maybe does seem a little bit bizarre, it absolutely works and I loved everything about it. Oh, and if that looks like a lot of butter to you, just relax. Your average American Eggs Benedict with the hollandaise on the top contains about four to six tablespoons of butter. So this is like a diet plate in comparison. Just make sure you've toasted enough bread. And yes, of course this is a very high calorie breakfast, but this is not something you're supposed to serve and then have a cheeseburger for lunch. All right, this is something you eat at like six in the morning and then you go plow a couple fields and maybe wrestle a mountain goat and chop some firewood. And then you come home and have a nice light supper. But anyway, that's it. My take on Turkish eggs, or as my Turkish friends possibly call it, chilber. Like I said earlier, it's always very exciting when we discover something new we can do with eggs, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links in the description below to get the ingredient amounts, complete written recipe, and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy baklava. That's right, at long last, I'm going to show you how I build my baklava. And as funny as it sounds, this recipe always reminds me of lasagna. Because much like that, most people use the same handful of ingredients. But as far as the ratios go, as well as the exact way they're layered, can really vary greatly depending on who's making it. So this is just how I do it. And if you have what you think is a much better way, feel free to keep that to yourself. Because I like how this comes out. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And we'll begin with our nuts. And I like to use two kinds, some walnuts and pistachio. And while you can use one or the other, and many people do, I really do like the combination here. And then the only other thing we're going to add is a spoon of cinnamon, at which point we're going to process these by pulsing on and off until they're sorta but not too finely ground. And thanks to the power of video, I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by that. So this right here is my preferred texture. And once those are done exactly how we want, we'll go ahead and set those aside, and we can move on to assembly. Assuming that is that we've made some phyllo dough, or at least bought some at the store and let it thaw. And by the way, I did make this the night before and left it in the fridge, and it seems to have held up beautifully. Those sheets separated easily, and they were still nice and supple and fairly stretchable. And one big tip here, whether you're using homemade or not, is to always keep these covered as you're working with them. Otherwise, they can get dried out and much tougher to work with. And for that, I like to use a barely, barely, barely damp towel. Okay, it's not so much damp than it is not dry. And then other than melting a stick of unsalted butter, we are pretty much ready to start assembly. 
So we'll go ahead and take that butter and brush it generously into the bottom of whatever pan we're using. And once that's been buttered, we'll go ahead and start building our bottom by layering up five or six sheets of phyllo. And if you happen to see little tears or uneven edges or small holes, do not worry. Okay, we're not machines. We are human. And things are going to happen. But the good news is when this is done, no one will ever know, ever. So please stack these layers with no fear. And generally, the rule of thumb is we're going to butter every two sheets of phyllo. Although, as you'll see later, I don't always follow that. And as you may notice, I'm not brushing. I'm dripping. Do not try to brush the butter on the phyllo. It is so thin, it's going to stick to it, and you're going to have a big mess. So what we'll do is drip over about a tablespoon at a time. And as this thing cooks, that butter is going to distribute evenly between the layers, even though we just dripped it and didn't brush it. So we'll go ahead and build up our bottom, as shown. And I think the minimum number of sheets at the bottom here should be at least five or six. And yes, you can certainly do more. But my favorite part of the baklava is the nut mixture, not necessarily the pastry. Even though that's awesome also, I do try to get away with the least amount of phyllo I can, where it still comes out crispy and amazing. But anyway, once our bottom's been layered, we will go ahead and transfer in exactly one third of our nut mixture, because we're going to be doing three layers of that, separated by just a couple sheets of phyllo. And while some people like to have a third thick layer of phyllo in the center, like we do at the bottom and top, I prefer to place in just two sheets of phyllo, both buttered by the way, in between my nut mixture layers. And for me, those are there just to add a little bit of structure. And they're not really going to be noticeable in the final product. Okay, sort of like when we add a pinch of cayenne. You don't really notice its presence, but you may notice its absence. So we'll do a third of our nuts with a couple buttered sheets of phyllo, and then another third of our nuts, followed by another couple sheets of buttered phyllo. And by the way, no, it's not your imagination. I did speed up the footage here to save a little bit of time on these repetitive steps. Otherwise, I would have had to fill up all the dead air with bad puns and vague references. And nobody wants that. But anyway, if everything's gone according to plan, we should be left with one third of our nuts, which we can go ahead and dump over the top. And then to finish this off, we'll simply go ahead and repeat what we did on the bottom. We will layer up five or six sheets of phyllo, with butter being applied to at least every two sheets. And as I finish this off, I do apologize for the fast motion, which I really do not like to use. I find it annoying and off-putting, but I thought it was the lesser of two evils, since I didn't want to edit out any of the actual layering steps. So thank you for putting up with that. Oh, and I probably should mention, I'm using a round pan here, but literally any pan that's deep enough will work. Okay, you may have to adjust your amounts and the amount of phyllo you make and the size and shape of it, but the technique is not going to change. So you go ahead and make this in anything you want. I mean, you are, after all, the Frank Sinatra of your baklava. And if I can make it here in a round pan, you can make it anywhere in a different shape pan. But anyway, we'll go ahead and finish off phyllo-ing the top with, like I said, at least five or six layers. I believe I did six. And ideally, once you've placed on that last piece of phyllo, you should have just enough butter left to generously coat the top. And I realized I said earlier to drip, not brush. But once this gets built up towards the end when it gets kind of sturdy, you can actually do a little bit of brushing without causing much damage. So we'll go ahead and apply the last of our butter, at which point we need to cut this into portions before it goes in the oven. But not yet. Okay, we're not going to be able to effectively cut this until it's cold, and that butter hardens up and stiffens our sheets of phyllo. So what we'll do is cover this and pop it in the fridge for about an hour, at which point we're going to cut this into the beautiful traditional diamond pattern. And to do that, we'll make three or four cuts in one direction, and then turn the pan and make three or four cuts diagonally across the other way. And if you have a steady hand, which I don't, and you know what you're doing, which I don't, you will get perfectly shaped, absolutely even pieces. In other words, the opposite of what I get, which is every single piece a different size. So if you want to sketch a pattern on top to make these more even, go ahead. But I can't even pretend to be concerned with that. Because as you'll see, once this is cooked, it looks amazing no matter how you cut it. But either way, this has to be cut before it goes in the oven. Otherwise, it's virtually impossible to cut without wrecking the top. So once cold, we'll go ahead and cut that into pieces. At which point, it's finally ready for the oven. So let's go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about an hour or until beautifully browned. And what we'll do while that's cooking is complete our last component, the sugar and honey syrup. And for that, we're going to need a little bit of sugar, as well as three whole cloves. I'm also going to toss in a spoon of honey, which wasn't runny. It was kind of crystallized. 
but that's fine for this. And then last but not least, we will pour in some nice cold fresh water. And we'll go ahead and place that over medium high heat. And we can go ahead and stir that together. And then all we need to do here is patiently wait for this to come to a boil, which is going to take a couple minutes. But don't walk away. Because as soon as that starts to boil, what we'll do is give it a stir and turn off the heat because we're done. That's it. Very simple. And you'll see as this stuff settles down, it should be relatively clear. And then what we'll do with the heat off is add the last two ingredients. One very familiar, a little touch of pure vanilla extract. And then one that's not familiar, orange blossom water. Oh yeah, so exotic. Which is going to add this gorgeous citrusy floral element. Which doesn't sound great, but it is. And that's it. Once those two things are stirred in, it is ready to ladle over our hopefully now baked baklava. And there it is. Like I said, we're going to bake that for about an hour at 350 until it's beautifully browned. And just to help you visualize, the bottom is going to be one shade darker than the top. So I use that as my guide, and I try to get that just one shade past golden brown, knowing that the bottom will be beautifully browned. Okay, because we do not under any circumstances want a soggy bottom. So that is looking just about perfect. And what we'll do is let that sit for just five minutes before ladling over our syrup. And by the way, if you have a guest over, maybe it's date night, make sure they watch you do this step. Because there's no way to do this and not look cool and sexy. It's impossible. And to those people thinking, man, that's a lot of sugar syrup. It is, but it's about 25% less than most recipes call for. So I'm sort of doing a little bit of a diet version here. But anyway, we'll go ahead and apply that to our still hot baklava. And then by far the hardest step, we have to let this cool down to room temp before we eat it. All right, it's not good hot, nor is it good cold because the butter hardens. This, in my opinion, should be eaten exactly at room temp. And while you're waiting, you can just stare at it and pick out your piece. I think I'm going to go bottom right. Although not for the final plating and pictures. For that, I use one of my few perfect diamond shaped ones. And to finish, I like to grate over a little bit of pistachio because I'm kind of fancy and I think it looks good. And that's it. Once cooled down to room temp and possibly pistachio dusted, our baklava is ready to enjoy. And I hate to think you've never had this before, but if you haven't, man, are you in for a mind altering treat? All right, we got that crunchy, buttery phyllo on the bottom and then our rich, fragrant, sticky nut layer, all topped with more buttery, crispy phyllo. And I was just about to say, as far as sweets go, this is one of the greatest bites of food in the world. But forget just sweets. This is just one of the greatest bites of food in the world. And now if you'll excuse me, I need to finish this. And also that oddly shaped one I picked out earlier. So whether you use the phyllo from the store, or you significantly raise your foodie street cred by making your own at home, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Chicken Marbella. That's right, I'm going to show you my version of the Silver Palette's famous Chicken Marbella, which was named that because they couldn't call it chicken with olives and prunes, since nobody's ordering that. But despite that possibly weird-sounding combination of ingredients, this is without a doubt one of the top five most delicious chicken recipes ever. Maybe top three. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our chicken. And for this, I like to use 12 of the largest bone-in, skin-on chicken thighs I can find. And whenever we work with these, I think we should find the thigh bone, which runs this way. And once we identify that, we'll flip it over and make two cuts perpendicular to the bone, right through the skin like this, about an inch and a half apart. And that will allow our marinade to get in a little deeper and a little quicker. And I also think it makes for a little more interesting appearance. So we'll go ahead and do that to all 12. Oh, and I should mention, the original recipe is done by cutting up whole chickens, pretty much like we would do if we were making fried chicken. But for me, the thighs are the most user-friendly choice, and we don't have to worry about the white meat drying out while we're waiting for the dark meat to cook through. But anyway, once our chicken's prepped, we can move on to this very simple but incredibly delicious marinade, which starts with a whole bunch of crushed garlic, plus an equally generous amount of dried oregano, followed by some freshly ground black pepper, and then of course some kosher salt, with the rule of thumb being one teaspoon per pound of meat. And then we'll also do a few shakes of cayenne, even though that's not in the original recipe, right? They probably just forgot it. And then we will also add a little bit of caper brine, which is the liquid the capers are packed in, 
And you will see the actual capers in a minute. But for now, we'll just add the juice. And that's it. We'll finish up with some red wine vinegar, as well as some nice olive oil. And then we'll grab a whisk and give this a quick mix before we head over to whatever container we're going to marinate our chicken in, which in a perfect world is something large enough to fit all the thighs in one single layer. And then besides the chicken and the marinade, we will also need some halved green olives, some chopped up prunes, which I'll talk about in a second, and some capers. And what we'll do is take half of each of those things and we'll scatter those over the bottom of this container. And yes, you'll definitely want to buy the pitted olives for this. And then regarding the prunes, which I like to chop up pretty small, I'm not sure how many people realize those are actually dried plums, but some genius a long time ago decided not to call them dried plums, since I guess that sounded too delicious, and they named them prunes instead, which does not sound as good. But anyway, we'll toss half of those three things in the bottom, and then we will place in our chicken, skin side down, and once those have been placed in, we'll give our marinade a quick stir, and then apply a nice generous spoonful to the top of each thigh. And I will admit, this step may or may not be necessary. All right, we probably could just dump over all the marinade, and it would probably come out very close. But this just feels right, so I do it. Okay, it's part of the ritual of cooking that you always hear me talking about. And then what we'll do is go ahead and flip these over. And then once we have all those thighs turned with the skin side up, we can take the rest of our olives and prunes, sorry, I mean dried plums, and capers, and we can scatter the rest over the top. And then eventually we will top everything with the rest of the marinade. And by the way, if you don't have a container like this, where everything fits perfectly, you can just use a roasting pan, or one of those large foil pans you use for your turkeys. Or even if you want a large bowl, or a plastic bag. Okay, as long as the meat's surrounded by all this goodness, we're going to be fine. But if you do have something like this, I think it's an advantage since we know everything's going to be evenly and properly marinated. But anyway, like I said, once all that's been applied to the top, we'll go ahead and spoon over the rest of the marinade. Oh, and I forgot to mention, there's supposed to be a few bay leaves tossed in here, which I decided not to add, because I forgot to write it down when I transposed the recipe. So I will add a note to the written recipe if you want to add those. And then before we cover this, if you have it, I like to place a piece of parchment paper over the top, and give that a nice firm pressing down. But this is optional and you don't have to do it, but I like to. Again, it just looks and feels right. And then what we'll want to do is cover this and then pop that in the fridge to marinate for 24 hours. Okay, just overnight is fine, but if you can go the full 24 hours, I think it's even better. And that's it, the next day we will pull it out and unwrap it. And we will place that skin side up in a nice large roasting pan and then once that pan's been thighed, we'll go ahead and take any of the remaining olives, capers, and dried plums, and we will scatter those evenly over the top, along with any of the excess marinade. And as we get to the end of that task, we will want to sort of clear off the top of the thigh, and you'll see why in a second as we transfer on the last ingredient. But first we need to add the second to last ingredient, which would be pouring over one cup of white wine. Or if you don't do wine, you could do some chicken broth with a splash of vinegar in it. So if you want to do that instead, feel free. I mean, you are after all the playa of your chicken marbella, but the wine is highly recommended if you can use it. And then to finish this up, believe it or not, we're going to sprinkle the tops with some brown sugar. I know you didn't see that coming. Nobody does. And in the original recipe, we would sprinkle all of it on top now, but I'm just going to use about half the amount at this point. And then we will add the rest after we baste. But first things first. So once our chicken's been brown sugared as shown, it is ready to transfer into the center of a 350 degree oven for about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half total. But after about 40 to 45 minutes, we should probably pull it out and give it a basting just to kind of moisten the tops and take a look at everything. Plus it's a proven scientific fact that basting is therapeutic. Oh yeah, if you have a lot of stress, you should try this. And then what we'll do after a little bit of basting is finish the sugaring. And in case you're keeping score at home, I'm definitely using less brown sugar than the original recipe, since I think there's plenty of sweetness coming from those dried plums. But anyway, once that's been accomplished, we will pop it back in the oven until it's cooked to our liking, which for me is the meat being fork tender, but not falling off the bone. And for an optional step, once we think our chicken's almost cooked, 
We can crank the heat up to like 425 for the last 15 minutes or so, just to get some extra browning on the top. And once we're done, if everything goes according to plan, our chicken should look like this. And then you don't have to, but I'm gonna give these one more baste so the tops are nice and shiny for the pictures. And then for a final, final touch, this is traditionally sprinkled with chopped parsley. And that's it, our chicken marbella, or as many of you will insist on calling it, chicken marbella, is ready to enjoy. And we really should let this cool down a little bit before trying to eat it, but I was starving and could not wait. So even though it was too hot, and I knew it was gonna be hard to cut in the pan, I went in for a taste anyway, and that, my friends, as I mentioned in the intro, is one of the most delicious chicken dishes of all time. And many claim the most delicious chicken dish of all time. So I took a couple quick bites before plating some up properly. And by properly, for me, I mean on some mashed potatoes. Although this really is fantastic on so many things, including rice and pasta. And we will definitely want to spoon over plenty of those olives and dried plums, along with copious amounts of the cooking liquids, which we could thicken up if we wanted to bother, but we don't. Just spoon it over like this and start eating. And what makes this so incredibly enjoyable to eat is that it has everything. Okay, it has the perfect balance of sweetness and tanginess and brininess and saltiness. And all that is perfectly balanced by the acidity from the wine and the vinegar, which really cuts through the richness and that sweetness from the fruit. So to summarize, I loved everything about this. And you might be thinking, if this is so incredible and one of the greatest chicken dishes of all time, why have I never heard of it? Well, I think it's because this originated in New York City in the late 70s at the Silver Palette. And while it was a viral sensation there, it was much harder for a dish like this to gain popularity in other parts of the country. Mostly because this was before the internet. And you actually had to talk to other people or read about it in a magazine or newspaper so news about a dish like this really didn't travel that fast. But anyway, now we do have the internet and people like me showing you how to make it. So now there is no excuse for you not to know about and make and enjoy this dish on a regular basis. And I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Lentil flatbread. That's right, when I first heard about this, or I should say overheard about this, since I was actually eavesdropping on some vegans. And how did I know they were vegans? Oh, you can tell. But anyway, they were talking about this flatbread you could make using nothing but lentils and water, and it kind of sounded too good to be true. So I did a search, and then a test, and I'm happy to report they are real and spectacular. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with basically the one and only ingredient. And that would be a cup of red lentils, which I probably would have called orange lentils. And the reason we want to use this variety is because the hull's been removed and they're split in half, which is why these are the fastest cooking of all the lentils and why they work so well in this recipe. And what we'll do to prep these is add them to a blender or a food processor if you want. And then we will add some nice cold fresh water and we will let these soak for at least three hours. And yes, I believe you can go longer, but I hear about three hours is the minimum. So we'll go ahead and let those sit. And after the soaking period, they will have swollen up. Or is it swelled up? Anyway, they're going to be all swelled up and probably look something like this. And that's it. Once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and blend these on high speed until we formed a very smooth, relatively thin batter. And believe it or not, and at first I didn't, that's it. We will simply pour that into a bowl, and then if we want, and you definitely do, we will season this with some salt. Because as I've said many times, a bland legume is a bad legume. So I am definitely going to stir in some salt at this point. And that's it. Once blended and probably seasoned, we can if we want use this right away. But I do think it's better if we wrap it up and pop it in the fridge overnight. Okay, I can't tell you exactly what happens, but the taste and texture seem to be a little better. But fair warning, if you do make them the next day, the mixture is going to kind of separate. So before we use it, we'll need to take a whisk and give it a good mix. And you'll also probably notice it will have thickened up just a touch. And that's it. As soon as that's mixed up, we can head to the stove and cook these up, which I did in a nonstick pan set over medium high heat. And while that's getting hot, 
We're going to carefully rub the surface with an olive oiled paper towel, just to lubricate that a little bit. And then once we think that pan is hot, but before it starts to smoke, we will pour in about one third cup of our batter. And then we'll use the back of a ladle or a big spoon to sort of spread that from the center out to create a nice even circle about five or six inches across. And then what we'll do for the next two minutes or so is absolutely nothing. But what I would do at this point, since the pan is nice and hot, is we'll lower our heat to medium, and we will just stay there unless we feel like we need to raise it again. And when we see bubbles breaking through the top, that usually indicates the bottom's cooked long enough. But before we try to flip it over, we want to take the edge of our spatula and kind of slide it underneath to make sure that surface has been seared and it's going to be okay to flip. Since the only way to screw these up is to try to turn them too early. But once we think we're good, we'll go ahead and flip that over. Oh, and you see how I tried to shake the pan to center it? I probably shouldn't have done that. And we certainly don't want to stick our spatula under there to center it yet. Because until this batter cooks a little bit, it is very sticky and soft, and you will totally tear your flatbread. So I just left it alone for about a minute, at which point it was pretty easy to move. But anyway, we'll give that second side about two minutes total. And believe it or not, that's it. It really is truly an absolutely simple procedure. So let me go ahead and transfer this onto a plate so we can take a look at what we got. And what we got is a pretty attractive, relatively thin flatbread. Or at least that's what I'm calling it. Okay, if it was a little thinner, we could go with crepe. Or I guess you could call these lentil tortillas. But anyway, no matter what you call them, they're very soft and flexible, but surprisingly strong. And if we want, we can roll them up. Or if you're not into that, you could just fold it up into triangles, which would look pretty nice sitting next to a bowl of curry. And as far as the texture goes, I found these to be surprisingly bread-like. Okay, yes, a soft, spongy bread, but it still has a pleasant starchiness, and it does have a little bit of elasticity. And then as far as the flavor goes, it is extremely, extremely neutral, which is a euphemism we use in the business to describe things that are not very flavorful. But that is not a bad thing at all, since the reason we would make a stack of these would be to eat them with things that are very, very flavorful. But anyway, having said that, the flavor is very pleasant. And sure, if you wanted to add something besides the salt, like some ground chili, some curry powder, some turmeric, fenugreek. Do you have any fenugreek? But anyway, the point is you can flavor these any way you want. And besides how easy these are, they are super inexpensive. Okay, out of one cup of red lentils, if you make them this size, you're probably going to be able to make about 8 to 10, which is producing a lot of food from a relatively small amount of raw material. And as you cook these, which again, I'm gonna probably do on medium most of the way, but as you cook these and pile them up, just like when we're doing actual flatbread or tortillas, I like to keep a towel over the plate to help hold in some of that heat, which I think helps to texture and probably keeps them from drying out. And just imagine taking one of these freshly made flatbreads and using it to roll up a beautiful spicy curry chicken salad Oh yeah, that would be good. In fact, forget about imagining it. Let me show you exactly what that looks like for real. And of course, this is just one of like thousands of things you could do with these. Since these are going to work about the same as anything you would serve with crepes or wraps or tortillas or any of your grain-based flatbreads. So we can add versatile to the very long checklist of reasons to make this. Oh, and I should mention, by adjusting the amount of water you soak your lentils in, you can make these flatbreads a little thicker Okay, the less water you use, the thicker the batter will be. But for me, the ratio I decided was ideal was two cups of water for every one cup of lentils. But as always, feel free to experiment. I mean, you are after all the Chrissy Teigen of eating like a vegan. But don't just make these because they're vegan or gluten-free or grain-free or low-carb or high-protein or super affordable or super simple and fast to make. You should make them because they're a very delicious thing to eat. Okay, I was actually surprised just how much I enjoyed these. And whether you're vegan or not, I really do think you're going to love these. Which is why I really do hope you give them a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Turkish stuffed eggplant. That's right, I'm going to show you how to make carniaric. Although in the spirit of full disclosure, 
I only found out this dish existed like an hour before I started filming. And I didn't really use a recipe and only did about 15 minutes of research. But despite all that, these came out amazingly well. Oh, and by the way, in case you're wondering, the name actually translates to split bellies, which as you can see, or at least will see, is a very accurate name. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our eggplant. And for this, you're gonna need four equally sized, hopefully male eggplant. And no, eggplants really don't have genders. But when you're buying these, what you wanna look for is eggplant that have small round indentations versus larger, longer slot-like indentations, which tend to have more seeds. So when you're choosing these, remember, you want dots, not slots. And to prep these, what we'll do is pull off the leaves. And then what we'll do next is take our peeler and make exactly four peels equally spaced apart. And this is not just for appearance's sake. Okay, these equally spaced peels are one of the keys to the whole operation. And that's because the peel on the bottom is gonna help these sit flat. And the peel on the top is eventually where we're gonna split our bellies. And then what we'll do once that's been accomplished all four is go ahead and transfer those into this baking dish into which I brushed in a little bit of olive oil. And then what we're gonna do is pop these into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 45 minutes to an hour or until they just start to soften. Okay, we don't want them too firm, but we also don't want them totally collapsing. So when they're done, they should look a little something like this. And they should feel sort of soft and spongy, but they should not be collapsing when we press them. All right, we're not trying to make baba ganoush here. And then because I probably should have done it when they went in the oven, I decided to brush these with a little bit of olive oil to kind of shine up the outside. And then what we're gonna do is let these sit until they're cool enough to handle, at which point we will honor the name and split the bellies. And what we can do while those are cooling is go ahead and make our filling, which I'm gonna start by sauteing a large onion in some olive oil in this skillet set over medium high heat. And as usual, we'll add a nice big pinch of salt. And usually we'll saute these onions until they just start to turn translucent. But here my instincts told me to go a little bit further until these onions not only softened and started to turn translucent, but also until they started to take on a little bit of golden brown color. All right, for whatever reason, I just thought these should have a little more of a sweeter profile. So that's what I did. I cooked those stirring over medium high heat until they looked a little something like this. At which point I'm gonna add a pound of ground lamb. And you know the drill. Once we add our meat, we're gonna sort of break it up with our spatula into nice small pieces. And we'll continue doing that until it's as fine as we want, and it eventually starts to brown up. And even though I'm using lamb here, I believe beef is also a popular choice. And as far as the technique goes, I really think you could do this with any ground meat. Except, ironically, turkey. I just don't think it has enough fat for something like this. But anyway, no matter what we're using, we'll go ahead and brown up our meat. At which point we'll add most of the rest of the ingredients. Including some crushed or finely minced garlic. Some freshly ground black pepper a little touch of ground cumin, or cumin. I also wanted to sneak in a little touch of cinnamon, which I think is always amazing with lamb. Anyway, we will continue on with a touch of cayenne, as well as a pinch of dry rosemary. And speaking of herb, I believe traditionally we're supposed to use some freshly chopped parsley in this, but that didn't happen. And then we will finish this up with a squeeze of tomato paste, which I think you should always buy in tube form, since we typically just need a little bit at a time. And then last but not least, a generous application of salt. Okay, rule of thumb, about a teaspoon per pound of meat. And then of course we will adjust from there. And we'll go ahead and stir all that together and cook that for about two minutes to sort of wake up our spices. At which point we can add and stir in our last major ingredient. And that would be a whole bunch of diced sweet and or hot chili peppers. And I used a combination of Anaheim, Poblano, and Fresno. Okay, so I went with an array of mild, medium, and hot. But whatever you're into is gonna work, including some just regular old basic bell peppers. And all we're gonna do here is cook this for a few more minutes until those peppers just barely get tender. Okay, keep in mind, this mixture is gonna cook once we stuff it into the eggplant and it bakes. So we probably don't want our peppers disintegrating at this point. So I just cooked mine for about three or four minutes, at which point we're simply gonna turn off the heat and let this cool down for about 10 minutes or so before adding the final optional ingredient a handful of finely grated sheep's milk cheese. Okay, I forget the exact name of the one I used since Michelle bought it, but it was very similar to Pecorino. And once that's been stirred in, our filling is basically done. Although if you're a real pro, of course you're gonna taste this and adjust for seasoning. And then assuming our eggplants are now cool enough to handle, we can go ahead and split these bellies by cutting directly through the middle of that part we peeled on the top. But don't go all the way through to the bottom. 
All right, maybe just like three quarters of the way. And then using two spoons, we can kind of pull that apart, which is gonna give us plenty of space to stuff in our filling. And by the way, if it's cool enough, this is probably easier if you use your fingers. Unless, of course, you're trying to use a camera and a tripod. Then the spoons are probably easier. And by the way, one of my four egg plant was female and did have more seeds. So there you go. And I did scoop some of them out, since they can tend to be a little bit bitter. But anyway, we're going to split and spread open the bellies of our eggplant, at which point we can spoon in our filling. And I actually considered sprinkling some salt on the inside before filling these, but I thought my lab mixture had enough. Although in hindsight, it didn't. And I could have used a touch more, so something to keep in mind. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and fill these as evenly as possible. And as we do, we kind of want to press it in and pack it down. But be careful, don't do it too hard. Otherwise, these could burst open. And then once stuffed, I decided to decorate the top with some extra pepper strips, which is something I noticed a few people doing during my exhaustive few minutes of research. But of course, this step is optional, so you decide. I mean, you are, after all, the Nelly Furtado of your split belly's bravado. But I did have some extra peppers, and I do think it makes it look nicer, if not more aerodynamic. I wonder how you say racing stripes in Turkish. But anyway, we'll decorate those as we so choose. And then I finished the tops with a little drizzle of olive oil, because it felt right. And then one last thing before we bake these. I'm going to pour in about a cup of chicken broth, so everything stays nice and moist. And we'll have a little something-something to spoon over later. And that's it. These are now ready to pop back into our 400-degree oven for about 45 minutes or so, or until our eggplant is very soft and tender. Okay, it's really going to depend on the size, so be sure to give it the old poke poke with a knife to check. And that should pierce the flesh with virtually no resistance. And if it doesn't, put them back in. But mine were perfectly tender. So I went ahead and served up and spooned down some of those drippings. And that, my friends, for a first attempt, did not look too bad. And I'm happy to report the taste and texture were also really good. All right, I'll probably tweak a few things the next time I make them. Like, for example, salting the inside a little. But my eggplant was beautifully tender and creamy. And the filling very flavorful. Although I've since learned since filming, I was supposed to serve this with rice and yogurt sauce. So I will definitely be trying it that way next time. And probably whip up a batch of our tzatziki sauce. But anyway, all in all, I thought this was very successful. And not just this specific recipe, but the technique in general. Alright, as I was enjoying this, I thought up a couple dozen variations I'd love to try. Again, none of which involve turkey. But anyway, that's it. My attempt at making carne are it's always a lot of fun trying a new recipe for a lot of reasons. First and foremost is that there's really no pressure it has to come out great. And it really is always more enjoyable to cook without fear. Okay, we should all do that more often. So I'm going to go ahead and do a little more research and maybe pick up a few tips in the comments section. But in the meantime, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Kofta kebabs. That's right, I am very excited to be sharing what is one of my favorite all-time things to grill. And this is perfect for those times when you want to take a break from grilling burgers, but you also kind of want a grilled burger. Since basically what this is, is a Mediterranean-style meatball on a stick. And I know shish gets more love, but kofta might just be the best kebab. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. With a piece of toast? No, you probably didn't see that coming. But we're going to start with one piece of whole grain bread that we've toasted to a beautiful golden brown. And what we'll do is take a knife and cut this into nice thin strips, at which point we'll cut those strips across into a nice small dice. And while not all kofta kebabs actually have a filler in them, or use a different filler like a grain, there is just something about a piece of toasted whole wheat bread that works so well with this beef-lamb combination of meat we're going to use. And yes, having said all that, if you have to use a piece of white bread, go ahead. But really, the wheat does work way better. So we'll go ahead and dice that up nice and small, and then we will push that together in the middle of our cutting board. And then we'll top that with some diced onions, as well as a whole bunch of freshly chopped Italian parsley. And then last but not least, a very generous amount of minced garlic. At which point we will take our knife and start chopping this mixture, and we will keep chopping for about two minutes, or till the mixture becomes fairly fine and kind of looks like tabbouleh. And of course this would be faster if you used a food processor, but I don't think it tastes as good because in a food processor, all these ingredients get crushed and torn versus cleanly sliced with the blade of a knife like this. So you decide, but
but this only takes a couple minutes, so I would do it this way. And if you've never seen or had tabbouleh, well, first of all, you really should try it. But if you haven't seen it before, it looks like this. And that's it. Once we get it to this stage, we're going to stop. And it's now ready to add to our meat mixture. But before we do, let's go ahead and meat our meats, as well as season them up. And my favorite blend for these kebabs is two parts beef to one part lamb. But you can certainly do it with all one or the other, or any ratio you want. And as far as seasoning goes, we're definitely going to want some kosher salt, as well as its good friend freshly ground black pepper. And we'll also toss in a little bit of allspice, some paprika, a little bit of cardamom, a little touch of nutmeg, and then we'll finish up with some good old-fashioned cayenne pepper. And it's probably obvious, but I'll tell you anyway. You can go ahead and spice this any which way you want. I mean, you are after all the slippery peat of how to season your skewered meat. But after trying about 100 different combinations, this is my favorite. And then what we'll do is go ahead and add our toast and onion mixture, as well as a couple tablespoons of nice cold fresh water, which is very important to keep this mixture moist, so don't forget that. And once we have all that together, we'll get in there with our hand, and we will mix and mash this, smoosh and smash this, until it is very, very well combined. And for once, we don't have to worry too much about overmixing. Okay, usually when we're making meatballs or meatloaf, we usually want to be careful not to overmix because the texture will become too firm. But here, that's exactly what we're going for. But don't worry, it's still going to be very tender and very moist, thanks to that toast and onion and parsley mixture, as well as that water we added. But having said that, once it is mixed and everything's been equally distributed, you can stop. Otherwise, you're just wasting time. And we have other things to do, like covering this in plastic and popping it in the fridge until it's well chilled before we form our kebabs. And I would say like an hour would be the minimum time, but you can totally leave this overnight, and I think the flavors develop even further. But either way, once our meat is well chilled, we'll go ahead and pull it out, and we will take exactly one-fourth of the mixture, and we will roll that into a ball, using, of course, wet hands, since, as you well know, damp hands make smooth balls. And once we do have a portion rolled into a smooth ball, we will pierce that right in the middle with a bamboo skewer, and then we will simply squeeze that meat into a uniform log, about six inches long or so, and about two inches wide, getting it as uniform as possible so that it grills evenly. And yes, of course, if you're using wooden skewers, you're going to soak those in water for about an hour at least so they don't start on fire on the grill. In fact, the real skewers used for these are made of metal and they're much flatter and wider, which makes them a lot better to hold the meat on. But this type of skewer is fine. And we're actually going to use our tongs to turn these. So if we're being completely honest, the skewer in this recipe is more of a decoration. But if we want to call it a kebab, and we do, we got to stab it with something. Okay, otherwise we have to call it a meat log. And do you want to eat something called a kofta kebab or a kofta meat log? Yeah, that's what I thought. And that's it. Once those are formed, we'll go ahead and wrap those up and keep them in the fridge until we're ready to grill, which I am. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer those down on my very high-end $18 grill. Oh yes, this grill cost $18, which is not so much a brag. It's more like a cry for help. But anyway, it works fine. And as usual, I'll be cooking these over some very hot charcoal that we've let burn until it's nice and ashy. Okay, if your coals are still on fire, don't put the meat down. And if you do, the meat's going to taste like gasoline. And then people always blame the lighter fluid, but it's not the lighter fluid. You can't cook food on orange flames, or at least you're not supposed to. So please wait for the fire to go out and for your coals to be very, very hot. And kebabs this size are generally going to take about 12 to 15 minutes total. So what I usually try to do is give each side about 3 minutes, times 4 would be 12 minutes, and then kind of go from there. And I know that instruction is kind of geometrically incorrect, since round things don't have sides, they just have side. But if we visualize these things having 4 sides, We'll give each one of those about three minutes, which should get us pretty close. And by the way, this is not something we want to try to cook medium rare. Okay, we really do want that heat to get all the way through so those onions get cooked and those particles of bread can absorb the fat being released by the beef and lamb. So I'm shooting for something like a medium well, which is not only going to allow for that stuff I just described to happen, but it's also going to give us enough time so the outside gets beautifully browned and crusty. And as usual, when we're grilling over charcoal, you're going to get some spots that are hotter or cooler than others. So if you need to rotate and change positions, go ahead. That is just you grilling. And I guess we could go by temperature and pull these off at about 145 or so. But I just like to give them the old poke a poke with my finger. And when they spring back 
and start to get fairly firm to the touch. I figure they're just about perfect, which are exactly how mine were feeling here. So I went ahead and pulled those off and headed back inside, where I like to place them over a beautiful fresh salad of tomatoes, cucumbers, and onions. Just very simply dressed with some salt and olive oil. And we are definitely going to want some kind of flatbread or pita alongside. And no, I didn't make that, but I really should have, since it was not as good as it looked. Okay, in a perfect world, you've made a batch of our Lebanese mountain bread, which would be absolutely spectacular with these. And then I'm also going to serve these with a nice lemony tahini dressing. And I'll serve most of it when I plate up, but I do want to do a little bit of a racing stripe along the middle. You know, for the pictures. And we'll finish up with a little bit of parsley. And that's it, our kofta kebabs are ready to enjoy. Which, since these are nice and hot, I'm going to start doing right on this platter. And while the insides of these are not going to win any beauty contests, the texture of these are so perfect, and they are so incredibly flavorful, that nobody will care. And quite often when I cook something like this, I'll go with a yogurt-based sauce, which definitely would work with these, but I've tried both, and I just prefer the tahini with this for whatever reason. Okay, I'm not sure if it's the sesame flavor, or just the extra richness it adds, but as long as you make your tahini sauce with plenty of lemon, I think it's going to be a perfect pairing. And when we were mixing these, it might have looked like we had a lot of filler, you know, that toast and onion mixture compared to the amount of meat, but I think you're going to be shocked at just how meaty these stay. And if I didn't tell you, you might not even know these weren't 100% meat. And not that we did it mainly for that reason, but because we are adding that stuff. This technique is definitely going to save you a few dollars at the market. So we got that going for us, which is nice. But anyway, that's enough eating off the platter like a savage. Let me go ahead and plate one of these up. On what looked like it was going to be really good flatbread. But to hedge my bets, I added plenty of tahini. Since for something like this, it can never be too saucy. And I went ahead and wrapped it up and bit in. And it really was absolutely fantastic. Except for the bread, which could not have been more disappointing. All right, it didn't taste terrible. It just had a weird texture. And kind of fell apart as I was trying to eat this. So I had to resort to eating this with a fork or at the very least a fork and finger combo. So the moral of the story is if you're going to make some world-class kebabs like this, find yourself a decent flatbread or pita, or better yet, find our recipe for pita bread and make up a fresh batch. Or as I already mentioned, our Lebanese mountain bread would have been perfect for this. But anyway, I showed you how to make it. I'm sure you'll figure out how to eat it. But no matter how you decide to serve yours, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Homemade mascarpone. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to make Italian style cream cheese, which is very similar to regular cream cheese, except pretty much better in every way. Okay, it's not quite as tangy, but it is richer and more decadent. And whether you're gonna use it in classic desserts like cheesecake or tiramisu, or just as a simple spread for bread. This recipe could not be easier and only requires two ingredients. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the first one. And that would be a couple cups of heavy cream that we will transfer into a heavy bottom saucepan. And then we'll set our heat to medium. And this kind of cream is called different things in different places. But what we're looking for is something that's about 40% butter fat. And while we're definitely gonna use something that's pasteurized, it's recommended to avoid creams that are ultra pasteurized which according to people that know things, may not work out texturally as well. But anyway, what we'll do is heat our cream up on medium until it's somewhere between 185 and 190 degrees Fahrenheit, which if you're not gonna do this with a thermometer, is right as it starts to simmer. All right, we're talking just barely, barely. And as it comes up to temp, it's not a bad idea to give it the occasional stir. And then what we'll do once our cream is about 190, or like I said, it just starts to think about simmering, we will reduce our heat to medium low and then stir in one tablespoon of lemon juice, which is, believe it or not, the only other ingredient you need to make this. And then to complete the procedure, all we have to do is cook this stirring for three minutes while trying to maintain that temperature between 185 and 190. And during that time, you're going to see the mixture thicken up a little bit. All right, it's not going to get really thick, but it will definitely change noticeably. And that's it. After three minutes, we'll turn off the heat. And we'll give it one final whisking. And if everything's gone according to plan, this is what your mixture should look like on a spoon. All right, this is the old proverbial should coat the back of a spoon stage. And if you drag your fingertip across like this, it should hold some nice sharp edges. So that is looking good. 
And at this point, what we need to do is let this sit and cool for 30 minutes. All right, so the heat's off. You're going to set your timer. And while we're waiting for that to cool down, we can go ahead and set a strainer over a bowl in which we're going to place a clean, folded-up kitchen towel. And yes, some people do like to use cheesecloth, but I find sometimes some of the cream will leak through that and we lose some of the product. So I much prefer the folded-up kitchen towel method. And that's it. 30 minutes later, we'll go ahead and carefully remove that from the stove. And we will very carefully start ladling that into our towel. And because my towel was folded in quarters, I'm actually going to have four layers of fabric, which means any of the way that leaks out of this mixture is probably going to be absorbed into the cloth and not necessarily make it to the bottom of the bowl. But we definitely want to have something underneath just in case. And then once all that's been transferred in, we need to let this cool down to room temp before we transfer it into the fridge, which after already sitting for 30 minutes should be pretty close. And to prevent the top from drying out or forming a skin, what we'll do while this cools is lay a piece of plastic wrap over the top and we will ever so gently press that down on the surface. And like I said, we'll let that cool down to room temp, at which point we will very carefully and very thoughtfully transfer that into our fridge where we will leave it overnight to give it time for all the magic to happen. And then the next morning we will pull it out and we will pull off that plastic and we will grab a knife and we will dig into the richest, most luxurious, most beautiful cream cheese you've ever had. And by the way, there's basically two different kinds of homemade mascarpone. There's the very soft, creamy one, and then there's the one I showed you how to make, which is the beautifully thick and dense version, which appearance-wise can look kind of grainy, but texture-wise is not. Okay, when you actually taste this, on your tongue and in your mouth, it should feel as smooth as butter. So mine definitely passed the texture test. And as good as it was off my finger, I went ahead and spread a little on some toast. And because this is not seasoned at all, I went ahead and sprinkled on a little salt. And that, my friends, really is tremendous. All right, if you like regular cream cheese, you are going to absolutely love this. And you can now make it pretty much any time you want. And not only have what is maybe a superior product, but definitely less expensive than buying actual mascarpone. Oh, and if you want to add some flavorings into this, feel free. All right, some people like to add a little touch of sugar or a few drops of vanilla. So as usual, those kind of tweaks will be up to you. I mean, you are after all the Chuck Mangione of your homemade mascarpone. And speaking of tooting your own horn, this really was truly magnificent as is. And personally, I prefer to add any kind of flavorings after the fact, depending on how we're gonna use it. So by keeping it neutral, we have a lot of different ways we can go. Oh, and check this out. As I mentioned, most of that liquid got absorbed by the towel, and there was only a couple teaspoons of water at the bottom which might have actually been from condensation. But anyway, that's why you do want to have a bowl underneath. And then once made and determined to be awesome, we can go ahead and transfer that into some kind of crock or other appropriate storage container. And besides using it as a spread, it is also now ready to use in so many great recipes like ravioli or cheesecake, or of course the world famous tiramisu. And if you can't decide whether to eat it with something sweet like fruit or something savory like pasta, you could do both and just enjoy it with some beautiful garden tomatoes with a little sprinkling of salt and enjoy something that's sweet and savory. And if you're thinking to yourself, usually when he makes something like this, he does another video following that uses it as an ingredient. Well, you would actually be correct since I'm currently working on a little something called tiramisu toast. Oh yeah, you heard me, tiramisu toast. It's just like avocado toast, but with tiramisu. And once perfected, I will be more than happy to share that with you all. But in the meantime, no matter what you decide to use this for, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Italian sausage spaghetti. That's right, there are basically three ways you can do Italian sausage with spaghetti. And that would be to cook the sausage and just serve it alongside or on the top. Or we can remove the sausage from the casing and brown up the crumbles and use that as the base for our sauce. And while those two methods are very popular, in this video I'm going to show you the much, much rarer third version, which I think is vastly superior in every way. And I'll be spending the rest of the video trying to convince you of that. And to get started, what we're going to need is four nice large links of Italian sausage. And if you want to use spicy, go ahead. But I'm using what's called sweet Italian sausage which is almost always flavored with garlic and fennel, among other things. And we want to make sure we're using one that has enough fat. 
And one easy way to tell is you can see all the little pieces of fat through the casing. That is the kind of sausage we want to be using here. And what we'll do is head to the stove, where we have whatever pot we're going to use to cook our sauce in over medium heat, in which we have a little bit of olive oil. And once that's hot, we'll go ahead and transfer in our sausage. And the game plan here is to cook these for about 5 minutes per side, or until they're beautifully browned and just barely cooked through. And I generally don't like to cover meat I'm browning, but here, because we're using this nice big pot, and we do want this to just barely cook through, I think it's fine to place a lid on, which is going to help us retain some of that heat. But regardless, we'll go ahead and give that first side about 5 minutes, at which point we'll flip them over. And as you can see, those have taken on some beautiful color, which does a lot more than just make these look nice. Okay, it's a proven scientific fact that browned meat tastes better than non-brown meat. And yes, I did say to use medium heat. Alright, I don't want this oil smoking. So we're going to cook these a little more gently than usual. But at the same time, we do want a nice browning on there. So if you want to raise your heat up a little bit, go ahead. And then once those have been turned over, we'll give the second side five minutes. At which point we'll turn off the heat and remove those to a plate. Where we will let them sit until they cool completely. Or at least to room temperature before we try to cut them up. And yes, if you're doing this step ahead, you can pop those in the fridge until you're ready. And then while those are cooling, we'll head back to the stove and turn our heat on to medium high. And then we will pour in about a quarter cup of white wine. And as that comes up to a simmer, we will take a spoon or spatula. And we'll make sure we're scraping up any of those delicious caramelized bits on the bottom of the pan. Which in the business we call deglazing. And if you don't want to or can't, you can just use a splash of water instead of the wine. But please note, that little touch of alcohol really does improve the flavor of the sauce. But either way, once that's been deglazed, we'll go ahead and let it simmer for about a minute or so, or until it reduces by about half, give or take. And then once that's happened, we can go ahead and transfer in four cups of prepared pasta sauce. All right, whether it's homemade or from a jar, this technique's gonna work out the same. But very important, in addition to the sauce, we are also gonna add about one third the volume of plain cold fresh water that I'm gonna to use to rinse out the jar. And why that water is so important is that we're gonna let this sauce simmer for a long time, and that's gonna help prevent it from reducing down too far. So we'll go ahead and stir that in. And then as soon as this comes back to the simmer, we'll reduce our heat to low, and we'll just let that sit there cooking gently until we are ready to add our sausage. But before we can add our sausage, we have to cut our sausage, which just to remind you, we are not gonna do until this is fully cooled. But once it is, we can go ahead and cut each of these into four pieces. And if that little bit of tied casing at the end bothers you, you can go ahead and slice that off. Right, that really doesn't bother me. I mean, come on, it's just a piece of knotted intestine. But it could be off-putting to some of your more sensitive guests. So maybe not a bad idea to trim it off. And that's it. Once we have our sausage cut up, we'll go ahead and transfer it into our simmering sauce, along with any and all accumulated juices. And not just from the plate, but from the cutting board as well. Which, by the way, in case you were wondering, is why I use that light plastic cutting board instead of the big thick wooden one I usually use. So we will scrape all that goodness in as well. And how much more flavor is that really going to add? Well, I can't tell you exactly, but I do know it's more than none. So that's why we do it. And then what we'll do is give this a stir, and we will raise our heat to somewhere between low and medium low, or whatever setting gives you a very gentle but steady simmer. All right, something that hopefully looks similar to this. And then what we'll do is cook this, stirring occasionally, for believe it or not, one and a half hours. And what's going to happen during that relatively long simmering time is that our sauce is going to get infused with all that amazing sausagey goodness. Okay, all those amazing flavors of garlic and herb and fennel are basically going to get leached out of the meat. But don't worry, there's still going to be plenty of flavor left. And above and beyond taste, this long simmering time is also going to do amazing things for the texture of the sausage, as we will discuss later. And then besides giving it the occasional stir, at approximately the one hour mark, you're probably going to have a decent amount of that pork sausage fat floating on the top, which you may or may not want to skim off. Okay, on one hand, we don't want our final product too greasy. But on the other hand, fat equals flavor, especially fat from inside an Italian sausage. So I think we do need to leave some, which is why generally I skim off about half of it. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are after all the day Vergetti of your Italian sausage spaghetti. And speaking of closers, once that's been skimmed and stirred, all we need to do to finish this is let it simmer for another half hour or so. At which point, if everything's gone according to plan, it should look something like this. Okay, pretty much all that water we added in is boiled out, and we should be left with a nice thick gorgeous sauce. And of course, if it reduced too far and got too thick, just toss another splash of water in. 
All right, that is just you cooking. And of course, if you want to give it a taste and check for seasoning, go ahead. But fair warning if you do, you're going to be shocked at exactly how flavorful that sauce is. I mean, it really is incredible how it gets transformed. And that's it once our sauce is done. We can just move that to a back burner and keep it warm while we boil up a pound of spaghetti. Or as the youngest members of our audience would call it, Pischetti. And in case you're keeping score at home, I'm using a thick spaghetti. All right, the good old number 12. But obviously use any kind of pasta you want. Just as long as you promise to cook it in very well salted water. All right, that way your pasta is going to be nicely seasoned and we won't have to be tossing salt in later. But anyway, we'll go ahead and cook that. And personally, I like to do it one minute less than the package directions because I always finish my pasta by letting it sit in the hot sauce for a minute or two. So about one minute before it's supposed to be done, we'll go ahead and pull that off the heat and drain it. And then transfer it directly into our pot of hot sauce. And we will give that a mix until everything's thoroughly combined. And then once that's been mixed, what we'll do is pop on the lid and we'll just let it sit there for one minute. So the pasta has a chance to absorb some of that amazing sauce. All right, to me, there are a few sadder sights than seeing a bowl of plain boiled pasta with the sauce just unceremoniously ladled over the top. I mean, come on, that's how Americans do it. We want to do it like Italians, or at the very least, Italian Americans. So we'll go ahead and toss everything together and let it sit covered for about a minute, at which point our pasta should be perfectly cooked and we are now ready to serve. And generally, one pound of pasta will make four perfectly sized portions, which mathematically works out very well with the sausage. Since we use four of those, which means everybody gets four pieces, which we'll go ahead and place over the top. Although right here I decide to give myself five pieces, just in case somebody else wanted three. And that's it, I like to finish up with a little bit of freshly grated Parmesan. Oh yeah, the real stuff, Parmigiano Reggiano. And then because I'm contractually obligated to take some pictures, I did a little sprinkling of Italian parsley as a final touch. And that's it, our Italian sausage spaghetti is ready to enjoy. So let me go ahead and grab a fork and spoon and dig in. And I'll start with a piece of that too good to be true sausage, which despite simmering for an hour and a half, is still loaded with flavor. But above and beyond that, and the fact that the sausage also did such a great job of flavor in our sauce, what makes this method truly special is what happens texturally to that sausage, which believe it or not, I would compare to a perfectly cooked meatball. Okay, the sausage is firm, but not tough. Okay, it's actually very tender and succulent. And to me, so much more luxurious than sausage that was just cooked and served alongside. Okay, just a completely different experience. So I just absolutely love this technique. Plus, we don't have to worry about adding a bunch of stuff to the sauce to make it taste good, since our sausage is doing most of the heavy lifting here. And while you can get a similar flavor in the sauce if you do take it out of the casing and crumble it up and brown it and simmer it in your sauce like that, you don't get the pleasure of biting into a nice chunk of sausage. Which again, sounds kind of funny, but texturally it really is remarkably close to a meatball. And not just any meatball, a really, really good meatball. In fact, those chunks of sausage are so good, now I'm feeling a little bit guilty about taking that fifth piece. And I should probably put that back. But anyway, that's it. My favorite way to do Italian sausage spaghetti. As I mentioned earlier, this is way less popular than the other two methods but without a doubt, the most delicious. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Italian braised beef and potatoes. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to make one of my favorite dishes of all time. And while I do like vegetables, and would serve some alongside this, what I love and crave the most is meat and potatoes. And this, my friends, is about as meat and potatoes as it gets. And we will meet the potatoes in a few minutes. But what we'll do first is season up some nice thick slices of beef shank. And we're going with that because it's one of the toughest cuts with the most connective tissue, not to mention includes a nice marrow bone in the middle. And it's these type of cuts that really do braise the best. Since as these cook, all that connective tissue breaks down which is what produces all that amazing, rich, sticky goodness. And what we'll do after seasoning both sides with some salt, freshly ground black pepper, and cayenne is head over to the stove to sear this in a nice heavy bottom Dutch oven or something similar set over high heat in which we've drizzled a few tablespoons of olive oil. And what we'll do is sear that for about three or four minutes per side. And there's lots of these rustic Italian-inspired braised dishes where we do not brown the meat first. 
But getting some nice caramelization on the surface first, before we add our braising liquids, does help us achieve a little more flavor. And the next person that complains about a dish like this having too much flavor will be the first. So to me, this step is definitely worth the extra couple minutes. Oh, and speaking of connective tissue, sometimes when you sear beef shank like this, those membranes and connective tissue will contract and the meat will kind of curl up like this. And if that happens, all we have to do is take some scissors or a knife and just cut through the edge in a few spots. And by the way, that's not gonna affect the braising, but it's a proven scientific fact that flat things sear better than curled up things. And sometimes I'll actually make a few cuts before I sear. But anyway, if yours curl, don't be afraid to give them a snip so they unfurl. And then once we do have those nicely browned, we'll go ahead and remove those to a plate and we'll reduce our heat to medium and toss in our chopped onions and celery along with a nice big pinch of salt. Well, actually I tossed in that same seasoning mix I used for the beef. But anyway, we'll toss in some salt and maybe a little bit of pepper and we will cook that stirring for a few minutes or until those onions go from bright white to sort of translucent. And once our veggies do soften up a little bit and have taken on some nice golden brown color, we can stop and toss in some tomato paste as well as a generous amount of minced garlic, followed by some dried rosemary, as well as some dried marjoram, although oregano is gonna work out pretty much exactly the same. And what we'll do is give that a stir and cook that for a couple more minutes to sort of toast that tomato paste. And by the way, yes, you can use fresh herbs in this. Although if you are gonna use fresh rosemary and marjoram and or oregano, you always have to use like three or four times the amount of the dry to get the same effect although it's really not the same effect since dried herbs have a different flavor than fresh. But in any event, if we're gonna call this Italian braised beef and potatoes, we are definitely gonna need some kind of herb component in this. And then once we've cooked that for a few minutes, we can go ahead and toss in a little bit of wine and we'll stir that in and cook it for a couple minutes or until the wine just about disappears. And I prefer white because it's a little more mellow, but red wine would also work. So you decide. I mean, you are after all the Gino, of which Vino, but I really do think this needs a splash of something. And speaking of splashes, once that wine has pretty much disappeared, we can go ahead and toss in some chicken broth, plus one bay leaf, at which point we'll give this a stir and turn our heat up to high so we can bring this back to a simmer, at which point we can transfer our beef back in. And yes, you can use beef broth if you want, but I generally go with the easier to find, more neutral flavored chicken broth, since we are gonna get a ton of beef flavor from those shanks. Which reminds me, if times are tough, you could just add some water, and this will still be very, very delicious. But either way, one simmering, like I said, will transfer our beef back in, along with, of course, any accumulated juices from the plate. I mean, you can't throw those away. That would be insane. And then before we cover this and pop it in the oven, I'm gonna take a spoon and baste the tops a little bit, which is completely and absolutely unnecessary. But for me, it's part of the ritual, part of the ceremony, part of the meditation. So if you don't want to baste, don't baste. But I'm a baster from way back, so I basted. it. And that's it, we'll go ahead and turn off the heat and pop on the lid, and then transfer this into the center of a 325 degree oven for two hours, or till our meat is almost very close to but not quite fork tender, which is probably gonna look a little something like this. And if we poke it with a fork, the fork will slide in without a ton of effort, but the meat is not yet super soft and easy to pull off the bone, which is perfect because we still need to add our potatoes and then put this back in the oven to cook some more. And for me, the best choice here are some peeled and quartered Yukon Gold potatoes, which are roughly about two inches in size, and before we add those in, I like to douse them with olive oil, as well as sprinkle in some of our seasoning mix, or at the very least, a nice big pinch of salt. Plus, since we're gonna have it sitting right there, I like to skim some of that super flavorful beef fat off the top and add a couple tablespoons of that in as well, at which point we'll give this a toss until evenly coated. And once that's been accomplished, we can add those potatoes to the top. And if you're wondering if this would come out any differently, if you just toss those potatoes right into the pot and mix them with those cooking liquids, well, to be honest, I'm not sure. But for me, this just seems right. Plus, since we're not using a ton of liquid, part of the potato is gonna be sitting above the meat. And I just feel a little bit better if those get baptized before they get braised. 
which is a perfect segue to the next step. Since one cells have been transferred in, I'm going to go ahead and rinse out the bowl we tossed them in with about a half a cup of water and transfer that in as well, since I want to make sure we have enough of those amazing braising liquids to serve with the beef and potatoes once it's done. And that's it, we'll go ahead and pop the lid back on and place that back in our 325 degree oven for about another hour or so, or until our meat and potatoes are very soft, tender, and succulent. And no, we're not going by smell or appearance, both of which are amazing. We're gonna go ahead and test this with a knife or fork, which should slide in with zero effort. And then in real life, just go ahead and serve this up. All right, I have to take some pictures. So I went ahead and basted the top and moved a few potatoes around and tried to make everything look extra enticing. And then once I was finally finished fussing, I finished off with a little sprinkling of chili flakes, as well as a nice scattering of freshly chopped Italian parsley. And that's it, my Italian braised beef and potatoes was ready to enjoy, which I'm gonna do in a nice big bowl with plenty of those amazing braising liquids spooned over. And I finished up with a little more Italian parsley and yes, as you can see, we definitely want to serve this alongside some sliced bread, as well as one optional ingredient, some freshly squeezed lemon, which I will get to in a minute. But for now, I'm going to take a fork and a spoon, and I'm going to start with a nice chunk of those potatoes, which if I'm being honest is my favorite part. Well, actually, let's call it a tie with the beef, but they really truly are extraordinary. And to double check that my memory is working properly, I went ahead and took a bite of the beef next and verified, yes, that's equally incredible. Oh, and as fantastic as the beef and potato are, my other favorite part of this is some nice crusty Italian bread used to soak up those juices. I mean, I would have no problem just eating a bowl of that. And while it's definitely optional, since this is a sort of rich and unctuous dish, I think a little squeeze of fresh lemon is a nice touch and helps cut through some of that richness. And sure, we could accomplish the same thing with a little sprinkling of vinegar. And what I love so much about a dish like this is that on one hand, it's so simple and rustic and comforting, yet at the same time, very rich and decadent and complex in flavor. And whenever I eat this, I'm thinking this is exactly what I want to eat. Oh, and I almost forgot about the fourth component tied for the best thing in this with the beef, potatoes, and the bread dipped in the juice. And that would be that little bit of marrow we can dig out from the inside of the bone and eat on a piece of bread, which is never not an incredibly special treat. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling Italian braised beef and potatoes. All right, I'm not saying there's actually a recipe over in Italy exactly like this, but this was inspired by the very rustic, very simple Italian food I grew up with. Plus, it's been my experience that if you call things Italian, you get more views. Oh, and one last thing before we go. If you can't find beef shank for this, it will work beautifully with some beef chuck roast. But no matter what you use, if you love meat and potatoes, as much as I love meat and potatoes, I am very certain you are gonna love this. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Greek style beef stew. That's right, I am very excited to be sharing my version of Stefano, which very well could be the best beef stew you've never had. And apparently this dish was brought to Venice by the Ottomans, where it made its way to Cyprus and then Greece. And it's been my experience that any recipe that has that many stops on its journey is almost always an incredible thing to eat. And this is no exception. And to get started, the first thing we'll need is a big old hunk of beef. And what I have here is a beef chuck roast which I think is the perfect cut. And what we'll do first is try to cut some two inch pieces, which is very easy since this is about two inches thick. So if we cut over about two inches to make a strip and then turn that and cut across every two inches or so, if my calculations are correct, we should have something pretty close to two inch cubes. But having said that, as long as your pieces are about the same size, it really doesn't matter if they're a little bigger or a little smaller than mine, since the most important thing is that they cook evenly. And if you have a bunch of big pieces and a bunch of little pieces, that won't happen. And we don't really need to trim any fat off this. Although if you have a couple solid pieces that were on the ends, you can go ahead and trim those off. And then what we'll do once that's cut up is transfer it into a bowl. And we will season it very generously with freshly ground black pepper. And what looks like too much kosher salt, but it's not. 
All right, a good rule of thumb is about a teaspoon of kosher salt per pound of meat, as far as the initial seasoning goes. So that's my starting point. And once that's applied, we'll go ahead and toss that thoroughly. And then once we have that meat evenly coated, we can go ahead and transfer that into the fridge until we're ready to use it. Whether that's in 10 minutes or a couple hours or even the next day. And then once our beef's set, we can move on to prep some shallots, which sort of look like smaller skinny red onions. And traditionally these are kept whole, which is why we gotta pay attention to this root end. Since that holds everything together, we don't wanna cut that. But we will cut off the top and then make two more cuts about a quarter inch down so we have something to grab onto as we attempt to peel off the skin, which I'm not gonna lie is very challenging since at first you think you can peel off just the skin, but after a couple seconds you realize that's near impossible. So you give up and you just pull off that first layer of shallot all the way down to the root. And of course you save that in the freezer for the next time you make chicken stock since shallots are incredibly delicious and the reason we're using them here. But anyway, we'll go ahead and peel as many of those as we can stand. And again, using them whole is traditional, but if you want to avoid all this trauma and just chop them up, go ahead. It will still taste really good. Oh, and if after peeling you realize one of your shallots was actually two smaller shallots, you can just pull those apart, it'll be fine. All right, despite our best efforts, some of these are gonna fall apart anyway. And that's it, once our shallots are set, we can head to the stove, where I have a very heavy duty pan set over high heat, into which I poured a couple tablespoons of Greek olive oil. And once that oil is very hot, We'll go ahead and brown our beef in two batches, since we want to get a really nice dark crust on this, which means we don't want to crowd the pan. So yes, two batches is going to take a little bit longer, but the results are going to be much better. And by the time we finish our second batch, we are going to have an amazing fond, which is all those caramelized meat juices on the bottom of the pan, formed on the bottom of the pan. And I hate to give times here, right? Maybe we sear this for about four to five minutes per side, but we really want to go by eye. And it doesn't matter how long it takes, we want to get a nice dark deep brown sear. And then what we'll do once both batches of our beef have been browned, is we'll turn off the heat and we'll add another tablespoon or so of olive oil. And we will toss our whole shallots in, at which point after the pan is cooled for a couple minutes, we can put the heat back on to medium. And what we'll do is toss those shallots around this hot pan until they get a little bit of color on the outsides. And of all the steps in this recipe, this one is probably the most optional. Since our pan is flat, and our shallots are not flat at all, so there's not a lot of surface contact. But any kind of extra browning is definitely gonna be a little bit of extra flavor. So personally, I think it's worth a couple extra minutes of time. But if you're not into it, don't worry about it. I mean, you are after all the disco stew of your beef stews to do's. And this stew is gonna simmer for a long time, so those shallots are gonna get cooked whether you brown them or not. And then after those have been browned on medium, we will add another splash of olive oil to the pan. And then still on medium, we will saute some diced onions and some finely minced garlic with a big pinch of salt for just about a minute. All right, we don't want to brown that garlic, but we just want to give it a quick stir fry. Although it might look like it browns a little bit because the bottom of that pan is so dark. But don't worry, if you only do it for a minute, it's not going to brown. And then after that gets a quick sizzle, we'll go ahead and add our tomato paste. And we will stir that in and we will toast that to the bottom for about two minutes, which seems like a minor step but it really does add a lot of flavor, or as the celebrity chefs call it, umami, which is that intense savoriness you get from some foods, toasted tomato paste being one of them. And then once we have improved the taste of our tomato paste, we'll go ahead and deglaze the bottom with some red wine vinegar, plus some white wine. And I think most people that make this use red wine, but I really do prefer the white since it's not as tannic, and I just prefer it to the bolder, more intense reds. But anyway, we'll go ahead and stir that in, making sure to scrape all that goodness off the bottom as we do. And at this point, we can raise our heat to medium high, since we want to reduce these liquids by about half. And while we're waiting for that to happen, we can go ahead and toss in some white sugar, which is very important to balance the acidity. We will also toss in a little bit of cinnamon, which traditionally is a cinnamon stick, but the ground works fine, as well as a little bit of allspice, plus a small pinch of ground clove. All right, just a touch. Too much of that can overpower a dish. And then we'll finish up our seasonings with some dried oregano, plus a couple bay leaves. And then last but not least, a couple sprigs of rosemary. And we'll stir that in. And like I said, we're waiting for this to reduce by about half and start to thicken up. And a few minutes later, this is what mine look like. And once it does, we can go ahead and transfer our brown meat back in, along with our whole shallots. 
at which point I'm going to very carefully toss this all together, which is not easy because this pan is full. And that's exactly why I switched to a more flexible, more curvaceous stirring tool. Oh, and I should mention, if you don't want to deal with the shallots or you can't find them, a lot of modern versions of this recipe just use frozen pearl onions, which will look nice and kind of do the job, but nothing, and I repeat, nothing tastes like a shallot. So that is definitely my choice, but you do what you got to do. And then once that's set, we can add our last ingredient, which would be a couple of cups of beef broth or chicken broth, or if times are tough, even some nice cold, fresh water would work. And we'll go ahead and stir that in and wait for this to come back to a simmer. And then once this comes back to a bubble, we can reduce our heat to somewhere between low and medium low, or whatever setting maintains a nice gentle simmer. And we will cover this and cook it covered for one hour. Right, my general rule of thumb for this kind of stuff is one hour covered and then one hour uncovered or until it's exactly how we want it. And while our stew slowly simmers to perfection, there's a few things we're going to want to do, which are the same things we do to every stew. Oh yeah, it's true. And those things include giving it the occasional stir, moving pieces from the outside to the inside and pieces from the inside to the outside. And sometimes I'll even flip a few pieces over. All right, it depends on my mood. And then besides the occasional agitation, we will also monitor our liquid level. And if the stew starts getting too thick and dry before the meat's tender, we will of course add another splash of broth or water. All right, that is just us cooking. So we'll keep an eye on that. And then if you want at any time during this uncovered step, you want to skim a little bit of fat off the top, feel free. All right, a lot of people do, and a lot of people don't. But in general, I usually do skim off a little bit. But anyway, to recap, we are stirring occasionally, we are monitoring our liquid level, and we are possibly skimming fat. Which brings us to by far the most important thing we do, which is to make sure this is fork tender before we serve it. And for me, the perfect doneness for a stew is when a fork will slide easily into the meat, but the meat has not started to fall apart yet on its own. And right here, mine was very close, but I decided to give it another 10 or 15 minutes. And as I've said for years, every stew recipe online should be five stars, since all the people that post bad reviews always say the same things, the meat was not tender and or the stew was not flavorful, which is so confusing and infuriating because why did they stop simmering it? Okay, if your meat's not tender yet, let it simmer until it is. Don't stop, eat it untender and then write a bad review. That makes no sense. And then as far as the flavor goes, that just requires you tasting it and adjusting with some more salt if it needs it, which it quite often does. So besides making sure your meat is fork tender, we will definitely give it a taste also, and adjust if need be. And that's it, once it's feeling and tasting exactly how we want, we could go ahead and serve this up. Or we could, if we want, time permitting, turn off the heat and let this cool like I'm gonna do, and then refrigerate this overnight, since for various reasons, a stew is always better the next day. That is just a fact, right? The color deepens, the flavors deepen, the meat seems to be even a little more succulent and tender, so that is exactly what I did. And I went ahead and served that up next to a couple slices of Greek bread. Well, actually, I don't have access to Greek bread and I didn't have time to bake some, but some French or Italian bread will do nicely. And besides being one of the most delicious stews of all time, if there's a beef stew that has a better color than this, I would love to see it since this is absolutely gorgeous. And then once we have that spooned up, you can serve this as is and it will be magnificent, but I'm gonna go ahead and top mine with some crumbled feta. Plus, just because I have them and they look nice, a few sliced pickled red onions. And then for a final touch, a little bit of freshly chopped herb is nice, whether it's parsley or dill or mint or any combination. And that's it, our Greek style beef stew is ready to enjoy. And I can't even begin to explain how much I love this stuff, but I will try. And besides being just an extra beefy, super savory, perfectly constructed beef stew, we have a beautiful balance between the tanginess of the vinegar and the wine, and then the sweetness from the shallots and that little touch of sugar, with everything being elevated by those aromatic warming spices in the background. Oh, and by the way, as we touched on earlier, if you need a knife to cut the meat, it did not cook long enough. But I do serve this with a knife, so that we can easily cut those shallots into bite-sized pieces. All right, sometimes if you try to do that with a fork, the center of the shallot will shoot out across the room, which while very comical, can also be a little bit messy. So the knife is a safer bet. And man, are those shells delicious. I mean, almost as good as the beef. And this is probably my favorite way to eat it, just with some bread on the side to dip in that amazing sauce. 
But since I teased this recipe in our last video, which was Greek spinach rice, let me go ahead and finish this video up with a shot of this served on that, which as you might imagine was a fantastic pairing. So I'm sorry if I'm sounding greedy, but I really want you to make both. But no matter what you serve this on or next to, it truly is one of the world's great stews, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Lebanese Mountain Bread. That's right, as promised, I'm going to show you my take on what has become my favorite flatbread. And possibly, at least for the time being, maybe my favorite bread. Oh, and by the way, if you happen to live on a mountain in Lebanon, and at some point during this video you think to yourself, hey, that's not how we do it. Well, I just wanted to quickly mention, this is how they do it on the other mountain. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with this very simple and sort of pizza-like dough. And we'll begin by dumping a portion of our bread flour into a bowl, followed by a teaspoon of dry active yeast. Or is it active dry yeast? I forget, but same stuff. And then we'll also toss in a little touch of sugar, followed by some warm but not too hot water. Okay, I usually shoot for about 105 degrees, which should basically feel like warm bath water. Although that probably doesn't help much, since I don't think people take baths anymore. I mean, who's got that kind of time? Especially considering all the hours we spend on social media. But anyway, what we'll do at this point is give that a mix to complete what some people in the business would call a sponge. So what we'll do is mix that smooth, and then we'll go ahead and cover it and let it sit for about a half hour to an hour, or until it gets nice and bubbly. And hopefully it looks a little something like this. So that is looking good, and we clearly have a very enthusiastic yeast colony growing. And then once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and add the rest of the ingredients, which will include a spoon of olive oil, as well as a little bit of salt. And then last but not least, we'll dump in the rest of our flour. And even though I'm using bread flour here, I'm pretty sure this will work with all purpose. And then what we'll do once all that's together is grab a wooden spoon, and we'll give this a mix. And we will keep mixing until it all pulls together to form a relatively sticky dough ball. Although, don't confuse sticky with wet. Okay, towards the end of this step, that dough ball should pull away from the bowl fairly cleanly, and the texture should be somewhat similar to this. So if yours does seem super wet, and it's still sort of smearing against the bowl, you can add a little more flour. But this is looking pretty good. So at this point, I'll go ahead and transfer that to a well-floured surface to give it a little bit of a kneading. And as usual, we're using the bare minimum of flour, just enough to keep it from sticking to our fingers or the work surface. And what we'll do is work that dough for just about two minutes until we formed, and stop me if you've heard this one before, a very soft, very supple, slightly elastic dough. And really all that means is if we press on it, it sort of springs back. So that is looking very nice, if I do say so myself. And once that's set, what we'll do is transfer that into a bowl that we've drizzled in a few drops of olive oil. And we'll kind of roll that dough around to coat it lightly. And that is pretty much it for our dough production. All we have left to do is cover this and leave it in some warm spot for about an hour to an hour and a half, or until it doubles in size. Okay, so the time is going to depend on how warm the spot is. But this is what mine looked like about an hour and 15 minutes later. And at this point, what we'll do is transfer that to our work surface and give it another quick knead to basically knock out all the air. And then once we have our dough successfully degassed, we have a couple options. We could use this right away if we had to, but I do not recommend it. What I suggest is transferring this into some kind of zip top bag and place it in the fridge overnight before we use it. And I know I probably should have told you before we started that you're not going to be able to eat this till tomorrow, but trust me, you're going to get a better product. Right? Not only are the flavors going to develop and it's going to be tastier, but the texture is going to be better and the all important stretching step is going to be easier. So I did in fact leave mine overnight, at which point it looks something like this. So it might grow a little bit in the fridge, but it's basically sort of going to look the same. But regardless, whether you use yours right away or leave it overnight like I did, the next steps are going to be the same. We're going to pinch off a portion of dough, for me something slightly smaller than a golf ball, and we'll go ahead and sort of rub and press that on the work surface to squeeze out all the air, at which point we'll begin a two-step formation process. And the first step will be to roll this out to about an eighth of an inch thick, and again using just enough flour to keep it from sticking. Right, the one thing that most bad breads have in common, too much flour. So please be careful. But having said that, the dough is going to be sticky, so you are going to need some. And like I said, we're going to roll that out to about an eighth of an inch thick, which sounds kind of thin, but not even close to how thin this needs to be. Which is why when it gets to this point, we're going to stop. And we'll give that a little stretch with our hands. 
And then believe it or not, we will lay that over the top of the bottom of a lightly floured mixing bowl. And it's over this dome surface where we're going to stretch this incredibly thin, as in pretty much see-through. So it might take you a few seconds to get it started. But once you do, just keep going around, pulling it down, until basically you've stretched it as thin as humanly possible without it tearing. And by the way, how this is done back in the old country is the dough is actually stretched over a round pillow, which is then used to flop it on top of the grill they use to cook this. But since you probably don't have a Lebanese mountain bread dough pillow, and mine's at the cleaners, we'll go ahead and use this upside down bowl, which works quite nicely as you can see. And I should mention if this looks a little too tricky or like too much fun, and you just prefer to roll yours, it will still work. It just won't come out as thin or as good. But anyway, you decide. You are, after all, the Sherlock Holmes of stretching dough on domes. But anyway, what we'll do once our dough is stretched as thin as possible is very carefully with floured fingers, transfer that into a very hot, preheated, dry cast iron skillet. All right, so we're definitely going high heat here. And because of that, and because this dough is so thin, this is only going to take about 45 seconds to a minute per side. And as that first side cooks, you're going to see lots of little bubbles forming, which is exactly what we want to see. And after about a minute, we'll go ahead and flip that over. Oh, and if you're wondering why I'm pushing down on it with the spatula, I'm not sure. You probably don't have to. Sometimes I just like to do things. But anyway, we'll give that side about a minute. And that's it. If your pan was hot enough, you should see some beautiful brown marks on those blisters. And then very important, what we'll do as these finish is pile them up on top of each other. And then we'll keep those covered with either a towel or another plate. And what's going to happen because of the residual heat? Those are going to kind of gently steam, which is really the official final step of the cooking process. Right, these would still be pretty good if you didn't do that. But if you do, they're going to retain more moisture and be even more supple. So I think that's one of the keys. But anyway, that's it. My relatively simple method for simulating Lebanese mountain bread. And if you've never had this before, you're in for a huge treat. All right, I guess it's sort of like pita bread, but thinner, tastier, stretchier, just better on every level. And as far as I'm concerned, just a vastly superior all-purpose flatbread. Which reminds me, don't feel like you have to make some exotic Middle Eastern food to eat with this. I mean, it's amazing with things as basic and simple as a BLT. Oh, and one quick bonus tip here. You definitely want to season your tomatoes with a little bit of salt and pepper, since that really does make a huge difference. But anyway, let me go ahead and roll this up. And right here I was trying to do the classic shawarma roll, where we kind of fold in the bottom so everything doesn't run out as we eat it. But I overstuffed it, so it didn't work. But I wasn't upset. Mostly because I remembered I was just about to eat a BLT on Lebanese Mountain Bread. Which really was fantastic. And I am not a big wrap guy. I never order a wrap. Because they're usually served on some kind of insipid flour tortilla. Well, this, my friends, is roughly a thousand times better than that dry, tasteless tortilla. But anyway, just an amazing flatbread, delicious and fun to make. The only slight downside to discovering this stuff is that now I'm significantly less impressed with our pita bread recipe. Sorry, pita bread, but we'll always have hummus. Anyway, kidding aside, I do find this stuff superior to that on almost every level, and I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, Enjoy Tarone. That's right, there's nothing wrong with eating a little candy once in a while, especially when it's this delicious and beautiful, not to mention based on a recipe that predates the Roman Empire. But above and beyond the great taste, great looks, and historical significance, this recipe is also perfect for those of you that really love stirring. Since we are going to do a lot of that, like for about an hour and a half, but it's going to be totally worth it. Plus, time flies when you're having fun. And to me, and hopefully you, this is fun. So let's go ahead and get started by making sure we have the following things ready before we even start this recipe. The most important of which would be our roasted nuts. And luckily my oven's broken, so I had an excuse to buy some beautiful roasted peeled Spanish almonds, as well as some roasted pistachio, which I definitely have one too many of. And then besides the nuts, we're also going to want to separate two eggs, because about a half hour from now we're going to need some beaten egg whites. And that's going to be a lot easier to do if they're at room temp, okay? And then besides that, we'll also grate a little bit of lemon zest, and that's pretty much it for the stuff you have to do ahead of time. As far as ingredients, that is. Another thing we're definitely going to need to do before we start is get our pan prepped. So what I have here is a plastic lined baking dish, plus a couple pieces of what's called wafer paper, which is optional but does make this so much nicer. So I have two pieces, one that's going to go in the bottom, and then one that'll be pressed on top. And usually it's made out of rice, and sometimes actually sold as rice paper, 
which can be a little confusing because this is definitely not the same stuff you make spring rolls with. But anyway, we'll talk about that stuff on the blog. For now, once we have all that stuff together, we can actually start the recipe. So let's go ahead and add some honey to a heavy bottom pot. And I prefer something on the lighter side. I'm using what's called a light amber honey. So that's my recommendation, but I'm pretty sure any honey will work. And then to that, we will add a little bit of sugar before grabbing a heavy duty spatula and heading to the stove where we are gonna place this over low heat and we will start stirring and we will continue to stir and stir and stir, cooking over low heat for 30 minutes. And during that time, our mixture is gonna turn from something that's kind of golden and grainy to something paler, but much smoother. And while technically we are gonna tell you to stir this continuously, I don't necessarily mean that literally. You can stop stirring every once in a while and take a few seconds break. Nothing tragic will ensue, but we really do wanna keep it moving pretty much the whole time. And after 30 minutes of cooking down low, your mixture should look something like this. And at this point, we're gonna stop and add our egg whites, which by the way, we need to beat to soft peaks first. So if you are making this with a friend, one of you can stir while the other one does the eggs. Or if you're making this alone, no big deal. Because our egg whites are at room temp, it's only gonna take a couple minutes to whip and our honey mixture should be fine. If you're afraid, I guess you could turn the heat off until you're done. But like I said, it shouldn't be a problem. So what we'll do is we'll throw a big pinch of salt into our room temp egg whites and take a whisk. And like I said, we wanna whip those to soft peaks. Don't over whip them. We want to get to what I like to call the shaving cream stage. Okay, so something that looks just about like that. And then what we'll do with our heat still on low is we will whisk those egg whites into our honey mixture one whiskful at a time. So we will add a little bit and we will whisk that in until it disappears and then continue on in three or four more additions until all those egg whites have been incorporated. And as you'll notice, this is really gonna lighten up the mixture. And by the way, I should mention the method we're using here is the very slow, very ancient technique. Okay, the modern method for this is to make a very hot sugar syrup and then simply incorporate that into your finished meringue. But while way, way faster, I much prefer this method, as you will hopefully read about on the blog. So I just wanted to mention that in case you read comments to the effect of, hey, why aren't you using the method that only takes 15 minutes? I have my reasons. So we will continue with the whisk until all our egg whites are incorporated, at which point we want to switch back to our spatula, or in my case, heat proof spoonula, and then all we need to do is continue cooking, stirring pretty much constantly, for another 40 minutes or until done. And one thing I want you to keep an eye on to help determine when that is, you see how when I lift the spatula up and that mixture kind of forms ribbons that disappear into the surface almost immediately? We're gonna keep an eye on that because as this mixture cooks, a couple things are gonna happen. It's gonna turn a brighter and brighter white and you'll notice those ribbons will go from disappearing almost immediately to this stage where they kind of sit on top of the surface for a couple seconds. And then as you'll see near the end, they'll eventually stay on the surface for like four or five seconds. So that's generally how I can tell we're getting very close. But there is another great test where you just drip a little bit of the mixture in some cold water. And as soon as it cools, you can kind of feel how firm your mixture is gonna be when it's done. And what I'm going for is something that feels sort of like a firm clay. So this was close, it was just a little too soft. So I kept cooking and stirring for about, like I said, 40 minutes or so until my mixture looked like this. Okay, check out the ribbons. You see how they're holding their shape? and they're staying visible up on that surface for like four or five seconds, that for me tells me I'm done. And once we've determined it's cooked long enough, we will stop and add the rest of the ingredients. So I'm gonna add a little touch of vanilla, as well as our lemon zest. And by the way, if you want, you could also add some dried fruit into this. You are the boss of making this Tyrone your own. So we'll stir that in, followed by our roasted nuts. And one pro tip here, this is much easier if your nuts are warm. Okay, if we dump in room temp or God forbid cold nuts into this, this mixture is gonna get really hard really fast and it's gonna be very difficult to get into your pan. So I like to reserve the nuts in a warm oven, which makes a mix in here much easier. And as soon as all that's incorporated, we're gonna quickly transfer this into our prepared dish and spread it out and press it down the best we can. And it's probably not a bad idea to switch to a new clean spatula at this point, which I believe I should have sprayed with oil first, but I forgot. That's okay. Nothing that can't be washed and or licked off. So we will press in and spread out that mixture as evenly as possible. And then we'll top that with our second piece of wafer paper, which by the way has a dull side and a shiny side. And I think we want the shiny side up. And then we'll go ahead and we'll give that a little pressing, which I always think I need to put a little plastic down first to protect it from my sweaty hands. So we'll give that a little press. And while we do wanna press firmly, be careful, the paper will rip. 
I kind of tore mine a little right there. But that's okay, when we cut it, no one's going to know. And if you want, the hand's probably sufficient. But just to be safe, I do like to give it a little extra press with this meat pounder. And then once our mixture has been transferred in and properly pressed, we'll simply leave it out for an hour or two until it cools completely, at which point it will be nice and firm and ready to cut. So I let mine sit for a couple hours before removing it from the pan, which thanks to my plastic wrap came out quite easy, except the plastic had fused to my Taroni around the edges, and I realized it was going to take about 20 minutes to peel that off. So I got frustrated and decided to just cut it off. So I took a serrated knife and using a nice long sawing motion, sliced through, revealing what has to be one of the most gorgeous sights in all the food kingdom. Look at that. So beautiful. So I went ahead and I trimmed that up and was able to finally remove the plastic. And at that point, you can go ahead and cut this to any shape you want. I'll be going with the traditional square. And by the way, you're going to see all kinds of tricks online about the best way to cut this. Everybody and their uncle's got their own little trick. But for me, just a long, thin, serrated knife is the best. And while you really don't have to have wafer paper to make Taroni, as you can see, it really does allow us to make beautiful, clean cuts. So we'll go ahead and cut that into perfectly uniform squares. And I did say perfect. So if you have to trim a little bit off the end, that's fine. And then we can go ahead and just discard that piece into our mouth. And that's it, your Taroni is ready to enjoy. And not only does it look like one of the best things you've ever seen, the taste and texture are incredible. I mean, it's basically kind of firm and dry to the touch, and yet at the same time, it's kind of soft, flexible, and chewy. It seems impossible, but it's not. I mean, check it out. Even out of focus, you can tell how good that's going to be. And as you can see, I think we have the absolute perfect nut-to-nougat ratio. So anyway, that's it, how to make your own Taroni. This would obviously be great to serve for Valentine's Day. Or better yet, instead of making it four, why don't you make this with that certain somebody? I mean, I don't know about you, but I can't think of a better way to spend an hour and a half with your Valentine that will be as pleasurable and as satisfying as this. Okay? So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Gyros. That's right, I'm going to attempt to make what some people call mystery meat slightly less mysterious. And while we will be taking some of the excitement away that comes from wondering exactly what you're eating, I think we're more than going to make up for that with something that's more wholesome. And I think every bit is delicious. And basically the two ways you can do this is with whole chunks of meat or ground meat, which is what we'll be using today, since that's my favorite. Plus, I think this method is a lot easier to pull off in the home kitchen. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our ground meat, which yes, looks like a giant brain. But it's really just a pound of ground beef here on the left. And I'm using the 80-20 lean to fat ratio. And then over here on the right, we have a pound of ground lamb. And while the lean fat percentage wasn't listed, I'm guessing it's about the same. And then besides our ground beef and lamb blend, we're also going to add a whole bunch of diced onions, as well as a generous amount of crushed garlic. And then we'll go ahead and herb this up with some freshly chopped rosemary, as well as some non-fresh dried oregano. And by the way, even if you have fresh, I do prefer the dry oregano here, as I think the flavor works a little better. And then as far as seasonings go, we're definitely going to need a whole bunch of salt as well as some freshly ground black pepper. I'm also going to toss in some ground cumin, as well as some paprika. And then we'll also do a very small pinch of cinnamon. Not too much, be careful. But I think a pinch provides a little bit of sweetness in the background. And then we'll finish the seasonings with a few shakes of cayenne pepper. Which brings me to the last and maybe most controversial ingredient. I like to sprinkle in a tablespoon or two of fine dry breadcrumb. And if you can, try to get most of it in the bowl. And then once we have all that in there, what we'll do is give this a mix until it's thoroughly combined. And for me, the best tool for this operation is your bare hand or hands. And the reason I mentioned the breadcrumbs might be a little controversial is because they would be considered filler and added for the purpose of stretching the meat, thereby maximizing profits at our possibly unlicensed, unregulated mystery meat street cart. But that's exactly why I added them, since that's the exact texture I'm going for. But of course, if you do want to go pure meat, you could leave them out. I mean, you guys are, after all, the heroes of your gyros. Or if you're into the alternative pronunciation, you could also be the Curtis Blow of what many people call a gyro, which could actually be the right way to say it, since there's no such thing as a gyroscope. But either way, like I said, we will mix that very thoroughly with our hand. And then once that's set, what we'll do is transfer that into this baking dish, which I rub very lightly with oil. 
And I'm also going to lay in this piece of parchment paper, and we will get a little oil on that, and then turn it over and press it in. And that's going to make it a lot easier to lift out of the dish once it's cooled. And we'll go ahead and transfer in that meat and press it down. And by the way, if you're concerned that we're overworking the meat, because we just mixed it so thoroughly with our hand, and now we're working it again as we press it into this dish, do not worry, that's not a concern here. Okay, we're basically making a bad meatloaf on purpose. And I don't mean bad tasting, I just mean something that's not tender. All right, for the texture of the final product to be exactly what I want, once this is cooked, we want it nice and firm, and not soft and crumbly. So we'll go ahead and transfer our meat in, at which point it's ready to roast. So let's go ahead and transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 40 to 45 minutes, or until it's nicely browned and looks a little something like this. And if you're not into going by time and appearances, what we want to shoot for is an internal temp somewhere between 160 and 165. And then all we need to do at this point is let it cool down to room temp, at which point we'll remove it from the dish onto a plate so we can wrap it up and pop it in the fridge. And while it cools, if you want, I guess you could slice a little piece off the side and give it a try. And while it should taste perfectly delicious just like this, keep in mind this is going to get even better when we brown it up in the pan. Which reminds me, a lot of the gyros recipes that use ground meat totally skip that step. Okay, they think you're done at this point. When it comes out of the oven, they say to just slice it and make your sandwiches. But that is not how I gyro. So while I did enjoy this bite, it mostly just made me excited for what's going to happen later. So like I said, we're going to let that cool down, at which point we'll transfer it onto a plate. And thanks to our genius parchment paper trick earlier, we are going to be able to easily lift this out. So we'll grab either side and lift straight up. Well, that was unfortunate. So that didn't work. But as you've heard me say before, we never let the food win. So we'll go to plan B and transfer this with a spatula. And I know the paper's still on the bottom. I'll remove it later. I'm too upset now. And then what we'll do is cover that in plastic and transfer it into the fridge until thoroughly chilled. So yes, this is something you can make well ahead of time. And then just keep it in the fridge until you're ready to make sandwiches. Which after a couple hours I was. And then what we'll do once that is fully chilled is pull it out, unwrap it, and proceed to slice it up in any shape or size we want. And generally my strategy for this is to make two cuts lengthwise. And then we'll just turn those and cut across into, I don't know, about an eighth inch thick slices. All right, we don't want them too thick or too thin, but somewhere in between. And that's it, once our gyros meat is cut up, we can move into final production. And for me, that means browning these up in a pan over medium high heat and a little bit of olive oil for maybe two minutes per side or until nicely caramelized. And for me, this is one of the whole keys to the operation. Because while it does taste okay just after baking, once it's chilled and browned up like this, I feel like it gets even more flavorful and I think the texture improves. And by the way, this also simulates the traditional gyros method where the meat is rotating over the fire. And as that surface cooks, the meat is shaved off and used to make a wrap or sandwich or whatever you're doing. So I really do like this method if you're sans rotisserie, which most of us are. And then once the browning of our meat is complete, we will proceed to final assembly, which is going to start with this homemade Lebanese mountain bread, which I will be showing you since I finally perfected it. I know it looks like a pita, but it's not. It's far superior. And what we'll do is spread that generously with tzatziki sauce. Although I think it's pronounced tzatziki. Who knows? But I do know we have a video for that. And then I also like to do a little bit of shredded romaine, as well as some quartered cherry tomatoes, which are currently the best and sweetest tomatoes available. And then we'll go ahead and place down our meat, which is just so beautiful and fragrant. And then I'm going to finish up with a little bit of pickled red onion, which I will tell you how to make on the blog post. And then last but not least, a little sprinkling of Aleppo pepper. And that's it. That's how I like to build my gyros. And then I should mention there's a very traditional way to roll these up. But my flatbread was a little too small. Plus, I don't know how to do it. So I'm just going to fold mine over and get it up to my mouth like this. And that, my friends, was incredibly delicious and shockingly close to what you may experience from one of the mythical, magical, mystery meat street carts that are generally found in the most dangerous neighborhoods in America's most dangerous cities. And yet, despite that, people will line up because that's just how delicious these are. And by the way, if you love lamb and want to go 100% ground lamb, I've done it that way before and it's very good. But for me, half beef and half lamb makes it just a little bit more mild. And for my taste, at least, a little closer to what you get when you order these out. But anyway, that's it. My take on a gyro sandwich. Be sure to stay tuned for the upcoming Lebanese mountain bread video, which is currently my favorite kind of flatbread. Well, actually, forget flatbread. 
it's probably currently my favorite bread. So stay tuned for the upcoming Lebanese Mountain Bread video. But regardless of what you serve this on or in, I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Turkish chicken kebabs. That's right, I said chicken kebab, not chicken kebab. When I think kebab, I think chunks of overcooked meat separated by pieces of undercooked vegetable. And so I'm not really into those. But this kebab, on the other hand, is all meat all the time, and I think far superior. And as you can see from this total spoiler of a picture, we're still going to be getting our veggies, so don't worry. And like almost all my favorite grilling recipes, this thing features big flavors with a very small amount of effort. So let's go ahead and get started with the marinade. So for that, we are going to need some Turkish-style yogurt, which you probably can't find. But what you can find in every supermarket is Greek yogurt, so we'll use that. And then to that, we'll add some olive oil, along with some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And do I need to keep telling you that? Is anyone not using fresh lemons? I mean, unless you work at some kind of weather station in Antarctica, you really don't have an excuse. And then we want to do a little touch of tomato product. I believe in the original recipe it called for tomato paste, but because I'm an American, I reserve the right to use ketchup, which really does work beautifully. We're also going to want a large amount of minced garlic, as well as a generous amount of kosher salt, and of course its good friend, freshly ground black pepper. We're also going to spice this up with some chili flakes, and I'm using Aleppo chili flakes, because it is from the Middle East, so it seems appropriate, but any hot chili flake will work. And then we'll finish off our seasonings with a little bit of paprika, as well as some ground cumin. And then last but not least, everybody's favorite secret ingredient, cinnamon. And then let's take a whisk and give this a mix. And this will be the perfect time to admit I'm not really sure how Turkish this recipe is. I don't really do a lot of research, or any research, but I am basing this on a Turkish lamb marinade that I've used for years. Plus, we've never called anything Turkish before. So that's what I went with. But anyway, like I said, we'll mix that up. And once that's set, we'll simply set that aside and move on to the chicken. And I'm going to be using boneless, skinless chicken thighs for this. Why anyone would want to do this with chicken breasts is beyond me. But having said that, you are the kibas of your kebab. So you use whatever you want, but I am going with the thighs. And you can, if you want, certainly use these chicken thighs whole. But I generally like to cut them in half. I think it works out a little better. So as you can see, I'm going to split these pieces in two. And then once our thighs have been cut up, we can go ahead and toss that in the marinade but not all at once. All right, I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but chicken thighs are famous for all their nooks and crannies. So if we just dump it all in at once and try to mix it up, there may be some nooks and or crannies that don't get enough marinade. So I do take an extra minute and make sure each piece is getting thoroughly coated. And once we are confident that's happened, we will wrap that up and we'll let that marinade in the fridge from anywhere between two and eight hours. So ideally I like to do this the morning of the day we're gonna grill. But yes, you can leave it overnight, but when it comes to yogurt-based marinades, I'm always a little scared to let them go too long. So I am recommending two to eight hours, after which we can pull it out and begin the impaling process. And I'm gonna use some metal skewers for this. And not just one, we're gonna use two metal skewers per kebab, and that's gonna give us increased stability and a little better maneuverability on the grill. And of course, because we are using two skewers, we've basically doubled the chances you will accidentally give your hand the old poka poka. So be careful as you're doing this. And please note how we're putting these on here. Okay, we're doing them a flat way, kind of side to side, so that we can fit a lot more meat onto one kebab, which is going to give us this nice, thick, gorgeous log of chicken, as opposed to just a few chunks. And I really didn't do any trimming to these chicken thighs, but if you do see a little piece of anything weird, go ahead and pull it off. And the other nice thing about stacking these kind of side to side like this, is not only are we going to get a larger mass of meat to grill, which means more caramelization on the outside and a more tender, juicy inside. But we've also created tons of cracks and crevices, which are gonna help absorb all that beautiful smoky flavor from the grill. And once those are set, we'll just clean up our plate a little bit. And of course our hands and any surface that touched raw chicken. And if you want, you can just wrap this up and leave it in the fridge until your grill is ready. But mine was ready. So I'm gonna head out back and toss these on a charcoal grill. And one huge tip here, Yogurt-based marinades are incredible, but they love to stick. So do not even think of turning this over for at least three or four minutes. All right, we need some serious crustification first. Otherwise, you may tear your chicken. So I let mine go for, like I said, at least three or four minutes until I could kind of feel it was releasing from the grill, at which point we'll flip that over. And even though it may stick a little bit here and there, that's not too bad. And then the same drill for the other side, basically. 
Let it go for three or four minutes before you try to turn it, and then after that, all bets are off. You can continue to cook that, flip it around as you see fit, until it reaches your desired level of doneness. And to be safe, I'm going to suggest you use a thermometer. And one nice thing, because we did line up that chicken side by side, we have a little more room for error than your traditional chicken kebab, which are usually just smaller chunks of chicken, which really can overcook quickly. So if you do happen to leave these on a couple extra minutes, you should still be pretty good. And by the way, you know when the tiny scraps that are attached to the grill taste awesome, that this is going to be good. But anyway, like I said, we will cook that to our desired level of doneness, at which point we'll head back inside and transfer these on to our platter. And I like to transfer it right onto some lavash. I mean, why have those amazing juices dripping on the platter when they could be soaking into something we can eat? And then, of course, as they say, man cannot live by chicken and bread alone. So we're going to go ahead and surround this with some very delicious and appropriate garnishes, which, as you can see, includes cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, some parsley and onions, as well as some fresh lemon. And that Turkish chicken kebab platter is done. You know I'm no food stylist. I prove that almost every video. But this really is something that takes very little effort to make look gorgeous. And at this point, there's nothing left to do except to de-skewer these and eat. And man, is it succulent. Forget the amazing flavor from all those spices. There's something about a yogurt-based marinade that just makes the best grilled meat. It just comes out so moist and tender, just absolutely gorgeous. And if you want, you can eat this in big chunks, dinner plate style. But what I like to do is kind of chop it up a little bit and use it in what I call a Turkish taco. And what that is is a piece of lavash I've warmed on the grill, and I'll swipe that with a little bit of hummus before topping it with some chicken, and then we'll go ahead and garnish with some cucumber and some tomato and some onion and parsley, of course. And then I think the best way to finish this is with a spoon of cold yogurt sauce. Our tzatziki sauce would be perfect here, although apparently I'm supposed to pronounce it tzatziki, but that feels awkward. But what doesn't feel awkward is to finish this with an extra pinch of chili flakes, and we'll roll that up, and that, my friends, is something you definitely want to eat. Just such an incredibly delicious bite of food. And by the way, I've been experimenting with some new voice-activated lavash. Check this out. I say open. Huh. Oh, you know what? I'm using the wrong line. Open says me. There we go. That's better. But anyway, all kidding aside, this really did come out fantastic. And for a technique that's so simple, it really does produce beautiful, delicious grilled chicken. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Butterscotch Budino. That's right, I'm going to show you my take on this amazing Italian custard pudding. And by the way, if you were thinking Budino was like an adorable Italian word for some adorable thing, it's not. Apparently it comes from a medieval word for sausage. So we might just have to make up our own story for what that word means which when it comes to recipes is totally fine. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started with this very simple recipe. And what we'll do first is add one very firmly packed half cup of brown sugar to the saucepan. And if it comes out too quickly, you did not pack it firm enough. We will also go ahead and add some salt, which because I'm using one that has a large flaky grain, looks like a lot more than it really is. And then last but not least, we will add a splash of water. And we'll set our heat to medium high. And for some reason, I gave this a stir with the whisk which really isn't necessary. And all I really accomplished here was getting that sugar on the sides of the pan, which is why as this came up to temperature, I swirled it around a few times to wash that stuff down. But anyway, what we're gonna do is bring this up to a boil on medium high heat. And what we'll do is cook this for about seven to 10 minutes or until the mixture darkens and smells like caramelized sugar. And when we'll start really paying attention is when our bubbles start to increase in size, which means our water is boiling out of the mixture and the temperature of that sugar is rising. And what we're looking for here besides bigger and bigger bubbles is that the color of the mixture will darken. So those are our visual clues. But as that happens, this will also start to smell like caramelized sugar, which is exactly the point I was at right here, which I believe took me about eight or nine minutes. And once that happens, we will immediately turn off the heat and we'll go ahead and carefully toss in a chunk of butter and start stirring with a whisk while we grab and carefully pour in our heavy cream. And the reason we're going a little bit slow here is because when you pour liquid into a caramelized sugar, it can really bubble and foam up pretty quickly, so you gotta be careful. And because my cream is right out of the fridge, this sugar is almost immediately gonna seize up, which basically means harden up, and it's gonna stick to the pan and mostly to the whisk. But that's okay, don't worry, because we're gonna turn our heat back on to medium low, and as our cream heats back up, that sugar will dissolve, 
and our whisk will become clean. Yes, and of course you can heat the cream up first and significantly lessen that effect, but why add an extra step when we don't have to? So you'll see, just keep stirring, and everything will work out just fine. And by the way, let me apologize for the pants, which I splattered with some butter and flour making an unrelated recipe, and I didn't realize they were in the frame. But in fairness, while I did get them dirty, I also made them more delicious. But anyway, we're going to stir that on medium-low until our sugar dissolves, at which point we're going to go ahead and add a little bit of milk, which I guess we could have added with the cream, but for whatever reason, I like to add it here. And that's it, we'll stir that in and simply let this sit on medium-low while we mix up our egg and cornstarch thickener. So into a mixing bowl, we will add one whole egg, plus two egg yolks, followed by our cornstarch. And then what we'll do is take a whisk and mix this until it's very, very smooth, which is gonna take you a minute or two. All right, cornstarch does not like to get mixed into things quickly. I mean, it's kind of a jerk about it. But if you keep whisking and whisking and whisking, eventually all those lumps will break up and dissolve. And eventually it will look like this. And then once that happens, we're going to do something that we call in the business, tempering the mixture, which simply means whisking in about a cup of our hot cream mixture from the stove. And when you do yours, try not to drip. And what this does is not only dilute the amount of eggs, but it also raises the temperature, which allows us after tempering to transfer the contents of the bowl back into the saucepan without us having to worry about those eggs curdling. And then once we have everything together, we will raise our heat to medium high, and we will cook whisking constantly for about two minutes or so, or until our mixture thickens up. And if everything goes according to plan, after a couple minutes your mixture should look a little something like this. Right, beautifully thick and luxurious, with no big chunks of scrambled egg. And at this point we can pull it off the stove, and then pass that through a fine mesh strainer, just in case. Although if I'm being honest, this is probably totally unnecessary since the next time I find any major chunks in that strainer will be the first. But anyway, better safe than sorry. And by passing it through, we do guarantee our mixture will be perfectly smooth. And then once that's been accomplished, we go ahead and add our last ingredient, which is the liquor. And of course, since we're making a butterscotch budino, we'll go ahead and add one tablespoon of rum. And I should mention dark rum would be more traditional, but I'm using white since that's all I have. And the sad thing is I could have bought a bottle and expensed it. But anyway, both work, so use what you want. I mean, you are after all the Chris Constantino of your butterscotch budino. Now that's a chef that knows about medieval sausage. But anyway, we will whisk in our rum and then carefully and neatly transfer this into whatever serving glasses we're going to use. And because this is such a rich dessert, I'm going to use these rocks glasses, but just fill them up halfway, which I think is a perfect portion. And we'll also hopefully give them a more dramatic presentation. And then because I'm going to top these with a little bit of optional caramel sauce later, I decided to take a spoon and give them a little stir to smooth out the top, which sort of worked, but I also ended up smearing it up on the sides of the glass. So maybe don't stir so hard if you want a cleaner line. And that's it. Once we have those portioned, we will give them the old tapa tapa, followed by the old rapa rapa. And we'll go ahead and pop those in the fridge for a few hours, or until very thoroughly chilled before we try to serve these. And then once these are ice cold and have firmed up, we could, if we want, serve them as is, or with some whipped cream. But what I'm going to recommend is topping these with a spoon of caramel sauce. And you know what? Because you made these from scratch, we're going to let you use the caramel sauce in the squeeze bottle from the store if you want. But homemade caramel sauce is very easy, and we have a video for that. So if you want to make a little bit of homemade like I did, you really should. And I will add a link for how to do that. And then what I did after topping with that is I kind of tipped the glass around so that caramel would maybe cover up my imperfect edges which sort of worked. But then I remembered this is an Italian dessert, and it's not supposed to look perfect. All right, that's much more their French friends to the Norse thing. But anyway, we'll garnish those with a little bit of caramel sauce, and then we'll place those back into the fridge until we're ready to serve, which I'm going to do right now. And because salted caramel is one of my favorite things ever, I garnish the top with a pinch of extra large flaky sea salt. And that's it, our butterscotch budino is ready to enjoy. So let me go ahead and grab a spoon and dig in to what is truly one of the world's great desserts. And above and beyond that rich, decadent butterscotch flavor, the texture here is unbelievable. I mean, to say it's smooth and luxurious does not even come close to doing it justice. Which reminds me, if you want to adjust and make it a little firmer, that just means adding a little more cornstarch. Or if you wanted it a little softer and creamier, you could just add a little less cornstarch. But for me, this was absolutely perfect. Just pure luxury on a spoon. And while this is very rich and satisfying, 
It really is not overly heavy, and since it's nice and cold, borderline refreshing. Which, because these are made ahead of time, makes them an absolutely perfect summertime dessert. Oh, and by the way, you remember earlier when I said we should probably come up with another story for what the word budino means? Well, as I was eating this, I came up with mine. All right, according to me, budino is the Italian word for one of those beautiful puffy clouds at sunset that takes on the golden hue of the falling sun. That's what the name budino comes from. So feel free to use that one if you want, or come up with something different on your own. But either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Bob's Kebabs. That's right, there once was a man named Bob who showed me how to make this kebab. He wasn't the chef. The chef's name was Jeff. But still, he did a great job. And while I'm not able to tell you too much about Bob, due to some very strict non-disclosure agreements, I am very excited and very happy to be able to share this recipe. And now that grilling season's upon us, this is definitely something you're going to want to work into the rotation. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by mixing up our spice blend, which is going to start with some ground cumin, a little bit of coriander, some Aleppo chili flakes, a generous amount of kosher salt, as well as, of course, a little shake of cayenne, and then last but not least, Bob's secret ingredient, a very small pinch of cinnamon. Okay, if you can taste the cinnamon, you put too much. But just a little tiny hint in the background really works well here. And then what we're going to do after we give this a mix is use our spoon to push off about one third of the mixture to the side. And the reason for that is we're going to use two thirds to season the meat. And then the other third will get sprinkled on the outside before our kebabs get grilled. Okay, so once we have that separated, we'll go ahead and take a pound of ground meat. In my case, lamb, but you can also use beef, or a combination of both, which is very nice. And like I said, we'll go ahead and transfer over two-thirds of our spice mix, along with two tablespoons of very cold, fresh water. And that's it. Once we drizzle that in, we'll take one clean hand, and we will mix and mash this until it's thoroughly combined. And this is one of the few times when we're mixing ground meat, where we don't really have to worry about overworking it too much, since traditionally, once cooked, the meat's supposed to have a little bit of a springy texture. Okay, not tough but slightly springy. And that's partly the reason we added some water to this, which of course is also gonna add a little bit of extra juiciness. And that's it, once that's very thoroughly mixed, we'll go ahead and cover that in plastic, and we'll pop that in the fridge for about an hour or so, or until it's nicely chilled. Okay, cold meat is always easier to handle and shape, plus it will give those spices some time to work their magic. Oh, and while that's happening, let's not forget to soak our wooden skewers in some water so they don't burn up on the grill. And then what we'll do once those have soaked for about an hour and our meat mixture is nice and cold, we will go ahead and pull that out and then take one eighth of the mixture and we will roll that two ounce portion into a nice ball after wetting our fingers with some of that water we use to soak the skewers. Because as you know, damp hands make smooth balls. And then once we have that into a nice smooth ball, we'll kind of shape it into an oval and then skewer it, making sure we go right through the center. And then what we'll do once we have that squeezed out to about three inches or so, we will also want to kind of taper both ends down to a point, which is not only going to help this stay attached to the skewer, it's also going to make it look super cool and enticing. Okay, as you may have heard me say before, it is a proven scientific fact that people love pointy food. And that's it, exactly how Bob formed his kebabs. And while most people think of chunks of meat on a skewer when they hear kebab, here I'm going to show you the other style of kebab, sometimes referred to as kofta or kefta or kufta, that features ground meat. And while both versions are great, this is the style that Bob and I prefer. But anyway, I went ahead and formed the rest to make eight total, at which point I do like to wrap them and chill them again, although if you wanted, you could cook these right away. But personally, I like these very cold before I cook them. Plus, it's always easier to have things prepped ahead of time. And while those were chillaxing in the fridge, I went ahead and mixed up a quick yogurt sauce, which was simply some plain Greek yogurt, some very finely crushed garlic, a little bit of freshly chopped parsley, as well as some freshly squeezed lemon juice, and then enough fresh cold water to thin this out to the exact consistency we want. And once all that's in there, we'll go ahead and give it a mix. And yes, this would have been way faster and easier with a whisk, but the spoon was already dirty from scooping in the yogurt. And I remember Bob used to always say, the already dirty utensil is always better than the more effective clean utensil. So it took me an extra minute or so, but eventually I got that all stirred together nice and smooth. And no, I didn't add any salt because our meat's going to be very well seasoned. So we should be okay. And we can refrigerate that until needed. And then you remember that third of the seasonings we saved? If we can find it, 
we're going to go ahead and add a spoon of sumac to this. And if you can't find it, don't stress. But if you can, add it in, as it does add a very interesting sort of sour, tangy, citrus-like flavor. And then what we'll do once that's mixed is pull our Bob's Kebabs out of the fridge. And we're going to season those all over with the rest of our spice mixture. And while you're doing this, if you want to do a little bit of fine-tuning with the shaping, feel free. Oh, and I should mention a lot of the kebab recipes will actually have you add the sumac to the meat mixture. But Bob was a big believer of only putting it on the outside. But anyway, suit yourself. I mean, you are after all the Robert Duvalls of these impaled meatballs. But if I'm making something called Bob's Kebabs, I am going to kebab like Bob. And he thought it was better with this just on the outside. And that's it. Once these are set, we can go ahead and cook them up. Which I'm going to do by grilling them over some beautiful Japanese-style charcoal. And while, of course, any kind of grill would work, these narrow hibachi-style grills are perfect for skewered meat. But in any event, I'm going to grill these for about 10 to 12 minutes total, turning these about every three minutes or so, so that hopefully the entire surface faces the heat. And as far as doneness goes, you could use a thermometer and cook these to about 135 internal temp. But for me, when they go from feeling kind of mushy to feeling kind of firm and springy, they're usually done. And like I said, these took me about 12 minutes altogether. And that's it. Once I felt those were done, both physically and mentally, I removed those to a plate and headed back inside, where I served those up on a beautiful platter of tomatoes, cucumbers, and red onions that I dressed very lightly with some salt and some olive oil. And after arranging those as shown, I went ahead and scattered over some more freshly chopped parsley. And yes, brushing off some parsley does count as food styling. I also dusted over some more sumac, since that is going to be really good with those vegetables underneath. And of course, we're also going to want some grilled pita bread nearby. And then I went ahead and finished this up by spooning a little bit of that yogurt sauce over the top, which I thought would look nice for the pictures, especially garnished with one last sprinkling of sumac. And that's it. This beautiful batch of Bob's Kebabs is done and ready to enjoy. And for this first one, I'm just going to enjoy it as is right off the skewer. And that, my friends, was just incredible. Okay, I think Bob would have been very proud. Just an incredibly flavorful bite of meat, perfectly seasoned inside and out. And there's just something about lamb spice this way, that when you combine it with the smokiness from the grill, just elevates this to a whole other level. And please stop looking at that parsley on my thumb. And while very delicious plain, what you really want to do is nestle this into some nice warm pita, along with some of those nice cool crisp fresh veggies. And of course lots of our garlicky lemony yogurt sauce. And if there's a better thing to eat, especially in the middle of grilling season. I just can't think of it right now. And as I mentioned earlier, while I prefer this done with lamb, it's also really good done with beef, or a combination of half and half, which, by the way, Bob was a big fan of. He used to say, why choose when you can have both? But anyway, that's it. How to kebab like Bob. I only wish he was around to see this, and not in the witness protection program, where I'm not able to get him a message. But anyway, hopefully somehow he stumbles across this, and if he did, I think he'd say the same thing I'm going to say now. Which is, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Flaming Greek Cheese. That's right, this Saganagi video is dedicated to everyone who's ever said there's nothing better than fried cheese. Since it turns out there is. And that would be fried cheese we set on fire before we serve it. And while we're officially posting this as a super exciting, sexy date night and or Valentine's Day first course idea, when you consider this Greek classic only takes about five minutes to make, it's also suitable for any old weeknight you feel like something a little different. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with the star of the show, our Greek cheese. And while there are various options, this Kasari is my favorite. And yes, it might be pronounced Kasiri, but I was confusing my phone, so I say Kasari. And besides loving the taste, this brand I buy comes in a very Saganaki friendly size portion. So hopefully you'll be able to find something similar. But if not, you're just going to have to slice your own piece somewhere between a quarter and a half inch thick. And don't worry, I'm going to give you more info about the cheese on the blog. And I'll list a few different alternatives. But anyway, what we'll do to prep this after unwrapping it is to brush each side lightly with water. Which I'm going to do with a brush here. But if you're not doing a video, feel free to just wet this under the faucet for a second. And then what we'll do once that's been moistened in water is go ahead and dredge both sides in flour, making sure that surface is completely covered. And other than maybe brushing off a little bit of the excess before we put it in the pan, our cheese is officially prepped. 
and we can move on to introduce you to the rest of the ingredients. And while not technically an ingredient, next to the cheese, the most important thing to pull this off would be some kind of well-seasoned cast iron skillet. Right, there is a way you can do this in a nonstick pan and then transfer it onto plates and flambe it. But for the full effect, I think using one of these is the way to go. And then besides that, we'll also need a little bit of olive oil to fry our cheese, as well as a couple tablespoons of highly flammable liquor, which in my case is gonna be some brandy. But really, any other kind of high-proof booze will work. And then once our cheese has been fried and flambéed, we will finish up with some lemon, as well as some freshly chopped parsley. And believe it or not, that's it. And then what we'll do when we're ready to serve is place our skillet on medium-high heat and get it very, very hot, is in starting to smoke. And then what we'll do as soon as we determine our pan is hot enough is pour in about a tablespoon of olive oil and then carefully, very carefully, place in our flour cheese. And if you're smart, you should probably use tongs. And what we're gonna do is cook this first side for about two minutes or until it forms a beautiful golden brown crust and the cheese begins to ooze out. And then what we'll do once that happens and our cheese looks a little something like this is quickly and without hesitation flip it over. Because if you do hesitate like I did here and move the spatula, you will, like I just did, totally screw up that beautiful crusty surface. But don't worry, since this stuff is still hot and flexible, it is pretty easy to fix and reposition like I'm doing here. In fact, I even got a little bit cocky and used some of this extra crispy stuff from the side to transplant onto a spot that didn't have any crustiness. So to summarize, no matter how bad your flip, and that was one of my worst ever, it's not gonna matter and the final product is still gonna look amazing. But anyway, we're gonna flip that over and we'll just give that second side about 30 seconds or until I think about a quarter to a third of the cheese is melted. Oh, and a quick tip, don't try to clean any cheese off the side of the pan with your bare fingers. It is super hot and painful. But anyway, what we'll do after that second side is cooked about 30 seconds is quickly remove that from the heat, at which point it's time to dim the lights and pour over our brandy. And then as soon as we ignite that with the lighter, everybody has to yell Opa as it bursts into flames. Are you ready? Don't leave me hanging. Here we go. Three, two, one. Opa! And that's it. Everybody stands around watching it burn. And of course, taking pictures they can Instagram later. And then what we'll do to finish this off is extinguish the last of the flames with a squeeze of fresh lemon, as well as top it off with a little bit of freshly chopped Italian parsley, or fresh oregano if you want. Although that's a little strong for me, so I do recommend the parsley. But up to you. You are, after all, the Apollo of what advice to follow. But anyway, once that's been lemoned and parsleyed, it is ready to serve up on some bread, toasted or otherwise. And for me, a perfectly executed saganaki is one where 25% of the cheese is crispy and caramelized, 25% is gooey and melted, 25% is unmelted, and the last 25% is we're not sure. And as you can see, that's exactly what we have right here. Just an amazing combination of textures. It's kind of like a fondue meets mozzarella sticks. And if you've never had this Greek cheese, it kind of reminds me of a provolone with sort of a feta flavor profile. And speaking of flavor, don't forget to dip your bread in what's basically a dressing formed by the olive oil, melted cheese, lemon juice, and brandy, which is just incredibly tasty. And you might be thinking, with all that liquid, there's no way that cheese stayed crispy and crusty. Well, it did. Check it out. So I just absolutely love everything about this dish. The texture, the taste, and, of course, the pyrotechnics. And by the way, if you're afraid to serve this, because you're afraid of burning down your kitchen, or possibly injuring one of your guests who then sues you, those aren't bad things to think about, since they are real possibilities. But for me, totally worth the risk, since there's just no way this could come out tasting any better. Okay, fine, maybe one way. But anyway, that's it. How I like to Saganaki. Whether you're gonna serve this trying to spark up a little romance with an old flame on date night, or you're just looking for something fast and fun for a chilly weeknight, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Baked feta filo with honey. That's right, my favorite flavor combination of all time is sweet and salty. And while there are thousands of different ways to combine those two elements, there are none more delicious or beautiful or perfect than baked feta with honey. Oh, and since we're using ready-made phyllo dough, this is also very fast and easy. And to get started, the first thing we'll need is some high-quality feta, which typically come in these 7-ounce blocks that are about an inch thick. 
which unfortunately for this preparation is going to be too thick. So what we'll need to do is split this in half so we can get two portions. But the problem is if we try to cut through the whole thing, it's going to be tricky to get an accurate cut and the feta could break. So to make this easier, let's go ahead and cut it in half. And then we'll tip this smaller piece on its side and we will carefully cut right down through the middle with our knife. In this way, we have less cheese to go through as we slice this into the proper thickness. And that's it once cut. If we place both of those pieces together, as you'll see when we wrap this, we're gonna have the perfect size and shape for the amount of filo we're gonna use. And by the way, I'm using a Greek feta, which is made with sheep and goat milk, which in my opinion produces the best feta, but any feta that's moist enough to cut through and doesn't crumble will work for this. And if you're worried that second one I just cut is not gonna work because it's so uneven, don't worry, it'll be fine. Okay, I'm just gonna turn this side to make it match a little better. And really, once our cheese is wrapped, that variation in thickness will not matter at all. And that's it, once we've cut the cheese, we will move on to mixing up our egg butter olive oil mixture, which believe it or not, we will make by adding some melted butter and some olive oil to an egg, and then whisking it until we have a nice emulsion and this is what we'll use to brush on our phyllo before we wrap our feta. And speaking of phyllo dough, once we're ready to assemble, we will place two sheets down on our counter. And by the way, ignore those cracks and terrible appearance for the moment. I'm going to talk about that very shortly. But what we'll do once we have two sheets down is start brushing this carefully with our egg mixture. And we don't need to or even want to go for total coverage. Okay, I'd say about 75% of the surface is ideal. And now that we've covered that, let's talk cracks. Okay, if you use store-bought phyllo, there's almost always gonna be some cracks, especially if you try to unroll it while it's still partially frozen, which I always do. But as you're about to see, those are really not gonna cause a problem. And once our phyllo is brushed, we will place our feta down, leaving enough dough at the bottom so that we can fold that up over the cheese and it covers completely. And then we'll go ahead and brush that part. And once that's been accomplished, we will fold over both sides towards the center, right nice and neatly up to the edges of our cheese. Oh, and as I do this, please note the positioning of those cracks, which are sort of near the middle, a little bit towards the top. Just keep that in mind for a moment while I give this one more brushing with our egg mixture. And the reason I want you paying attention to where those cracks are is because once this is brushed, to finish it, we're simply gonna roll it up into a nice tight package, hopefully ending up with our seams on the bottom. And because those cracks were in the spots they were, as I finished the fold, those ended up being on top, which again, as you'll see, is not gonna be a problem. But let me go ahead and fold up this second one and show you a little bit of a workaround. Okay, so I started with two sheets again, and I brushed it exactly the same way, except please note, I turned those phyllo sheets around so the cracks were near the bottom, closer to where I'm gonna be placing the cheese. And by starting with any crack dough in that area, by the time this gets folded and rolled up, those cracks are gonna be folded inside. And if everything goes according to plan, we should end up with a perfectly smooth surface. And yes, it would have been nice if both of the ones I made had a perfectly smooth surface, but it took me making that first one and seeing where those cracks started and where they ended up to be able to improve the method and end up with the best appearance possible. All right, in the business, we refer to this as the learning process. But visible cracks or not, once these are done, we'll transfer them onto a Silpat lime baking sheet. And there's the nice one, followed by what we'll call the worst case scenario one. And then before these go in a nice hot oven, we will brush those tops with our egg mixture, followed by, if we want, an optional application of sesame seeds. And I'm gonna do both white sesame seeds and a few black sesame seeds which I just think makes these look so much more interesting. And who among us does not enjoy food that looks interesting? Oh, and while I sprinkle those, let me sneak in a shameless plug for a video we posted recently called Black Magic Sesame Crisps, which is one of the most delicious and addictive cracker-like snacks you will ever eat. So if you haven't seen it and you have black sesame seeds, please check it out. And that's it, once those have been seeded or not, they are ready to transfer into the center of a 425 degree oven for about 20 minutes or until they're beautifully browned and look like this. And you might be thinking, you made us listen to all that crack talk for nothing since both of those look fine. Well, you know what, you're probably right. 
And as long as these are nice and crisp and browned, including the bottoms, then we did a fine job. Although that second one we did on the right does look better. And now I'm going to let it go. And we will transfer these onto a cutting board. And I will prove I'm over the crack issue by cutting and serving the less perfect one first. And for that, I'm going to use a mezzaluna, which is perfect for cutting things in half. I mean, the word half is right in the name. And hopefully you can see here what I think is the perfect ratio between that gorgeous, hot, creamy feta and that crispy, flaky phyllo dough. So to me, that is looking just about perfect. But hold on, it gets better. So let's go ahead and plate these up and move on to the real money shot, which is, of course, this being slowly drizzled with lots of Greek honey, or, of course, the honey of your choice. I mean, you are, after all, the bad bunny of which honey. Right, typically I would use a local honey, but because I'd used Greek feta and had recently bought some Greek honey online after watching a show about blue zones, which are areas where people live to like 110, I decided to go with that. But no matter what you use, use plenty. And once that was generously drizzled, I went ahead and grabbed a fork and we will take a bite of what I think is sweet and salty perfection. And of course, there is so much more going on with a good feta than just saltiness. Okay, it's also savory and creamy and a little bit funky. And all those things, along with the saltiness, are why this is an absolute perfect pairing with the honey. And I should have mentioned it earlier, but what makes this baked feta filo different from most versions is that they generally just use butter or olive oil or a combination to brush the filo with. Whereas here we also use some egg which adds some moisture and richness and makes this a little more pastry-like than your typical baked phyllo recipe. All right, those often look nice and they're very crispy, but as soon as you put the fork in, it basically explodes into like a thousand different dry flaky pieces. So I do prefer the texture of this approach. Plus, since we're using a little less butter and oil, this version is in fact a little lower in calories. Although of all the reasons to make this, that is by far the worst one. And the other thing I love about this is how versatile it is as far as when you can serve it. Right, we can make a batch of these and then cut them up in pieces and they make a fantastic appetizer for any party. Or you can serve this with hot coffee or tea for breakfast. And when you eat something like this in the morning, you are setting yourself up for a very successful day. Try it, you'll see. And then finally, you could put a big salad next to one of these and have it for lunch or dinner or both. But no matter how or when you enjoy this, it is profoundly delicious and fast and easy to make, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pasta a la trapanese. That's right, I'm gonna show you how to make an amazing pasta featuring Sicily's amazing tomato pesto. And I am very excited to be sharing my version with you. And I love the green Genovese style pesto, but when super sweet cherry tomatoes are in season, I really believe this pesto is the best pesto. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with one optional step. And that would be blanching some almonds, which is simply done by bringing a couple cups of water to a boil. And then we'll pull that off the heat and we'll dump in our almonds and what we'll do is give that a stir and let it sit for about three or four minutes, at which point the skins on the almonds will come off very, very easily. Okay, they will pretty much slip right off. And we do this because the skins of almonds are really tough and they can actually irritate the throats of some people. So yeah, she can make this pesto without doing that, but this only takes a few extra minutes and I think it's much, much nicer. So once those soak long enough, we'll simply drain them and as soon as they're cool enough to handle, we'll go ahead and peel off the skins. Although you might notice some steam coming off these, since I was too impatient to wait. But either way, we'll prep about a half cup. And then besides the almonds, we are also going to need some garlic and salt, as well as some Pecorino Romano cheese. Although some people do use Parmesan or a combination. And then even though this is a tomato-based pesto, we're still going to need some basil, as well as a little bit of fresh mint which for this dish is the secret ingredient that everybody knows. And then we can't make pesto without some good olive oil. Plus the star of the show, a pound of the best, sweetest cherry tomatoes you can find, which I got at the farmer's market. 
but it was slightly under a pound, so I tossed in a few sun gold and a couple small Roma tomatoes from the garden. And then before we toss everything into a blender, I'm going to add my sliced garlic and my salt to this mortar, and I'm going to smash it into a very fine paste. Okay, classically, the entire pesto would be made in one of these, although a much bigger one. But you probably don't have one, and that's a lot of work. And I think all the other ingredients are fine in a blender. The only one that doesn't come out the same would be the garlic. So if you can, smash it up like this before you start. And then once that's set, we can toss our almonds in the blender, followed by the cheese. And by the way, this is not random. I want you to go in this order. Since I want the cheese and the nuts to kind of grind up first, before the wetter stuff starts mixing in. And then we'll toss in our mint and our basil. And yes, those are small leaves. And that's because I grew it on our deck. And I got to pick it nice and young and tender and sweet. And that's it. We'll transfer in our mashed garlic and salt, followed by our olive oil. And then last but not least, our cherry tomatoes. And then we'll pop on the lid and we'll start blending this. And of course, we're going to begin by pulsing on and off. And the almonds and cheese at the bottom will blend first. And as we keep pulsing, everything will eventually be incorporated. And then once it comes together, we can blend it on high speed until it's the exact texture we want, which for me is pretty smooth, but some people do prefer to leave it coarse, which is probably closer to the texture you'd get if you used a mortar and pestle. But anyway, to me, this is perfect right here. And of course, like any sauce, hot or cold, we definitely want to give it a taste and maybe add a little more salt if we need it. But other than that, believe it or not, this sauce is done. Okay, pesto a la trapanese is a raw sauce, so we don't need to cook it before we add it to our pasta. Speaking of which, it's time to cook some. And as usual, we're using some well-salted boiling water. And classically, we'd use a pasta called buziate, which this isn't exactly, but it's very similar in shape. All right, this was actually sold as bucatini fusilli. But the good news is pretty much any similarly shaped pasta will work. Or any kind of pasta, I guess. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are, after all, the Maximilian of cooking like a Sicilian. But I do think we want to use something that's going to trap that delicious pesto sauce. And this is a perfect shape for that. And what we'll do is go ahead and boil that until it's done to our liking. But keep in mind, we are not going to cook this in the sauce like we do with a lot of pasta recipes. So please make sure it's cooked enough because it's not going to get any more tender in the sauce. And then what I'll do once I decide the pasta is cooked is use a strainer, or a spider as we call it in the business, since it looks like a spider web. But anyway, we'll use that to transfer it into a bowl. And it's totally fine if a little bit of that water comes along with it, since some of that starchy cooking liquid is actually part of the sauce. In fact, once you're done, save that water, because we're going to add some more of that in. Plus, if we need more later, we want it to be available. And then to finish this, what we'll do is transfer in about a third of a cup of that pasta water, and then as much of that pesto sauce as we want, along with a nice big pinch of salt. And then we'll take a couple spoons, and we will toss this until it's thoroughly and evenly coated. Oh, and I should mention, I only cooked eight ounces of pasta, and the amount of pesto we made is enough for a pound, with probably a little bit left over to enjoy on some bread. But anyway, I just wanted to mention, I'm using slightly less than half of the sauce, and that's it. Once that's been mixed together, I usually toss in a little more grated pecorino. And we'll give that one last toss before we serve up. And as I spoon this into the bowl, please note how beautifully creamy and decadent this looks. Okay, it almost looks like we added some cream. And besides the luxurious texture, I think the color is absolutely stunning. And that's it. We'll finish the top with a little more grated cheese. Whoops, I lost a shred. Don't worry, I will eat that between shots. And then I also like to sprinkle over a little bit of chopped almond. And then last but not least, a small and adorable sprig of basil. And that's it, my pasta a la trapanese is ready to enjoy. And that, my friends, is just an absolutely tremendous dish of pasta. Okay, first and foremost, we have those beautiful sweet cherry tomatoes, which I think if we're going to make a raw tomato sauce, are probably the best choice. All right, they're not just sweet and savory, but they have that little bit of acidity to them, which really brightens everything else up. And then what the almonds do here, 
is the same thing that pine nuts do in a regular pesto, right? They add that nutty, earthy richness, which marries perfectly with the cheese and the herbs. So while this appears to be totally different, there really are a lot of similarities with traditional Genovese-style pesto, which I love, but in the middle of summer, when cherry tomatoes are at their peak, I think if you're in the mood for pesto, this is the way to go. And while I've been to Italy, I've never been to Sicily, so I'm really not sure how exactly close my version is, and hopefully one of these days I'll find out. But in the meantime, I absolutely love everything about this, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Grilled Greek chicken breast with whipped feta. That's right, I'm going to show you my favorite marinade and technique for grilling boneless, skinless chicken breasts, which can be a challenge since they're often so dry and bland, but not with this method. Plus, I'm going to show you how to make my new favorite thing to eat, which is whipped feta. So yes, you're actually getting two video recipes this time for the same low, low price of free. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our chicken. And what I have here are four rather large boneless, skinless breasts. And we do want to use relatively large ones here. I would say a minimum of seven to eight ounces each. And what we'll do to prep these is simply cut them in half lengthwise, pretty much exactly in half. Although generally one side is a little bit fatter than the other. So I think it's okay to cheat over and make that side a little bit smaller. And there's a few really good reasons to do this, All right? By cutting these in half, we have more surface area for the marinade to get into, as well as later we'll have more surface area on the grill to brown and caramelize which I believe is the same thing. And if someone just wants half a breast when we serve later, they are not forced to awkwardly go around the table asking people who wants to split a breast. So for all those reasons and more, I think this is a great idea. And that's it, once those are set, we'll pop them in the fridge and we'll move on to the marinade, which will begin with some red wine vinegar or the vinegar of your choice, followed by some kosher salt, as well as some freshly ground black pepper. And yes, you knew it was coming. We'll also do a little bit of cayenne. And then we can't call it Greek chicken without some herbs. So we're gonna do some dried thyme, some dried oregano and rosemary. And of course you can use fresh if you want, but generally dry herbs work better in a marinade than fresh ones. And the same thing goes for our garlic addition. All right, I'm gonna use some dried garlic powder here, but don't worry, we are gonna have some fresh garlic in our whip feta. And that's it, we'll give this a quick mix before we transfer in our chicken at which point we'll toss that around until thoroughly and evenly coated. And I was about to say that's gonna be it for the marinade, but it's not. We are also gonna add some olive oil to this, but I have a theory that it's better to toss the chicken with the vinegar and the other ingredients first, since that'll give it a chance to start absorbing before these pieces get coated with the oil, which if you added the oil first, may actually insulate the meat and not allow the same penetration. And no, I can't prove this theory, and my evidence is purely anecdotal, but it just feels right, and that's good enough for me. And then what we'll do once that has been tossed in the oil is go ahead and arrange those in one nice neat layer, and then we'll cover this in plastic, and we will let it marinate in the fridge for a minimum of one hour to a maximum of overnight, with the sweet spot for me being two to three hours. And while we're waiting, we can move on to our whipped feta, which is basically gonna be equal parts of Greek yogurt plus ideally a Greek feta, or something else with a similarly appropriate texture, which is as soft and creamy as possible. Okay, we need soft and smushy, not firm and dry and crumbly. And what we'll do is add that to our bowl of yogurt. And for heaven's sake, buy a whole piece and crumble it in yourself. All right, that pre-crumbled stuff is gonna be much drier and not as good. And seriously, if you don't have 10 seconds to crumble the cheese in, you probably shouldn't be cooking. So unless that's all you can find, get some good stuff. I know that was tough love, but love nonetheless. And then the only other things we're gonna put in here would be a little bit of finely crushed garlic, plus about a tablespoon of freshly chopped mint. And then last but not least, the zest from one lemon. And if you're wondering, shouldn't we put the juice in too? Won't that make it better? Well, no we shouldn't, and no it won't. Okay, we already have the tanginess from the yogurt. And if we add the lemon juice, it will be too acidic and we will kill the flavor of the feta. We will kill it dead. So zest only, please. 
And that's it. This is now ready to whip, which I'm going to do with this electric hand mixer. Although if you're not into modern conveniences, you can whip this up by hand with a whisk. I mean, you are after all the marquee de sod of whether to go old school or mod. But as long as you whip this until it's nice and light and fluffy, it really doesn't matter. And that's it. Other than giving this a taste or three, it is ready to use. And we can simply pop that in the fridge until our chicken's grilled. But before I show you that, let me make a suggestion. Since we're going to have a grill full of hot coals, before we do our chicken, why not fire roast some onions and peppers to serve with it? So that's exactly what I did. And when I quartered those red onions, I made sure to cut through the root so they'd stay together. And do not worry about the black on the outer layers. All right, we'll peel that first layer off. And we'll be left with just that sweet, smoky, tender onion underneath. And then for the peppers, I just like to roast them whole. And then once those cool, we can peel off the skin and slice them up. But whether you grill anything else or not, we're going to want to prep a very, very hot grill. All right, the hotter, the better. And we'll go ahead and place down our marinated chicken. And my basic game plan with these is to cook them for about four minutes per side, at which point I just like to start turning and tossing them until I'm happy with how they look and they are just cooked through. And again, we want a really, really hot fire. All right, white hot is a thing and red hot is a thing, but there's no such thing as black hot. So make sure your coals have turned mostly white and you can only hold your hand over them for a few seconds before you have to pull it away. And of course, as usual, whenever we grill over coals, we're going to have some spots that are hotter than others. So don't be afraid to rearrange and reposition. And no, you do not need a nice, fancy, expensive grill to get good results. All right, this one cost $18. And I don't want to give the name of the store, but it rhymes with Malwart. But it still did an amazing job of cooking this chicken. So if you don't have a grill, the next time you're out buying a 24-pack of socks, maybe pick one of these bad boys up. But anyway, like I said, I went ahead and grilled that for about four minutes per side, at which point I just started tossing and a turning, moving and a mixing, until I thought they were perfectly done, which for me is when they stop feeling mushy and they spring back to the touch. Or of course you can play it safe and use a thermometer and cook those at whatever temperature you're okay with, which for me would be about 150. And that's it, we'll head back inside where we will let our chicken rest for just a couple minutes while we prep our serving platter with our whip feta, which I'm going to spread out to make a beautiful base. And yes, in case you're wondering, this platter, quote unquote, is actually a leftover piece of tile from our kitchen. So yes, Michelle and I are literally going to be eating off the floor. And if you like this idea, but you don't have leftover tile, just go to a tile store and check out the remnants and the samples, and you actually could find some very cool stuff. But anyway, we'll go ahead and spread out our whip feta, and then we will top and or surround that with our grilled vegetables. And once that was set, I went ahead and placed over my chicken, which because I have eight beautifully brown pieces, instead of just four beautifully brown pieces, according to my calculations, looks twice as nice. And of course, please drizzle over those accumulated juices. And if you don't, I'm going to hear about it. And then remembering I'm trying to pass this off as Greek, I went ahead and drizzled this very generously with olive oil. And then speaking of olive, I also decided to garnish with some beautiful green Greek olives, which I get from Italy. And after arranging those a little too precisely, I went ahead and finished up with some freshly chopped herbs in the form of Italian parsley and mint. And that's it, my grilled Greek chicken breasts with whipped feta was ready to enjoy. And that, my friends, for boneless, skinless chicken breast, which is just about the least exciting thing I can think to eat, was absolutely spectacular. Right, that very, very simple oil and vinegar marinade just works so perfectly here. And anything, and I mean that literally, would taste amazing with this whipped feta, which has a perfect balance of tanginess and saltiness and savoriness with that little bit of hint of garlic and mint and lemon in the background. All right, just an absolutely perfect pairing, especially with a piece of that roasted smoky pepper and eventually that fire-roasted onion. And above and beyond the amazing flavor, what I like so much about this specific marinade, even if you happen to overcook your chicken a little bit, it is actually going to stay moist and tender. Unless, of course, you really overcook it. In which case, it will be dry. Okay, it's not a magic marinade. Like that one in Harry Potter. Or at least I assume there was one in Harry Potter. 
expert. I've never read the books or seen the movies. But anyway, the point is you do not have to grill these perfectly. All right, just get them close. That's all we ever ask. And no, we're not going to have our guests eat off the platter. Okay, people can go ahead and scoop up a piece of chicken, along with plenty of that whipped feta. And if you're thinking that sounds great, but aren't we going to leave some of that stuff on the platter? Well, yes, a little bit. But that's very easy to clean up. Using some nice pita bread you warmed on the grill. Oh yes, when you're done, that's going to clean it up real good. And no, you don't have to do the platter presentation. You can if you want to do the exact same thing on a smaller scale on a plate. Which I think also looks fantastic. But either way, I really do believe this is the best way to cook boneless, skinless chicken breasts. And if you're like me, that whipped feta is going to be your new favorite thing to eat. So for all those reasons and more, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Today I'm going to show you spaghetti aglio olia, which is the most popular pasta dish in Italy by far. And all spaghetti aglio olia means is spaghetti with garlic and oil. So we're going to start by slicing thin six cloves of garlic. Now we're not mincing, we're not chopping, we want to slice it just like that. Very specific cut for this dish. And there's my prepped garlic. I'm also going to chop about a quarter cup of fresh Italian parsley. And then the other ingredients are really good olive oil and a really good Reggiano Parmesan, the real stuff. We're going to add our olive oil and our garlic to a cold saute pan. Turn the heat to medium and we're going to slowly toast that garlic. Now the beauty of this dish is while the garlic's toasting, we're going to cook the pasta. The sauce and the pasta take about the same amount of time. So make sure you're doing these two things right next to each other. So our pasta is boiling. Our garlic is in the pan. As soon as it starts to bubble, turn the heat down to medium low. And then we're just going to watch this slowly toast. Okay, don't walk away. This is only going to take about five minutes. The garlic should just be barely bubbling like that. And we want to slowly, slowly toast that to a beautiful golden brown. So basically what we're trying to do is infuse as much of that toasted garlic flavor into the olive oil without getting it too dark or bitter. See that? That's just about where you want to be, okay? As soon as that gets to that stage, we're going to quickly turn off the heat and add a half a ladle, about a half a cup of our boiling pasta water. And even though we turned off the heat, you need that water in there to stop the browning process because that's perfect right there. And by now our pasta is cooked. And we're going to drain our spaghetti. We're not going to rinse our spaghetti. Do not rinse your spaghetti. Never rinse your spaghetti. Please do not rinse your spaghetti. All right, we're going to dump that into our pasta bowl. We're going to add some black pepper, red pepper flakes, and salt to taste. At that point, we're going to pour over that unbelievable garlic oil. If you could smell this, you'd be like, man, that smells good. Or something to that effect. And there you can see all our slices of garlic. So while there's a ton of garlic in this, it's actually pretty mild because of how we slowly toasted that in the oil, okay? So don't be afraid. All right, we're going to dump over about two-thirds of the cheese. Of course, all the amounts will be on food wishes, as always. We're going to dump over our Italian parsley, and then we're going to toss and serve. So after it's all mixed up really well, I'm going to bring it to the table, topped with the rest of the cheese, and that's it. Classic, or at least what I think is classic, spaghetti Aliolia, spaghetti with garlic and oil. Ironically, had I shot this video before I got the cold that caused the laryngitis, I wouldn't have the laryngitis. Because as you know, garlic is like a superfood that prevents almost everything. So not only does this taste fantastic, it's just really, really good for you, body, mind, and spirit. So I hope you give this a try. Once again, I apologize for the voice, but like I said, the show must go on. All the ingredients are on the site, so go check it out. And as always, enjoy. Greek tomato feta fritters. That's right, I'm going to show you my take on tomato keftetes, which is exactly how you're supposed to pronounce it. Well, actually, I'm not really sure. I mean, I did watch some videos to learn how to say it right, and I heard five different people say it six different ways. But anyway, these are incredibly delicious, not to mention versatile and inexpensive, and I think just an absolutely perfect summertime appetizer. And to get started, the first thing we'll do is prep some beautiful vine-ripened tomatoes. Well, at least some of these are. Okay, it's still kind of early in the season, but I did grow these sun gold tomatoes and a couple small romas, and then I hedged my bets with a few from the store. And if you're using cherry tomatoes, we can go ahead and cut those in quarters if they're small. 
And then for larger tomatoes, romas or otherwise, I just like to cut them in half and then in like quarter inch thick slices. And once those are halved and sliced, we can go ahead and turn them and cut them across like this. And then I really hope you have a bench scraper because once these are cut, I'm gonna go ahead and transfer them into this measuring cup and I wanna to try to get as much juice off the cutting board as I can. But anyway, the point is we're gonna dice up a couple cups of the sweetest, best vine ripened tomatoes we can find. And then to that, we will add some sliced green onion or whatever kind of onion you're into. And no, it doesn't have to just be one kind. And then for our last vegetable addition, we'll go ahead and grate in about half a medium zucchini. Oh, and be careful when you get down to the end. All right, don't be a hero trying to get every last speck of that zucchini. Because nobody, and I mean nobody, wants a piece of your knuckle in their fritter. And that's it. Once we have our veggies prepped, we need to add a generous amount of kosher salt, as well as a little bit of sugar, some freshly ground black pepper, and a few shakes of cayenne just to stay in shape. And then we'll also at this point add some dried oregano. Okay, we are going to add lots of fresh herbs to this, but we'll toss that dry oregano in now so it starts to hydrate. And that's it. We'll give that a proper spooning. And then once that is mixed, what we'll do is just let that sit for 15 minutes, which is going to give that salt and sugar time to draw out those delicious liquids from the vegetables, which not only improves the flavor, but it's also going to create moisture, which is going to combine with the flour to make the batter. And after sitting for 15 minutes, we'll go ahead and give that a stir. And you can see here at the bottom how much liquid has been drawn out. So that's looking good, which means we can go ahead and toss in our freshly chopped herbs. And I'm going to do some Italian parsley, some mint, and some basil. And if you wanted, you could also add some dill, which a lot of people do like. So use what you want. I mean, you are, after all, the John Ritter of this Greek fritter. And you don't have to enjoy the same herb threesome I did. And then next up, we'll go ahead and add about three ounces of feta cheese. Preferably Greek feta, since that just makes a lot of sense here. But any kind of feta would work. As long as it's tasty and dry enough to crumble like this. All right, some fetas are really soft and sticky, and those are gonna be a lot harder to work with. And that's it, once this has been cheesed, we'll go ahead and take a spoon and give it a quick mix before we add our final two ingredients, which could actually just be one ingredient if you wanted. Since once this is mixed, we'll go ahead and dump in some all-purpose flour, plus some baking powder. And of course, if you have self-rising flour, which already has baking powder in it, you could just add that and be done. But either way, once that's in, we'll take a spoon and give this a final mix. And hopefully this batter ends up with a perfect consistency. But if it doesn't, we'll simply adjust. Okay, if it seems too dry and thick, we'll give it a little water. And of course, if it seems too wet and loose, we'll add some flour. But for once, the stars were aligned, and this actually came out to the exact thickness I was going for, which is something still relatively loose, but it will still sit up and hold its shape on a spoon. And that's it. We could, if we want, cook this right away. But I do think it comes out better if we wrap it up and pop it in the fridge for about a half hour. And yes, you can go longer, even overnight if you want to. But whether you let your batter rest or not, we'll go ahead and fry this up in 350 degree oil, which could be in a deep fryer. But if you don't have one, we can just shallow fry it in about an inch of oil that we will get up to temperature over medium high heat. And it can be hard when we shallow fry to get an accurate temperature, which is why one of these laser thermometers is so useful and your cat will love it too. And once that oil is up to 350, we'll go ahead and carefully transfer in a nice heaping tablespoon of our batter, and we can use a second spoon to help push it off. And because we are shallow frying, if one seems to be sticking up a little high, we can give that a little press. Oh, and I should mention, if you did leave this batter in the fridge longer than a half hour, like a few hours or overnight, those vegetables will release more water, and you might have to tighten it up with a little more flour. So some to pay attention to. And that's it, we'll go ahead and fry these for a couple minutes per side, or until beautifully browned and hopefully cooked through. And once those are placed in, I like to reduce the heat to medium so that oil doesn't get too hot. But of course, that's something you can monitor with your laser or just regular probe thermometer. But I do like to back the heat down a little bit once these are frying. And after two minutes, we'll go ahead and flip those over. And let me give you a great tip here. Don't burn yourself, which is why I like to have a fork in my other hand in case I need to help soften the landing. And that's it. Once those are flipped over, we'll give that other side about two minutes, at which point I do what you're supposed to never do. Flip them back over. 
I know you're not supposed to. I just admitted that. But just like the twice cooked french fry, I always feel by flipping it back over, maybe that surface gets a little more crispy. I don't know and I can't prove it, but I did give those one more flip for about 30 seconds. And by the way, I do not buy they're going to absorb a whole bunch of oil if you do this. All right, these things have a ton of moisture in them, and moisture and oil do not get along. Okay, they repel each other. So if these were a lot starchier, maybe, but with a batter this wet, I really don't think it's going to be a big problem. But anyway, that extra flip is optional. And once those had cooked at least a couple minutes on each side, I went ahead and fished them out. And please take a good look at the color now, because once I get them on that white towel, on that white plate, and I move those to my countertop, thanks to the auto brightness on my camera, the edges are going to look kind of burnt, which they really weren't, not that much. And you're probably thinking, who cares what they look like? What do they sound like? Well, they sound nice and crispy. Oh yeah, fork don't lie. So those sounded right, and I moved on to the tasting, which you could do as is, but they're also really good with some freshly squeezed lemon, or as you'll see in a few minutes, any kind of yogurt sauce. But anyway, I squeezed down a little bit of lemon and went in for a bite. And that, my friends, was just tremendous. And appearances notwithstanding, they had the perfect texture, which is crispy on the outside, but still soft and moist on the inside. But not soft and moist from undercooked batter. That would not be good, and you would taste that pasty raw flour. But they stay soft and moist on the inside, thanks to our feta and tomatoes and zucchini. Oh, and while these really are good warm, I think I like them even better at room temp. So I went ahead and snacked on a couple of those, and then I cooked up a few more and plated those up properly. And by properly, I mean served with a nice yogurt sauce, which was nothing more than yogurt, lemon juice, and some raw garlic. Oh, and of course a shake of cayenne. Oh, and it might be useful to know for future reference that this is pretty much the exact same recipe for any kind of vegetable fritter. All right, as long as it's something that's going to be edible with just a couple minutes of frying, it will absolutely work inside these. So if it's something like a green bean or like broccoli or something that's going to be too hard, that won't cook in that shorter time, just simply blanch them first until they're just about tender and then dice them up and proceed as shown. So you really can get kind of creative here, as well as obviously switching out the seasonings and the spices and of course the cheese, although it really is hard to beat feta. And right here, I'll give you one more close-up look at that inside texture, which again is quite moist. And the combo of that sweet, juicy tomato, along with that salty, funky, tangy feta, is just absolute fried fritter perfection. Fritter perfection. Fritter perfection. Which is really hard to say. And I thought the motto catheres was hard. But anyway, I'm not paid to pronounce things right. I'm paid to teach you to cook things like this, which I might have just done. Which is why I'll finish up by saying... I really do hope you give these a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Italian white bean and sausage stew. That's right, every once in a while there comes along a soup that is so comforting, so substantial, and so satisfying that it becomes known as a stew. And while it is true the rules and regulations for whether to name something a stew or a soup are pretty casual and vague, the point is this soup, as the old commercial goes, eats like a meal. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And what we'll want to do the night before we're going to make this is soak some dry cannellini beans overnight in a whole bunch of cold fresh water. And this is what mine looked like the next morning. And of course we could make this with a couple cans of beans, but this takes almost no effort. And not only do these come out better, but they are way, way, way less expensive to use, which is nice when you're saving up to buy $15 face masks. But anyway, once our beans are set, we can move on to erasing the casing on some Italian sausage. And to do that, all we have to do is make one cut down the center, and then we'll simply peel that casing off. So I did that to all four. And if you need someone to tell you, you can use any sausage you want. I just did. But a nice sweet Italian sausage containing lots of garlic and fennel is a great choice. And then what we'll do is go ahead and transfer those into a dry soup pot that we've set over medium high heat. And we'll go ahead and brown that sausage up while at the same time breaking it up into some nice small pieces. And of course, exactly how small is gonna be up to you. But something that fits comfortably on a spoon would be a pretty good approach. And by using a dry pan here, some of those meat juices are gonna to stick to and start caramelizing on the bottom, creating what we call in the business a fond. 
F-O-N-D. And that's going to add some beautiful color to our stew and also an extra level of flavor. But anyway, once our sausage has been broken up and we've started to form a decent fond on the bottom, we'll go ahead and toss in some diced onion and we'll cook that stirring for about five minutes or until the onions start to soften and turn translucent. And even though we haven't added any oil yet, just enough fat should have rendered out of that sausage to coat and cook these onions beautifully. Oh, and if you want, you can add some garlic here, but my sausage was pretty garlicky, so I didn't. But anyway, like I said, we'll cook those onions for about five minutes. And as we do, that caramelized fond at the bottom of the pan is gonna get nicer and nicer. And then what we'll do to release all that goodness is once we think our onions have gone long enough, is we'll go ahead and splash in some white wine, which is gonna deglaze all that caramelization off the bottom. And if you don't have wine around, you can just dilute some wine vinegar with a little water and use that. Or if times are really tough, you can just use a splash of water. So we'll go ahead and stir in that wine. And we can also at this time toss in some freshly ground black pepper, a nice big pinch of red chili flakes, and one bay leaf, which is pretty much mandatory for any bean dish. And at this point, we will also add somewhere between six and eight cups of water. And the reason I say six to eight is because that's gonna depend on how thick you want this. And yes, of course, we can always adjust later and add more. And in case you're keeping score at home, I added about seven and a half. But anyway, we'll stir that in and then do two things. We'll go ahead and add our soaked beans, which of course we've drained. And we will also crank our heat up to high because we want to bring this up to a boil. And as this starts to bubble, you're going to notice a foam come to the top, which a lot of people insist you skim off. And sometimes I do, but I usually don't, since I'm pretty sure those are just proteins foaming up. But one thing we do have to do once it starts boiling is reduce our heat down to medium low, at which point we'll simply simmer this for about an hour or so or until our beans are tender. And then what I like to do at about the 30 minute mark is go ahead and add our salt. And there's different schools of thought when it comes to salting beans while they cook. Okay, some people say don't do it until the end because they believe it makes the beans tough. Whereas other people add it right at the beginning and don't believe it makes a difference and think those other people are crazy. And then there's people like me who split the difference and add the salt about halfway through, which I've always found works out nicely. And that's it, once my beans were salted, I continued cooking on for another 30 minutes or so, or until my beans were perfectly tender. And how I knew for sure is I gave them a taste. All right, there's no guessing in the kitchen. So make sure you give them a try. And if they are tender, what I like to do at this point is take a potato masher and smash about 20 to 25% of the beans, which is gonna give our stew just a little bit of a creamier texture. Okay, so that's optional, but I do recommend it. But regardless of whether you do that or not, once our beans are tender, we will add the last major ingredient, three or four nice big handfuls of some chopped greens, which in my case was some dino kale, but Swiss chard would also work beautifully, or something like mustard greens, or even some stinging nettles if you can find them. And what we'll do is stir those in and raise our heat to medium, and then simply cook this until our greens are tender, which for me was about 15 minutes or so. And of course, that's gonna depend on exactly which green you used. All right, if you went with something tender like spinach, that's only gonna take a couple minutes. So you will have to figure that out. I mean, you are after all the Mr. Green genes of your sausage, beans, and greens, but you'll know because you'll be tasting and checking along the way. And at some point you'll say to yourself, you know what, these greens are tender. And then once they are, we only have one thing left to do, and that is make sure we taste this and see if it has enough salt, which it almost never does. And if it needs more, of course, we will adjust. And that's it, once we're happy with how it's looking, tasting, and feeling, We'll go ahead and find an appropriately sized and shaped bowl, and we will serve that up piping hot. Oh, and one major thing that's missing in this shot, a big old hunk of crusty Italian bread, or right, preferably that you baked yourself. That really does complete this whole experience. And then to finish this, I like to drizzle over some extra virgin olive oil, which is optional, but also mandatory. And I would say the same thing about a little grating of Parmigiano Reggiano, or in my case, Pecorino. And then last but not least, a few more chili flakes, just to stay in shape. And that's it, our Italian white bean and sausage soup, which is so good we're calling a stew, is done. So let me go ahead and grab a spoon and stir in that cheese, and then dig in. And that, my friends, is just one of the greatest and most delicious ways to eat beans ever invented. Okay, this is the kind of food that warms you from the inside out. And while it's very rich and satisfying and borderline decadent, and certainly not low calorie. It is also incredibly nutritious, and I think safe to say very good for you, both physically and mentally. Whoops, sorry, hold on, I gotta clean this drip. 
I have this thing about drips on the rim of a bowl, which I can't explain, but it's pretty serious. But anyway, to summarize, just a magnificent bowl of food. My only complaint was something I mentioned earlier. Okay, while my right hand was extremely happy spooning this stuff into my face, my left hand was like, why am I not holding a piece of bread? Who do I talk to about this? But whether you're dunking bread in this or not, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy my big fat Greek baked beans. That's right, if people ask me who makes the best baked beans, I might have said someone in Boston, or maybe some barbecue joint in Texas. But ever since I discovered this very hearty, incredibly delicious giant bean casserole, my answer now is Greece. And by the way, the big and fat in this recipe's name just doesn't refer to the size of the beans. Okay, the flavors in this dish are also very gigantic. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by adding one pound of gigante beans to this bowl, or gigante beans. And as anyone that follows San Francisco baseball knows, that means giants. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm not actually using true gigante beans. I'm using something called a Corona bean, which is very close in size. And we'll give some more info about that in the blog post. But bottom line, we're going to use the largest dry bean we can find. And what we'll do is cover those with water and let them soak overnight. Which I was doing very late in the evening. Which explains the terrible lighting. And by the way, make sure you use plenty of water. Otherwise, this is what's going to happen. Okay, the next morning mine looked like this. And I had half my beans still in water and half out. Which might cause uneven cooking. So use plenty. But anyway, what we'll do once our beans are soaked is go ahead and drain those. And we'll add them to this pot with a whole bunch of cold fresh water. Along with nothing else except two bay leaves. And we will bring that up to a boil over high heat. At which point we will give it a stir, reduce our heat to medium. And we'll simmer this until these beans are just tender but not soft. Which is going to take, I'll guess, between 45 and 60 minutes. Okay, it really depends on the bean and the size. And then here's the deal. If we cook these all the way, the dish will still work perfectly well. Except once baked, the beans might start to fall apart a little bit. But on the other hand, if we undercook the beans, and they're not tender enough, because of all the stuff we're going to cook these with, they will take a really, really long time to get soft when we bake them. If they actually even get soft. And that's another point we're going to review in the post. Since I attempted a little bit of an experiment to cook these a little less than I usually do. Which was almost a problem. But anyway, the point is we're going to simmer these until they're just tender but not too soft. At which point we will drain those very well, add them to our casserole dish, and begin adding all the rest of the ingredients. Starting with some diced red onion, followed by a whole bunch of sliced or minced garlic. And then we're going to need some tomato. And I'll be going with tomato sauce and tomato paste. And by the way, some recipes call for fresh chopped tomatoes, so use those if you want. I mean, you are after all the Play-Doh of your tomato. And you know my philosophy, use whatever you think will work best. And then after the tomato, we'll go ahead and add some honey, which ideally would be Greek pine honey, which we might not be able to get. And if you can't, just use clover honey, which is what I'm using here. And then after the honey, we're going to add a whole bunch of freshly chopped dill. And by the way, if you ever have the winter blues, or any other kind of blues, buy yourself a bunch of fresh dill and just stick your face in it and smell it. And its fresh, bright green smell will actually make you feel better. All right, nobody knows why, but it totally works. But anyway, let's continue on with some olive oil, as well as some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, and a generous touch of cayenne pepper. And then we will finish this up with a little bit of red wine vinegar. And last but not least, a little bit of water. Which doesn't look like water, it looks like chicken stock. And that's because I rinsed out the measuring cup I had my tomatoes in, so as not to waste. And that's it, we'll take a spoon and give this a very thorough mixing. Which should take you a few minutes, because we have a lot of different ingredients. With different shapes and sizes and viscosities. So get in there and get in there deep. And keep stirring until you think everything's very well distributed. And then what we'll do is transfer this onto a lined baking sheet because there's definitely going to be a little bit of splattering, plus possible bubble overs. And that's it, it's now ready to transfer into the center of a 350 degree oven for about an hour or so, or until bubbling, beautifully caramelized, and of course until our beans are nice and soft. And if everything goes according to plan, it should look a little something like this. But as gorgeous as that is, we cannot tell just by looking. So make sure you test your beans for softness. 
And if they have cooked enough, what we're going to want to do is stir all this together. Okay, because a lot of that olive oil is going to be floating on top, we want to mix that back in. Along with, of course, all that caramelized goodness. So we'll go ahead and stir all that together. And I'll go ahead and steal one more little taste on my way to grab some feta cheese. Since I'm going to crumble a generous amount of that on the top to garnish. And of course, because this is a Greek recipe, we are required to drizzle over a little more olive oil. And then we'll go ahead and finish up with a little more of our fresh and fragrant dill. And that's it. I don't care where you're from. That, my friends, is a beautiful dish of beans. And even though this was way too hot to actually appreciate, I went in for a taste anyway. But despite being too hot, it was still amazing. And the funny thing is, even though this is from half a world away, there are so many similarities to the kind of baked beans we would serve with barbecue here in America. All right, we have a lot of the same similar sweet and sour and savory and aromatic flavors happening. Plus, when you factor in that beautifully briny, subtly funky feta, it really does amplify all that other goodness. And this really would be magnificent with any kind of roasted meats. But I didn't have any of that stuff, so I just put some in a bowl and topped it with a whole chunk of feta as a meat substitute. And again, we'll finish with a little olive oil and dill. And I've never claimed I could survive on a vegetarian diet, but if I had to, this would definitely be in the regular rotation. Oh, and by the way, the shortcut to this recipe is just drain some canned beans and do all the same thing and just bake it till it looks good. So something to keep in mind if you're short on time. But anyway, that's it. What I'm calling my big fat Greek baked beans. Ever since that movie came out, people have been using that expression in the recipe name whether it made sense or not. I mean, come on, you can't call something my big fat Greek kale salad. But at least this time, thanks to our big beans, the name fits. But anyway, no matter what you call it, it is easy, it is beautiful, and it is extremely delicious. Which is why I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy almond biscotti. That's right, as you may have heard, winter is coming. And while we don't have to worry about White Walkers, we do have to deal with something just as scary and even more ravenous. And that would be our friends and relatives showing up at our holiday gatherings. So with entertaining season right around the corner, this would be a perfect cookie recipe to master. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And first up, we'll put together our dry ingredients, which will be some white all-purpose flour. And to that, we'll add some baking powder, not to be confused with baking soda. We want baking powder here. And then we'll also, of course, need a little touch of salt. And that is going to be it. And then we'll go ahead and grab our whisk and give this a mix for about a minute or so to make sure everything's nicely combined. And then once that's been accomplished, we can go ahead and set that aside and move on to the wet ingredients. And that's going to begin with some unsalted butter that ideally is at room temp. And to that, we'll add a little touch of white sugar, as well as my one and only secret ingredient, some olive oil. And then what we'll want to do is grab a spoon or a spatula and cream that sugar into the butter and oil. And as usual, my butter wasn't quite room temp. It was a little cooler than that, and therefore stiffer. So this did take me an extra minute or two to get started. But once that softens up, it should come together nicely. And we'll simply continue smushing and smearing. Until, as we say in the business, we've creamed the sugar and the butter together. And you'll know when you've gone far enough. Because it will lighten up in color and get nice and creamy. And look something like this. And once that's set, we'll go ahead and stop and add the first of two eggs. And once that's been added, we'll continue with the spoon, sort of mixing that in. And yes, this is a little easier if you beat the egg first, but not so much that I actually want to do it. And speaking of easier, almost every recipe calls for using an electric mixer for this. But I have a theory that all Italian cookies come out better if you make them by hand. And like almost all my theories, I can't prove it, but I still believe it. So we'll go ahead and mix that first egg in with a spoon, at which point we're going to stop and switch to a whisk. And then we'll add the second egg, along with whatever flavorings we're going to use. And for me, that's going to be a little bit of vanilla extract, the pure and the real, as well as a spoon of almond extract. And then we'll go ahead and take our whisk and mix all that together until beautifully combined. And by the way, some people like to add lemon or orange zest at this point, but personally I don't. But if you want to, feel free. You are, after all, the John Gotti of your biscotti. And as the boss of this operation, you can add whatever you want. But anyway, regardless of what we add, we'll go ahead and mix that smooth with our whisk, at which point we'll stop and toss in our dry ingredients, and we'll switch back to the wooden spoon. And we will stir this together until just combined. 
Okay, just until the flour disappears. And by the way, if you're one of these people that lives in constant fear of overmixing doughs, you can totally relax here. There really is no way to screw this up. So we will simply mix this until we can't see any more flour, at which point we're going to stop and toss in our almonds, which I like to do in two forms. I'm going to add some whole roasted almonds, as well as an equal amount of roughly chopped almonds. And to me, I think that provides the best combination of texture and appearance. But you certainly could use all one or the other. And at this point, we'll give it one last mix with our spoon until we think those almonds are mixed in nice and evenly. Oh, and one more thing I should mention, I'm doing a fairly classic version here. But if you want to do this with other kinds of nuts, or maybe some dried fruit, this technique is pretty much going to work just the same. But anyway, we'll go ahead and mix in whatever we're using. And that is going to be it for this very simple dough. Which if you had to, you could form into loaves, but it's really hard to work with because it's so sticky. So what I like to do is clean up the bowl, and then cover this in plastic, and then pop it in the fridge for about 30 minutes or so, or until it firms up. And that really is going to make it way, way easier to work with. So that's exactly what I did. And then once it's chilled, we'll go ahead and remove the plastic, and then divide the dough in half. And then to shape it, I'm going to go ahead and transfer it onto some plastic wrap. Okay, some people like to shape it on a floured board, but I think this is a little easier and less messy. Plus, maybe I don't want any more flour in my dough. So I'm going to go ahead and shape that in the plastic as shown until I have something that's about three or four inches wide and maybe an inch and a half or so high. And by the way, just like the fillings, the exact shape is also something you can change up if you want. Or if you want to make this a little more narrow and a little taller, that's totally fine. All right, since we're going to slice and toast the cookies anyway, as long as it's not too flat, really any shape's going to work. And then once we are happy with how it's shaped, we will use the plastic to transfer that onto a line baking sheet. Oh, and fair warning, this stuff will spread out as it bakes, so make sure you got three or four inches space in between. And then once these are panned up, if we want, we can flour our hands and do the final shaping, which I'm pretty sure is totally unnecessary. But as you longtime viewers know, I do like to touch the food as much as possible. So I did give those a little final shaping, whether they needed it or not. And then what we'll do once those are set is go ahead and transfer those into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 30 minutes or so, or until our loaves are lightly golden and look a little something like this. And if you want to check by poking them with a toothpick to see if it comes out clean, go ahead. But I could tell just by looking and feeling that mine had gone long enough. And at this point, what we need to do before we try to cut these is let them cool for about 15 minutes so that these loaves firm up a little bit. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to get nice, clean cuts through our nuts. And nobody, nobody wants a biscotti that doesn't have clean nut cuts. That is very important. So like I said, we'll go ahead and let those cool on the pan for about 15 minutes. At which point, using a serrated knife, we'll cut these at a slight angle into whatever size we want. Okay, somewhere between a half and an inch is probably standard. But again, like so many things in this operation, that's going to be up to you. So I went ahead and sliced that up, as I mentioned at a little bit of an angle, to give it that classic biscotti look. By the way, is it biscotti or biscotti? I'm sure someone will let me know in the comment section. And as promised, we got beautiful, beautiful clean cuts. And once cut, we'll go ahead and transfer those back onto our sheet pan for the final baking. And sure, if you want, you could toss those end pieces on, but I didn't. Because I didn't want to crowd the pan, plus I wanted to eat them. And then what we'll do once our cookies are panned up and evenly spaced is reduce our oven to 325 and we'll pop those back in for about 12 minutes or so, at which point we're going to pull them out and flip them. And while you can use tongs, I do suggest using your fingers since it's a great way to build up calluses. So we'll go ahead and turn over each one, at which point we'll put those back in our 325 degree oven for, I'm going to say, about 20 minutes or so. But that's a wild guess. Because what you really want to do is bake those until they're exactly how you want. Okay, some people like these very light. Other people like them dark brown. But I like to go somewhere in the middle and bake mine until they're a gorgeous golden, which is what I have right here. Okay, so I don't like them too dark. But I do want them crunchy all the way through. So for me, these were just about perfect. And at this point, I have some horrible news. Right, we have to let these cool completely before we serve them. So at this point, we'll go ahead and transfer those to a rack to cool down. And those are the official instructions. Unofficially, of course, we're going to grab one and eat it warm. 
mostly so I can let you hear that crunch. Oh yeah, that sounds right. And the taste was every bit as impressive. But anyway, we will let the rest cool down to room temp, at which point I will show you the second best way to eat these. And that's by dunking it in a hot cup of coffee. Of course, the best way is to dip it in sweet Italian dessert wine, with Vinsanto being the classic choice. But it was too early to drink. It was only 10 o'clock. And I have a strict rule, no drinking before 11. So I went with the coffee, which is still an amazing combination. And by the way, it's not the avocado toast that's preventing me from buying a house. It's this almond milk I steam for my coffee. This stuff's like $10 a quart. But anyway, that's it. How I do almond biscotti. Like I said, with the holidays coming up, not a bad idea to have a few plates of these around. Not to mention, if you're looking for some kind of edible gift to give away, this really would be a great choice. So for those reasons and more, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Scordalia. That's right, the first time I heard the name Scordalia, I thought for sure that was a Viking princess, but I wasn't even close. It's actually an incredibly delicious Greek garlic dipper spread made with, believe it or not, mashed potatoes. And not only is this a fabulous dip for vegetables and breads and things like that, it's also served as a side dish for things like fried fish and grilled meats. So this stuff's as versatile as it is easy to make. And to get started, I'm gonna go ahead and peel and quarter this giant potato. And while technically you can make this with whatever potato you want, I highly recommend the starchy and absorbent russet potato. And by the way, according to the old school recipes, we're not supposed to peel the potato. We're supposed to cook it whole and then peel it, so it doesn't absorb too much water. Which kind of makes sense, until you consider the fact that most of those recipes also tell you to save some of the boiling potato water to thin your dip out with later. And that's where they lost me. And because of that, I think it's just easier to peel it and quarter it and cook it like this which we will, as usual, do in some very generously salted water. And what we'll want to do here is bring this up to a simmer, and then we'll continue cooking on medium until these are just tender. All right, definitely not falling apart, but very, very tender. And since that's going to take a little while, we should probably multitask by prepping our garlic paste while we wait. And for that, I'm going to take a whole bunch of freshly sliced garlic, like about six cloves, and to that we will add some nice coarse kosher salt at which point we'll go ahead and pulverize this down to a paste. And because of the friction those grains of salt provide, this is actually not gonna take very long using a mortar and pestle, which really is the only proper way to do this. All right, you're never gonna get this down into as fine a paste using like a food processor or blender. So try to use one of these to get it at least this fine. Otherwise, you're gonna have to mince it super, super fine on a cutting board and then use the flat of your knife to crush it down into a paste, which will work, but you're gonna lose a lot of that garlic oil on the board. So to summarize, everybody needs to have this tool in the kitchen. And that's it, once that's set, we'll reserve that until needed, and we'll head back to check our potatoes, which like I said, should be very tender as tested with a knife. And then once we've determined those have been cooked perfectly, we'll go ahead and drain those very well. And then we'll let them sit just like that in the strainer for about five minutes, before we transfer those into some kind of mixing bowl. And then we'll work those over with a potato masher until they're very, very smooth. And yes, if you have a potato ricer, go ahead and use it. But a regular masher works just fine here. Plus, I'm gonna pass all this through a mesh strainer later. Oh, besides breaking down the potatoes, what we're also doing here is releasing a tremendous amount of steam and heat, which is good because I do not wanna cook my crushed garlic, which is what we're gonna add next. And by adding them at this point, they're gonna retain that beautiful raw, sharp garlic flavor, which I think makes this dip so good. All right, some recipes do call for roasted garlic, which is of course mild and sweet, but I don't want mild and sweet. All right, I want something bold and aggressive, you know, like a Viking princess. But anyway, we will mix in our garlic, at which point we'll go ahead and add some acidity in two forms. All right, we'll do the freshly squeezed juice of a half a lemon, plus a couple tablespoons of white wine vinegar. And for the record, some recipes call for all one or the other. Then we'll go ahead and stir and mash that in, at which point we're gonna stop and switch to a whisk which we'll use to incorporate the last major ingredient, and that would be our olive oil. Preferably something on the milder and fruitier side. And of course, extra credit for using something from Greece. And the reason we're gonna use a whisk here and stir this in in like three or four additions is so we get a beautifully smooth and creamy emulsification. All right, this base mixture contains a lot of water, and as you know, oil and water don't like to mix, 
which is why we slowly whisk in olive oil when we make a salad dressing. So sort of the same principle here. So like I said, we'll go ahead and whisk that in in like three additions versus dumping it in all at once. And then once that's set, we'll move on to the always important tasting and adjusting step. And that's going to almost always mean adding some more salt, which will vary, of course, depending on how much you put in your water. And of course, you may want to sneak in a little bit of cayenne. And then we'll give it a mix and give it one last taste. And if you wanted to, you could also add a little bit of herb here. Okay, a little bit of fresh parsley would be fine. Or some chives would also work. And I know some people that swear by a little pinch of dry oregano. So if you want to tweak this a little bit, feel free. I mean, you are after all the Socrates of what goes in these. But personally, I like to keep this fairly straightforward. And I'm just going to garnish with a little bit of fresh oregano later. And that's it. Our scordalia is score done. And we could serve it just like this, which is pretty smooth. But to take this up to the next level and achieve perfect smoothness, I'm going to invest the extra three and a half minutes and pass this through a fine mesh strainer which is going to result in something much more luxurious. And by the way, you people with the potato ricers, stop rolling your eyes. All right, we know you're better. And that's it. Once that's been passed, and we finally understand the true meaning of luxury, we can go ahead and serve that up as a dip or a spread next to some vegetables or any other spreadable or dippable edible things. And for a little extra visual interest, I always like to go around with a spoon like this to sort of create some circular peaks and valleys, into which I'm going to drizzle some olive oil. So definitely an optional step, but it is a proven scientific fact that people love shadows. So I think you should do it. And then I went ahead and finished that up with a little bit of fresh oregano, and my Scordalia was ready to enjoy. And this stuff would be amazing on like a thousand different things, but some fire-roasted baby bell halves worked especially well. And as far as the taste and texture goes, I do kind of like the potato hummus comparison, even though it doesn't have that tahini sesame flavor, but the acidity and the sharpness of the garlic along with that sort of neutral starchy base, really does deliver kind of a similar effect. And by the way, making some little Greek potato dip tacos with fried eggplant ended up being a great idea. And of course, no one sits around thinking, I wish I was eating something on sliced cucumber. But this stuff could change that, as that really was a fantastic combination. And since there's no guest in the room, let me go ahead and double dip. And then I went back and started over with another roasted pepper, which while I was eating that reminded me of that old saying, Man cannot live on vegetables alone. So I decided to finish up by showing you some hot carb on carb action. Oh yeah, raise your hand if you're like me and enjoy the occasional mashed potato sandwich. And even though serving this with vegetables is probably more popular, it really is magnificent on bread. And like I said in the intro, this is also served as a side dish for pieces of fried fish, or maybe grilled meat, or grilled fish. As we've had this with grilled salmon, and it really was incredible. So next time you're planning a cookout, maybe keep this in mind, since it's best enjoyed at room temp, which makes it very user-friendly for a picnic and other similar gatherings. But no matter where you enjoy it, or what you enjoy it with, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Italian flourless chocolate torte. That's right, I'm going to share how I like to make torta caprese, which apparently was invented on the island of Capri. Although I've been there, and I didn't see any of this. But in fairness, I was only there six hours, four of which I spent inside the Blue Grotto. But anyway, if you're looking for something very simple and easy and super sexy to serve to your lover, chocolate lover or otherwise, this is it. And to get started, the first thing we should do is prep an 8-inch cake pan. And by prep, I mean butter generously, and then I also like to cut out and place a round piece of parchment in the bottom. And then once our pan's greased and papered, we'll toss in a little bit of flour. And then we'll sort of rotate and shake and knock the pan around. And that flour will stick to the butter. And this is going to help our cake come out very easily after it's baked. And once that looks good, we can go ahead and knock out the excess. But don't throw it away. Scrape it up and sift it back into your canister. And that's it. Our pan is prepped. And we can move on to our chocolate. And what I have here is six ounces of dark chocolate, which as you can see has been broken up. And then to this we will add some cubed up butter. And we'll grab our spatula and head to the stove, where we have a saucepan of barely simmering water set over low heat. And what we'll do is place our bowl of chocolate and butter on top. And we will simply wait for everything to melt. And once it looks a little something like this, it's not a bad idea to give it a stir, so we can sort of see where we're at. But also stirring butter and chocolate is very enjoyable. 
And yes, you can definitely do this step in the microwave, but you know what? The house was kind of dry. So I decided to multitask. So I melted chocolate while humidifying the air. Oh yeah, it's good for the pores. But anyway, once everything's melted or extremely close to it, we'll go ahead and remove that from the heat and give it one last stir to make sure it's very, very smooth. And if it's looking good, and mine was looking very good, we can go ahead and toss in some unsweetened cocoa powder, along with a nice big pinch of salt, and then two optional ingredients, about a tablespoon of coffee liqueur, plus a very small shake of cayenne, All right, barely a hint, and then we'll finish this up adding one cup of almond meal, also known in some parts as almond flour, and we'll take our spatula and give this a mix. And yes, it probably would have been easier to use a whisk, but you know what, I already dirtied my spatula, and now I'm on a mission to make this entire recipe using just one utensil. But no matter what you use, make sure you keep stirring and keep mixing until everything's been very thoughtfully and very thoroughly combined. And once it is, we can set that aside and we can crack four large eggs into another bowl to which we will add a little touch of white sugar. And then we'll grab our electric hand mixer and we will mix this on high until it's very light and very fluffy and very, very thick. Oh, and pro tip, if you use room temperature eggs, which I did, this mixture will whip up faster and to a higher volume than if you use cold eggs. And yes, you can do this by hand with a whisk, but the bad news is it will take forever. The good news is, though, according to recent made-up studies, if you do it by hand, you'll burn the same number of calories as one portion. But either way, once our mixture is nice and thick and fluffy like this, we'll go ahead and grab our chocolate mixture, and we will transfer that in. And then we'll use our spatula, or in my case, spoonula, to fold that in until it's just combined. And while I do this, let's go ahead and talk about final texture. Since there are basically three ways you can go here. Okay, you can just dump in the chocolate and then whisk it in, not worrying about losing too much air, which will give you a very firm, dense texture. And then the second method, which I'm using here, is to sort of semi-gently fold it in, right, bringing that mixture from the sides and bottom up over the top. And then every once in a while, giving it the occasional stir. And unlike whisking it in, this method will preserve a lot of those air bubbles, which will produce something a little bit lighter. And that's the texture I enjoy most for this. And then the third method, which would be the lightest version, would be to actually separate the eggs and just whisk in the yolks and then beat the whites into a meringue and fold those in very gently. But for me, all that extra work to get just a little bit of extra lightness really is not worth it. So I'm definitely a fold and stir guy. But no matter which method you use, once that chocolate mixture has been incorporated, we can go ahead and transfer everything into our prepared pan. Oh, and if you can, try to get it all in the pan and not on the table. I mean, come on, that pan is a pretty big target. And I have no idea why I was trying to transfer it in from like two feet away. But anyway, once that's been transferred in, we'll go ahead and give that the old tapa tapa just to bring those few larger bubbles up to the surface, which can cause holes. And that's it, we can now transfer this into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 25 to 30 minutes, or until it looks like this. And this appears to have cooked long enough, but it's a little tricky with flourless cakes to tell by looking or touching. So what we'll do is test with a wooden skewer near the center, which won't come out completely clean, but almost clean. Okay, a little chocolate smudge is fine, but if it's covered with what looks like raw batter, put it back in. But this was perfect. And if it is, what we'll do is let it cool in the pan for 30 minutes, during which time it's definitely going to sink down a little bit. But that's normal and fine. And at any point while we're waiting, we can take a thin knife and go around the outside, around the outside, around the outside, just to make sure our torte is not sticking to the pan. And then once that has cooled for about 30 minutes, I'm going to place a round piece of parchment on top and then place a plate over that and we will flip that over. And because we professionally prepped the pan, this is going to slide right out with no effort, revealing a perfectly smooth surface. Or what also could happen is it sticks and you have to bang it a few times and it comes out without a perfectly smooth surface. Okay, so both those things can happen and often do. But don't worry, once this cools and firms up, we are probably going to flip it over anyway and serve it with the other side up. But the point is we have options. And that's it. We will simply let this cool completely before serving. 
although I highly recommend this goes in the fridge overnight, since I think the flavor is much better, and also I much prefer serving this chilled. So that's what I did. I went ahead and wrapped it up and popped it in the fridge, and then I pulled it out the next day, and I decided to go ahead and flip this over because I thought this side would look a little better, which it did, except for a few crumbs here and there that flaked off, which like an absolute lunatic, I wadded up and used to plug some holes because I have a serious problem. But anyway, once we fix up whatever needs fixing up, I'm going to go ahead and finish this off by dusting the top with cocoa and a very generous dusting at that. And once that's accomplished, you could just serve it like this, but I'm not going to. I have one more trick up my sleeve. Well, actually two tricks. But the first one is, I'm going to take a couple of ramekins like this, which will allow me to lay this cooling rack right over the surface so that it's almost, but not quite touching the cocoa. Oh, and right here I decided to give it a little turn, so you will see the lines I'm about to make at an angle. And the lines I'm talking about are going to be created by dusting over some powdered sugar. And what's going to happen once we dust the top with this, and then we remove that rack, it's going to leave some beautiful, and I think very provocative lines. And then for one last touch, I'm going to do a little heart design in the center, with six strategically placed raspberries. And yes, I was very upset and annoyed, that my finger hit the powdered sugar and made that mark. So I did what almost no one would do. I grabbed a little bit of powdered sugar on the tip of the knife and I spent about 10 minutes fixing that up. But anyway, that kind of attention to detail will be up to you. I mean, you are after all the cupid of whether or not to be stupid. But for the record, I regret nothing, including what I'm about to say. And that's it. Once we have our heart on the top of the tort, we can go ahead and cut a wedge and serve up. And I garnish with three more raspberries, plus a nice piping of whipped cream. Although I wouldn't say no to a scoop of vanilla ice cream. And then I grabbed a fork and went in for a taste. And that, my friends, I think is the perfect flourless chocolate cake. I mean tort. Really same difference. Okay, flour does have its advantages as far as help creating the structure of a cake and giving us a nice crumb. But what it also does is dilute the chocolate flavor. But here we don't have that problem. Okay, this is pure chocolatey goodness with zero starchy distractions. But because we fairly carefully folded, we did retain a good amount of air bubbles in that batter. So it looks to the contrary. The texture is surprisingly light and not super firm and stodgy. So to summarize, I absolutely loved how this came out. Oh, and for the record, that whipped cream is not sweetened. All right, while it's not super, super sweet, the cake has plenty of sugar. So for me, an unsweetened whipped cream, along with those tart fresh berries, are the perfect things to serve this with. And while I really do love the coffee liqueur in this, you could also use something like amaretto or rum or any flavorful booze of your choice. But no matter what you use, this gorgeous flourless chocolate tour could not be easier. And not only do I think you're going to love it, but I think whoever that special someone you serve it to will as well. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Avgo Lemono Soup. That's right, it was Socrates who said, wisdom begins in wonder. And if you're wondering what that has to do with this video, nothing. But Socrates was Greek, and so is this amazingly delicious lemony chicken rice soup. All right, so let me show you how to put this together. And for step one, we're gonna need some chicken broth. So in my stock pot, I have one big chicken to which we'll add the traditional onions, carrots, and celery, along with a couple bay leaves and a little pinch of dry oregano. And that's it. And we'll go ahead and we'll fill that up with cold water. And by the way, I usually like to use about a three pound chicken and this was like a giant four and a half pound chicken. So I couldn't quite fit the three quarts of water I want you to put in here. But as usual, I'll give you all the accurate amounts on the blog post. And then you know the drill, put it on high heat till it comes to a boil, after which we'll reduce our heat to maintain a nice steady simmer. And like I said, as you can see here, my chicken was way too big. So it is kind of breaking the surface here, but that's not gonna matter. That meat will cook through no problem. And like making any stock or broth, you'll wanna skim any of that scummy foam that comes to the top. And then like I said, we're gonna simmer this gently. You wanna adjust your heat somewhere between low and medium low. And then we'll cook that from anywhere between one and four hours. And that's gonna depend on if you want chicken meat in your soup or not. I do, so I'm gonna go with the shorter cooking time here, but we'll get into that in a minute. 
And while that's happening, we'll move on to an incredibly important step, the diced onions. All right, we want to finely chop up a couple onions. I think we want at least two cups. And what we'll do is we'll place those onions on medium heat with a nice drizzle of olive oil and a big pinch of salt. And we'll want to cook these onions until soft, sweet, and golden. And what we want to end up with is something that looks like this. And if you were to taste a little of this, it would be nice and soft and fairly sweet, which is key here because this is what's going to offset the tartness from the lemon juice. So that's looking good. At that point, you can turn off the heat and reserve until needed. And at this point, we'll go check our chicken. And as I mentioned, the cooking time is going to depend on if you want to use the meat in the soup or not. And one indicator I look for is if I'm able to dislocate the hip joint with my tongs, that tells me I'm ready to proceed. So I cooked mine for about an hour and 15 minutes, basically until it was just cooked through. Now, on the other hand, if you don't want chunks of chicken in your soup, you would cook this for like four hours until it all just completely fell apart and all the flavor from the chicken meat was in the broth. So that is the other method, which again, we'll discuss on the blog. But anyway, at this point, I'm gonna remove that meat to a bowl to cool, along with any of the other solids. By the way, one of these strainers called a spider are incredibly useful for this type of operation. So I'm gonna remove all the solids from the stock, leaving just the broth. And of course, once that meat cools down, we can shred it or chop it or cube it or dice it and put it into the soup at the end. So our broth is ready, our meat is cooling, and we can move on to final production. And all that means is adjusting our heat to medium low. And we'll also at this point transfer our sauteed onions into the pot, along with one of the two things that's gonna slightly thicken this soup, the rice. And not just any rice. Ideally, you're gonna use arborio rice, which is the same rice used for risotto. And only because a thousand people will ask, yes, you can use any rice you want. They just don't work quite as well in my opinion, but that's gonna be your problem. So we'll go ahead and we'll stir that in. And we wanna let that cook stirring occasionally for about 30 to 45 minutes or until it's very, very, very soft and tender. I'm also at this point gonna add a couple teaspoons of salt. Remember, we didn't add any to our original broth. So I think we're gonna need at least that much here, but obviously we're gonna taste and adjust before we serve it. So we'll add some salt. And like I said, we'll let that simmer until very soft. And while we're waiting for that, we might as well go ahead and squeeze our fresh lemon juice. And we're gonna need a lot of it. So I'm gonna squeeze a half cup of fresh lemon juice. If you're not gonna use fresh lemon juice for this, don't even bother making the recipe. And if you can, when you're doing yours, try to do it so some of the juice actually goes into the cup. So half cup of fresh lemon juice. And at this point, we'll go back over and check our rice, which for me at this point was simmering for about 40 minutes. Okay, personally, I like to go until those grains of rice are kind of falling apart. And as you can see, the starch from the rice is gonna kind of thicken that broth slightly. And I should mention, if you do want it a little starchier, you can actually blitz this with your immersion blender for a minute and kind of puree some of that rice into the soup. Or, which I like, you can kind of smash some of the grains against the bottom with your ladle or a spoon or a potato masher, something like that. But anyway, like I said, we're gonna cook our rice until very soft. And once our rice is set, we can move on to the final step, the Avgo Lemono. So Avgo Lemono basically means egg and lemon sauce, which at some point in history got turned into a soup. So in a bowl, I have two large eggs, which we'll beat up with a little black pepper and cayenne. And why are those yolks so orange? Is this a special variety? No, it was just bad lighting. So we'll beat those eggs up, at which point we will whisk in our lemon juice. And then what we'll do is we'll take this mixture and whisk it into our hot soup, but not yet. We have to temper the eggs. And all that means is slowly whisking in a couple cups of our hot soup mixture into this bowl so that everything warms up before we add it to the soup pot. So we'll stir in one cup. Once that's in, we'll go ahead and stir in another. And if you feel the side of the bowl, it should be very hot at this point. And once that's been done, then we can safely whisk this into our soup and there'll be no danger of those eggs scrambling. Okay, we're not trying to make egg drop soup here. And once our eggs and lemon are stirred in, we will add our reserved chicken meat if desired. I just cube mine up. And by the way, that's not all of it. I saved about a third of the meat for chicken salad. That's not a bad idea. So we'll stir in our chicken meat. And then all we need to do to finish this soup off is cook it over your lowest heat setting for about five minutes until the chicken's heated through. And that's it. Now, of course, before you serve this, you gotta give it a taste. Does it need more salt? Does it need more lemon? Believe it or not, mine was perfect, so I didn't have to adjust, but you may, so check it out. But anyway, once your soup is exactly how you want it, we will go ahead and ladle that up into some hot bowls. And then if you want, and I do, because I have a food blog, we can garnish with a pinch of parsley. And then I'm gonna do a little bit of freshly grated lemon zest mostly so people don't think they're eating corn chowder. And that Avgo Lemono soup is done. And while it may not be the most stunning soup visually, this thing is like in the top five most delicious soups in the world. The combination of that beautiful fresh chicken broth with the tartness of the lemon and the savoriness from the eggs, just a fantastic combination. 
And by the way, people that send me the emails, wanting something delicious you could serve to a large group that's not really expensive, this is it. A few dollars worth of ingredients here go a long way. In fact, I made a big old pot of this for my last World Cup viewing party. Of course, I had to change the name to I've Go Lemon O Soup, which people seem to enjoy, although they did tell me to please stop doing that. But anyway, that's it. And since we started this video with a quote from Socrates, let's finish with one. He also said, the only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing, which if you think about it is a terrifying thought, which is why the world needs comfort foods like this amazing soup. So I really do hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy green no bean hummus. That's right, we are making this very exciting hummus alternative with one of the least exciting vegetables ever. And we did that by using a trick that pretty much only chefs know. And just so everybody's clear, we're not making this because it's low cal or keto friendly or for most people easier to digest. No, the real reason we're making this is because it tastes really, really good. And this truly is one of my all time favorite dips. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our zucchini. And what I'll do first is go ahead and cut this in quarters. And because this one is so big, after quartering, I'm gonna go ahead and trim out the seeds. Oh, and pro tip, trim the ends of your zucchini before you quarter it. So you can do that once instead of four times. But anyway, if you're using a big old zucchini like this, what we'll need to do is slice down to trim out those seeds because those are kind of fibrous and don't really have any flavor. And the flavor they do have is kind of bitter. So if your zucchini look like this, that's definitely something you're gonna to wanna to do first. And then once we do have those quartered and seeded and possibly trimmed, we'll go ahead and cut them up into about one and a half inch pieces or at least something close. And by the way, if you're using standard zucchini from the grocery store, they're generally much smaller and younger than this, and you probably won't need to take out any seeds. And you could just skip to this part where you're cutting them into chunks. And then once we have those cut up, we'll go ahead and transfer those into a bowl. And in case you're keeping score at home, I cut up three. And then what we'll do is go ahead and sprinkle over two tablespoons of kosher salt, and then we'll toss it with that zucchini very thoroughly. And I know that looks like an insane amount of salt, but don't worry, we're gonna rinse most of it off. And it's this chef's secret that's gonna take care of the three major complaints about zucchini. And that is it's watery, a little bit bitter, and pretty much tasteless. But if we toss it with salt like this, and then let it sit for about 15 or 20 minutes, that's gonna pull a whole bunch of moisture out of the zucchini, which will make it less watery, remove the bitterness, and concentrate those sweet natural flavors. And you don't have to, but about halfway through, I do like to give it another toss, and while this is pretty much done every single time zucchini is used in a restaurant, if that is the chef is any good, this is almost never done in the home kitchen, which really is a shame since it makes such a huge difference. So I let mine sit about 15 minutes, tossing it once halfway through. And right here you're going to get a great look at just how much liquid has been pulled out. And once that's been accomplished, what we'll do is grab a strainer and we will rinse that zucchini really well and then we'll let it drain really well at which point we can transfer that into a bowl and then we'll drizzle over a couple tablespoons of olive oil and then we'll toss that until it's evenly coated. And that's it, once our zucchini's been lubricated, we can transfer that onto a foil lined baking sheet and we'll arrange those pieces as close as we can together while still keeping them in a single layer. And the reason we want everything kind of nice and tight together is because once we're done, we're gonna pop these under the broiler for about five or six minutes or until they're lightly charred and hopefully look like this. And then what we'll do is give these a toss and then rearrange them into that nice tight single layer again. And while we're tossing, if some of the brown spots facing up end up facing down even better, that way the other side can get a little bit of color as well. So we'll pop these back under the broiler for another five or six minutes or until they're just barely tender but not soft, which is exactly what I accomplished here. And then what we'll do is grab our strainer again and we'll go ahead and transfer our broiled zucchini in or grilled zucchini as they call it in England. And then what we'll do is give those a little press and we will simply let those sit there and drain until they've cooled down all the way to room temp. So I let mine sit there for about 45 minutes while I was doing some other stuff. 
And you're probably not going to get too much, but you will notice some more liquid has drained out. And then what we'll do at this point is transfer that into a blender or a container like this if we're going to use a stick blender, and we will add the rest of our ingredients. And since we're trying to call this a hummus, that will definitely include some tahini, which as you probably know is basically a sesame seed butter. And then we are definitely also going to need some raw garlic. And I'm going to go with about three cloves. But everything in here is to taste. And then besides tahini and garlic, the other critical hummus ingredient would be some freshly squeezed lemon juice. And again, this is to taste. So I usually start with a half and then go from there. And then I'm also going to toss in some freshly sliced basil leaves since that is such a perfect herb with zucchini. And then we will season this up with some salt as well as some ground cumin, some freshly ground black pepper, a few shakes of cayenne, of course, since that's good for the blood pressure and the libido. And that's it. We'll finish up with a little bit of olive oil at which point we can blend this as smooth as we want. And I have no way of knowing how smooth you want yours, but I'm gonna to try to get mine pretty smooth and fairly hummus-like in texture. And yes, you can definitely get it smoother in a regular blender, but I am partial to this immersion blender. And as you can see, as long as you blend it for a couple minutes, we can get this relatively smooth. And right here, I determined I'd reached the texture I was going for. So I went ahead and cleaned that off and then gave it a quick taste, just to see if it maybe needed more salt or possibly another squeeze of lemon. But I'm happy to report I thought it was perfect, which means it's ready to wrap and pop in the fridge until it's thoroughly chilled. Okay, you could serve this right away, but it's just not gonna be as good. All right, I think the taste and texture are better cold. So I went ahead and popped that in the fridge for a few hours at which point I transferred some into a serving bowl surrounded by some blue potato chips. I know, pita bread would have been a more classic choice, but man, I really love potato chips, blue or otherwise. And then before we garnish, I like to take a spoon and do sort of a decorative swirl on the top, just to make that surface a little more visually interesting and create some dramatic shadows. And once that was swirled, I drizzled over a little bit of olive oil before finishing up with some chopped pistachios, since they are green and pair perfectly with everything else in this. But if you wanted, you could use some fresh herb or whatever else you want. I mean, you are after all the Teddy Demas of what you think will please us. So as usual, please customize this as you see fit. And that's it, I grabbed a chip and dug in. And that, my friends, truly is shockingly delicious. And the reason it's a shock is because when I say the word delicious, nobody, and I mean nobody, thinks of zucchini. But by using that salting technique and then roasting it under the broiler, we've eliminated all the things people don't like about zucchini and ended up with something super savory with a gorgeous earthy sweetness that marries perfectly with everything else we put in here. And no, it doesn't taste exactly like hummus, but I really do think it's close enough. Okay, it does have a similar flavor profile, but in a much, much lighter delivery system, which on a hot summer day might be exactly what you're in the mood for, especially if those hot summer days include any long car trips, if you know what I'm saying. But as I mentioned in the intro, we are not making this because it's more artsy and less fartsy. We are making this because it's a profoundly delicious dip that even the biggest zucchini haters will have to admit is awesome. Which reminds me, if you do have some zucchini haters coming to the party, don't even tell them this has zucchini in it. Okay, let them eat about half a bowl first, and then tell them. And trust me, they will be shocked and amazed and impressed and possibly annoyed, but mostly impressed. And I should mention, culinarily speaking, this is probably closer to a baba ganoush than a hummus. So if you were going to make that and wanted to take a break from the eggplant, you could certainly follow this recipe and call it zucchini baba ganoush. But anyway, I went with green no bean hummus because I know there's a lot of people that love hummus, but unfortunately the garbanzo beans in hummus do not love them. But no matter what you call this, it's very easy to make, very nutritious, and as I've already mentioned about five times, incredibly delicious, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts 
a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Greek feta and spinach potato casserole. That's right, the feta was Greek. But as far as the rest of the recipe goes, I'm really not sure. Okay, this was definitely inspired by Greek cooking. And if they haven't combined these ingredients together in this way yet, I really think they should, since I absolutely love this, and I'm pretty sure you will as well. And to get started, the first thing we'll do is peel just over two pounds of Yukon Gold potatoes, and then we'll cut them in half and add them to a saucepan. And the reason I said just over two pounds of potatoes is because we need two pounds peeled for the recipe, which means we probably want to buy about two and a quarter pounds. And then once cut, we'll add enough cold fresh water to cover those by about an inch. And then we'll head to the stove where we're gonna place these over medium high heat. And yes, we'll definitely wanna add some salt to the water as usual, since nobody, and I mean nobody, should cook potatoes in unseasoned water. And once our pot is simmering, we can back our heat down to medium low, and we will simmer these for about 15 minutes or so, or until they're just barely tender as tested with the tip of a knife. And while you could slightly undercook these, what we don't necessarily want to do is have these falling apart and absorbing a ton of water. But right here, mine felt just about perfect. So I went ahead and pulled those off the heat, and I drained those very well in a colander. And that's it, we'll simply let those cool down to room temp before we slice them up. And while we're waiting for that to happen, we can move on to our spinach mixture. And now we'll start by transferring half a pound of spinach into a saucepan, which should probably be the one we use for our potatoes that we just rinsed out. And once we transfer the spinach in, we'll turn our heat up to medium high, and then we'll simply toss the spinach in this dry pan until it wilts, which is only gonna take like a minute or two. So do not go anywhere. We need you to work those tongs the whole time, since we wanna catch the spinach right when it wilts, but before it goes too far and gives up all its liquid. So as soon as our spinach looks like this, we're gonna quickly pull it off the heat, and I'm gonna transfer it into this container, where as you'll see, I'm gonna add the rest of the ingredients and then eventually puree everything using an immersion blender. And speaking of the other ingredients, after we add a little splash of water, we're gonna pour in a generous amount of olive oil, right, preferably Greek, but any good olive oil will work. And then we'll also add a couple of peeled garlic cloves, as well as some freshly and thinly sliced green onions. We will also want some freshly grated lemon zest, but not the juice, just the zest which is where most of the lemon flavor comes from. And then we'll season this up with some freshly ground black pepper, as well as some salt. And then we'll finish up with one large egg, plus half of our Greek feta cheese, which we will crumble in. And then we'll save the other half to crumble over the top. And once the feta is in, we will add the last ingredient, the secret ingredient, about a quarter cup of fresh mint leaves, which really does magical things in this. So while you could do this without that, I don't think it's gonna be as good, so find some mint. And you might be thinking at this point, shouldn't you have used a smaller container to make this even more impossible? Well, no, this is fine. And it's the one that came with the blender, and I made this before so I know it works. No, the problem here is not the size of this container. It's that cord bouncing up and down, which I find distracting and disconcerting. So let's change camera angles. And yes, of course, feel free to do this in a regular blender. It does not matter as long as this gets pureed smooth. And that's it. Once blended, we'll simply set this aside. And we will move on to slice our now cooled potatoes into a bowl. Which we could do using a cutting board. But I decided to cut them like my grandma used to cut them. In her hand with a really dull knife. Which the legal department would like me to stress is the key to this whole operation. Do not, under any circumstances, cut potatoes in your hand with a sharp knife. And it'll be easy to tell if your knife was too sharp, because you'll see blood in the bowl. All right, so it's going to be up to you to pick the right knife. I mean, you are, after all, the Charles Darwin of not hearing an ambulance siren. So if you don't have an extremely dull parry knife like this, just go ahead and use a butter knife, or like I said, a real knife on a cutting board. But either way, we'll go ahead and slice those about a quarter of an inch thick. And then we'll go ahead and grab our spinach mixture and dump it in, along with the couple shakes of cayenne I forgot earlier. And we will toss everything with a spatula until it's perfectly and evenly combined. 
And by the way, sliced cooked potatoes love to stick to each other. So make sure all these potato slices are separated and coated with this mixture. And if you happen to break up a few potatoes, don't worry about it. Right, once baked, that won't matter. And that's it once it is mixed. Let's go ahead and transfer that into an olive oil baking dish. And in case you're keeping score at home, this was a one and a half quart size. But anything similar should work nicely. And that's it once we have everything transferred in and distributed evenly. We'll go ahead and finish the top by crumbling over the rest of our feta cheese. And again, not to brag, but mine was from Greece. But as long as it's feta and you can crumble it, it should totally work for this recipe. But in any event, we'll go ahead and crumble that over the top, which for a normal non-filming person should only take a couple seconds. But if you're shooting a video and you're a little bit nutty about this kind of stuff, it might take you about five minutes like it did me to get every single crumble in the perfect spot, even though there's no such thing. And that's it. Once our potato casserole is cheesed, it is ready to transfer into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 35 to 45 minutes or until it's cooked all the way through and that feta on top starts to take on a little bit of color, which hopefully looks like this. Oh yeah, that looks like something I'd like to dig right into. But in general, these kind of casseroles, we usually like to let sit for about 10, 15 minutes before we start digging in. So that's sort of what I did. And for a fancy plated presentation, I'd probably cut squares. But for this first taste, the spoon is fine. But no matter what shape you go with, that, my friends, is just absolutely delicious. All right, I've never really met a potato casserole I didn't like. But this thing is unlike any other version I've ever had. And while it might seem kind of weird to combine spinach and potatoes, it really does work beautifully here. Probably because feta goes with both of those ingredients so well. And actually, the way we're using the spinach here, it almost acts as sort of an herb, especially with that little hint of our secret ingredient mint. So while you can definitely taste the spinach, in this format, it kind of becomes something else. And that subtly herbaceous, vegetal goodness makes for one of the most unique and interesting casseroles you will ever have potato or otherwise. And because of all those things I just said, this would make a fantastic side dish for so many things. Like for example, a pomegranate glazed lamb chop, which no, is not gonna be the next video recipe. Right, this was just a prop chop. So that's the bad news. The good news is, however, I will be filming a lamb chop video for how to broil lamb chops. And I think I'm gonna do those with a sweet and sour tamarind glaze. Okay, we'll see, I'm still working on it. But no matter what you serve this with, if you like potato gratins and potato casseroles and Greek food and things that might be Greek food, then I'm pretty sure you're gonna enjoy this. Which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Tiramusa Semi Fredo. That's right, we're doing a frozen mousse that tastes like tiramisu using this very easy time-tested Italian technique. And while this might seem like more of a warm weather dessert, at the end of the video, I'm gonna make a very compelling argument for why this is the perfect thing to serve after a heavy, rich, holiday special occasion meal. So prepare to be compelled. But first things first, and to get started, the first thing we'll do is separate some eggs which a lot of people are scared to do, and in the business we call that separation anxiety. So to get over that, let me show you a foolproof method. Okay, all we have to do is crack an egg in a bowl, and then simply get in there with a clean hand and get your fingers under the yolk. And as you lift that out, the white is gonna slip between your fingers, leaving that yolk in your hand, which you can then transfer into one bowl, and then transfer the white into another. And I find this a very foolproof method for people that have trouble with the shell to shell method, or the crack it right into your hand method like I usually use. And then what we'll do once we have four eggs separated is go ahead and set aside the whites. Okay, we can just leave those on the counter. And then we'll take our yolks and we will add some kind of dark roast instant coffee. And what you see right here is a dark Italian roast from a certain Seattle-based coffee chain. But any high quality instant dark roast coffee will work. And then to that we will also add a little splash of Marsala wine. And then we will follow that with a little more than a little touch of sugar, which kind of looks like a lot, but it's not, since this recipe is gonna make like 10 portions. And then what we'll do is take a whisk and give this a quick mix, 
just to combine those ingredients before we head to the stove, where we're going to briefly cook these yolks using the most dangerous, most terrifying method ever. And yes, I am exaggerating slightly to build tension, but what we'll do with a towel in one hand and our whisk in the other is cook this mixture stirring over medium low heat until it thickens up a little and is hot to the touch. And yes, this is generally done over gently simmering water, but if you're brave and a little bit crazy, you can do it directly over a pretty low flame and achieve the same results in a much shorter amount of time. Plus, it's way more exciting this way. Oh, and a couple pro tips, first of which is do not catch that towel on fire. And above and beyond the whole towel catching on fire thing, if our heat's too high, we're not going to be able to catch this at the perfect moment, and we'll end up with coffee and Marcella flavored scrambled yolks, which I've never tried, but they don't sound great. Okay, so we'll pretty much whisk constantly over medium-low heat, and we're basically done when we get to what's called the ribbon stage, which means the stuff dripping off our whisk form ribbons on the surface that are visible for about a half second to a second. So at this point, mine was looking pretty good. And just to give you a rough idea, that took me about six or seven minutes. And we'll go ahead and set this aside while we move on to our final two very simple components. The first of which would be whipping up those egg whites. But before we do, let's add a very, very, very tiny pinch of salt. All right, like barely a quarter of a small pinch. And besides a very tiny bit of seasoning, they say that little bit of salt will help the whites whip up a little better. And what we're shooting for here is fairly stiff peaks. All right, we don't want this meringue to get super dry and chunky. But when we're finished and we pull the whisk out of the mixture, those whites should be sitting up pretty high and proud on the end. And hopefully it looks something like this. And that's it, once our whites are done, we can set those aside and we can finish the last component, which is whipping up some ice cold heavy cream. Okay, the colder the cream is, the faster it gets thick. And by the way, if you do your whites first, we can use that same dirty whisk for the cream. But don't do it the other way around, since the fat in the cream will prevent the whites from whipping up into full volume. And yes, of course you can use an electric mixer for these whisking steps, but I think I have a better feel for things if I'm doing it by hand. Plus, according to some recent made-up studies, the amount of calories we burn doing this by hand is exactly the same amount as one dessert. So we got that going for us, which is nice. But anyway, we'll whip our cold cream until we have like medium stiff peaks. And once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and lose the whisk and we'll grab a spatula and our now probably room temp coffee and egg yolk mixture and we'll go ahead and transfer that in. And then using a combination of folding and stirring with the tip, we will mix that until just combined. And if you're confused by recipes that say fold something in, this is what we're talking about. All right, all it means is scraping product from the side and bottom of the bowl up over the top. And as we're doing that, we're turning the bowl and giving it the occasional stir with the tip. That's right, just the tip. And then what we'll do once that coffee and egg mixture just barely disappears and everything's looking light and gorgeous, we'll go ahead and transfer in half our whites and we will fold and stir those in using the exact same technique. And once that first addition of whites has just barely disappeared, we will add the rest and we'll fold those in. And please do not under any circumstances stress about knocking too much air out of this mixture. All right, you're not going to. And even if you did, once this freezes, you're still going to have an amazingly delicious and perfectly textured dessert. In fact, the rougher you are with this and the more air you knock out, the closer to the texture of ice cream you will get. So yes, with this recipe, the worst case scenario is basically coffee flavored ice cream. So hopefully that makes you feel a little bit better. Oh, and some people say it's okay to have some streaks of egg white in there so as not to overmix. I do not agree with these people, or as we call them in the business, streakers. All right, no one's ever been eating a semi-fredo and said, this is good, but I wish there were some streaks of egg whites in it. So I always fold mine until I can't see any more egg whites, at which point it's ready to transfer into whatever we're going to serve this in, which for me will be these little four ounce jam jars, which I think make the perfect portion, and of course come with an airtight screw on lid. But I should mention that traditionally, this would be transferred into a plastic line metal loaf pan, and then frozen, and then cut and served in slices. So if you don't want small individual portions, feel free to do that. I mean, you are after all the Steely Dan of whether to use a Steely Pan. But personally, I do enjoy these small little cube portions. And that's it, once we have that divided up evenly, we'll go ahead and screw on the tops. And we will pop those in the freezer until completely frozen, which is gonna take, I'm not sure, 
since I usually leave these in the freezer overnight. But anyway, the point is you got to freeze these before you serve them, which I did. And then we could definitely serve these as is, and only a real jerk would complain. But if we wanted to fancy it up a little bit, we could top this with a little bit of whipped cream, and then maybe top it with some shaved chocolate, or a light dusting of cocoa, depending on our mood. And that's it, our tiramusa, semi-fredo, is ready to more than semi-enjoy, since I'm 100% confident you are going to fully love this. And as you probably know, semi-fredo means half cold, although in this context it more refers to half frozen, and that's because the texture does not get hard. All right, even fully frozen, this has a beautiful soft creamy texture on the palate, and it really is similar to a very light airy ice cream. Right, kind of a cross between a frozen custard and a coffee ice cream with that sweet little boozy hit of marsala. All right, for something so simple and easy to make, the results really are extraordinary. Which brings us to my compelling argument portion of the program. Okay, like I mentioned, this seems more like a hot weather dessert, but I think this would be perfect for one of those really heavy holiday meals because not only is this feather light and relatively low in the calorie department, in fact, more than half of this is air, which has zero calories. So if you had one of these and then told someone you didn't have dessert, that would not be a lie. It would only be a half-truth, or a semi-truth, if you prefer. So the fact that these are so light, I think, makes it perfect after a heavy meal. But we also get that little bump of caffeine for a little bit of an after-meal pick-me-up, which may help you get through a couple more of your uncle's stories. And yes, I am that uncle. But anyway, that's it. What we're calling tiramusa semifredo. Just a decadent and rich tasting dessert, but it does not feel rich and decadent. And whether you enjoy it in the heat of summer or after a long decadent holiday meal, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Frozen zabayone. That's right, if you like regular zabayone, you will absolutely love the frozen version. If that is, you're getting a real frozen zabayone, and not simply an ice cream flavored with a little bit of marsala wine, which is unfortunately what most of the recipes out there are. And above and beyond the flavor, you're about to see what might be the best way to make ice cream without a machine. And I know, I said this wasn't ice cream, but you know what I mean. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. With six large egg yolks in a metal mixing bowl, to which we will add the tiniest pinch of salt. All right, just a little hint. And then we're also gonna need some white sugar, as well as the star of the show, some Marsala wine. And by the way, I'm using the regular dry style and not the sweet Marsala, since I actually think that makes this come out too sweet. And then what we're gonna do is set our heat to medium low, and we're gonna cook this whisking constantly until it becomes hot to the touch and thickens up beautifully. And by the way, doing this directly over the flame is by far the most dangerous and riskiest, but also the most fun and fastest method. But if you don't think you can handle that much excitement, you could, if you want, use the more traditional method of doing this over a double boiler, which simply means to set this bowl over a saucepan of simmering water. But as long as your flame is not too high and you don't let your towel catch on fire, I think this method works out just fine. And I'd say it's probably the best way to go. But anyway, you decide. I mean, you are after all the Pauline Chinfoni of your frozen zabayone. By the way, that was my mother's maiden name, and she would have absolutely loved this stuff. But no matter what method we're using, we're going to keep cooking and whisking until this gets very, very thick and reaches what we call the ribbon stage, where if we drip some of the mixture off our whisk onto the surface, those ribbons stay visible for at least a few seconds, which in case you're keeping score at home took me about 10 minutes. And then what we'll do once we think our egg mixture is cooked long enough is remove that from the heat and let it cool down completely which is most efficiently done by placing this and whisking it over some ice water. But if you're saving your ice for cocktails, you could just let this cool down on the counter, giving it the occasional whisk. But the point is, let it cool down completely before you add the whipped cream, which is the next step. So to a cold mixing bowl, we will add one cup of heavy cream, and we will whisk that until we achieve soft peaks. And the colder your cream, as well as your equipment, the faster and easier this is going to happen. So it's not a bad idea to actually put your bowl and whisk in the fridge before you do this. Especially if you're doing it on a day like I am, when it's like 90 degrees. And that's it, once we've achieved nice soft peaks, we'll go ahead and take a spatula and transfer that into our egg and marsala custard. And we will gently fold that all together 
until it is just barely combined. In fact, 97% combine is even better because as we transfer this into whatever we're going to freeze it in, that will take care of that last 3% of mixing. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is don't overmix this, is we want to retain as much of that air in the mixture as possible. All right, just because those bubbles are microscopic does not mean they can't pop. So do not overwork this. And then once that's set, we'll transfer it into some kind of freezer-friendly container, which as you probably can see, I did freeze ahead of time to minimize any potential melting. And then I like to lay a piece of plastic over the surface before covering this and freezing it for at least four or five hours, although overnight's probably better. And that's it, I think you know the rest. We will go ahead and serve that up, hopefully with lots of fresh seasonal fruit. Oh, and apologies to time travelers from the 1980s for me not garnishing this with a sprig of mint. Okay, this needs nothing else. And that, my friends, if you're a Zabayone lover, or any kind of lover, that is going to be one memorable dessert experience. And quite often, frozen desserts that aren't made with a machine can have sort of a weird crystallized icy texture, but not here. This stuff is incredibly smooth and creamy on the palate, so I really do think you're going to be impressed with the texture. And then there's the taste, which because we did not use too much cream, is very, very Zabayone-like, and not like most of the other recipes for this, which really tastes more like a plain vanilla ice cream with a little bit of marsala in it. But having said that, if you want something slightly less intensely flavored, you could double the cream, or split the difference and use one and a half cups, and everything else will work out just the same. Oh, and speaking of marsala, one thing that makes this dessert so interesting and unique is the fact that most people don't sit around drinking marsala wine on a regular basis, and if they do, probably not for long. So what happens when people dig into this is they can't quite place what the flavor is. Okay, it's kind of familiar, but nothing pops into your brain instantly, like if you were eating something that was strawberry or chocolate or coffee or vanilla, etc. So other than the incredible texture and fantastic taste, which pairs perfectly with fresh fruit, that's probably my favorite part of serving this dessert. Confusing my guests, especially the ones that have never had Zabayone. Oh, and one last thing before I sign off. I kind of hope you use a dry marsala, but this technique will work with any dessert wine, quote unquote. All right, something like a Sauterne, or I know some people even use Prosecco. But anyway, whether you make this as shown or tweak this to your taste, I really do hope you give it a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Harissa, and I know what you're thinking, not another Tunisian recipe, but it's okay. This is one of my favorite hot sauces in the world, and one you really need to know how to make. And like most hot sauce recipes, you can totally adapt this to your personal pain threshold. So here we go. So I'm gonna use various kinds of peppers. I have some red bell peppers. We're actually gonna fire roast those on the stove. I have some red Fresno chilies. Those are spicy. Those we're just gonna blanch along with the very hot habanero pepper and some garlic cloves. And then a very specific spice blend. I have some cumin, some dried mint, some coriander, and some caraway seeds. All right, step one here, I'm gonna fire roast my red bell pepper over an open flame. All right, so we're doing two things here. We're charring the skin so it can be removed, and we're also partially cooking the pepper. So just keep turning it until the entire surface is pretty charred, and then we're gonna go ahead and throw this in a plastic bag to steam. So after you rock the bells, you're gonna have to let them LL Cool J down, and by doing that inside the plastic bag here, they're gonna steam and that skin's gonna peel right off. All right, so I'm gonna let my peppers cool while I'm on to the rest of the ingredients, which basically are gonna get a quick blanch in boiling water. So I'm gonna cut off the root end of the garlic cloves. I'm gonna leave the peel on though. I'm gonna throw those in boiling salted water along with my Fresno chilies and my habanero. And by the way, some people call that a Scotch bonnet pepper. I don't because I do wear a lot of Scottish hats and it gets confusing. So once we toss that in, we're going to wait for it to come back to a boil, and we're just going to let that boil for three minutes. And that's just going to ever so slightly cook and tenderize the pepper. I mean, just barely. It's also going to just kind of take the edge off the garlic. So I like my harissa very garlicky, so I don't want cooked garlic. But a short blanch like this is really not going to cook the garlic. It's just going to take that little bit of super peppery raw edge off while still giving you that full punch of garlic. And bonus, it also makes it super easy to peel. And again, that was just barely three minutes. At that point, I'm gonna fish it out with my strainer. I'm gonna lay it on a plate and let that cool enough to handle, which I didn't do. See me handling this? It's not cool. I'm burning my fingers, so I'm not sure why I kept doing it. And you can see that garlic skin comes right off the clove. 
All right, to prep the peppers, I'm gonna cut them in half and I'm gonna just scrape out the seeds and the membranes, all right? And that's it, so pretty. And as you may know, the seeds are where most of the heat in a pepper is. So especially with the habanero, make sure you remove those. Okay, so our peppers have been prepped, our garlic has been peeled, our bell peppers have been steamed in the plastic now for about 15 minutes, which makes the skin super, super easy to peel off with the back of a knife. And you can rinse this underwater if you have to, although it's recommended you don't. Just peel it with a knife, you can wipe it with a paper towel, and that's it. And of course you're removing the seeds and membranes from that too, but you knew that. All right, so all that's ready to go. And last step here, we gotta toast some seeds. So in a small dry saute pan over medium heat, I'm gonna add my coriander and my caraway seeds. And we're simply gonna toast that for a few minutes until we can just barely smell the spice. The heat's gonna bring out those essential oils and it really does make a big difference if you heat these seeds up first before you grind it. So it might seem like a small annoying step that you wanna skip, but don't. A sauce as awesome as Harissa deserves better. So when those are done, I'm gonna dump them in my mortar and I'm gonna crush these with a pestle. I'm also gonna add in my other spices, which are ground cumin, and yes, I could have toasted that too, dried mint and salt, and I'm gonna grind that until very fine. By the way, if the foodie in your family does not have one of these ancient and amazing kitchen tools, be sure to buy them a mortar and pestle as a gift. They will love you and you will love their food and everybody wins. All right, so once that's done, we're gonna finish this all in a blender. So I'm gonna go ahead and dump in my peppers, my garlic, and of course the spices we just toasted and ground. And then last but not least, we need a little bit of acid and oil. For acid, I'm gonna use fresh lemon juice. You can certainly use vinegar. And then just a little splash of oil, but not extra virgin olive oil. You could use a light olive oil or just a regular vegetable oil. And the problem is sometimes when you blend extra virgin olive oils because of the friction and the heat in the blender, they turn bitter. So just a light oil is better here. And then if we want, we can introduce a little extra virgin olive oil at the end for flavor, which as you're about to see, I'm gonna do. So we're simply gonna puree that in the blender till smooth. You know I like to stop halfway and scrape things down just for fun. And as I just mentioned, when this is just about all the way pureed, and I think I'm like five seconds away from being done, I'm gonna drizzle in a tablespoon or so of really, really beautiful extra virgin olive oil that literally just gets a few seconds of blending. And that's it, Harissa, poured in a bowl, taste for final seasoning, maybe a little salt. Mine was plenty spicy enough because I had those Fresno chilies and habanero in there, but if you wanna spice yours even further, go ahead, I like how you're thinking. And what is this good on? Everything, you've seen me use this many times in videos, it really is a magical ingredient, incredibly versatile. A spoon of this literally in any savory dish will make it better. And you remember that old saying, once you go Tunisian, the other sauces aren't as pleasing. So I hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Stracciatella soup. That's right, this soup is dedicated to anyone who's ever had one of those days, which is everyone. Yup, you get home after a long day and you're stressed and you're angry and you're frustrated and just generally upset with the universe and everything in it. And above and beyond that, you get home and you realize you're also tired and starving. Plus, did we mention there's nothing in the house to eat? Well, my friends, good news, because that's exactly why this soup was invented. This stuff is proven to cure wood algae and several things that don't. So let's go ahead and get started. And the first thing we're gonna wanna do is bring some stock or broth up to a simmer over high heat and today I'm gonna to be using a nice rich chicken broth, which may or may not be homemade. But please know that this is gonna work pretty much exactly the same with any kind of meat or vegetable stock. And then besides bringing this up to a simmer, the only other thing we're gonna to wanna to do is make sure this is seasoned properly. So make sure you give it a taste and add some salt if you have to, which I did. I also added a pinch of freshly ground black pepper. Okay, so make sure you check that out and adjust if you have to. And then what we can do while we're waiting for that to come up to the simmer is put together our egg mixture which not surprisingly is gonna start with three large whole eggs. And by the way, if you're into rules of thumb, we basically want one egg for every two cups of stock. And then to the eggs, we're gonna add some freshly chopped Italian parsley, if you have it, which you do, since you have a plant in a pot on a windowsill, or should. And then to that, we're gonna add a couple tablespoons of semolina flour, which by the way is optional, but I do prefer it if you have it. And then we'll go ahead and toss in some finely grated cheese, which is not optional, and I'm gonna use two kinds, some Parmigiano Reggiano and some Pecorino Romano. And of course, you can just use one or the other. And then let's go ahead and season this up a little bit with a nice big pinch of salt, as well as a good old shake of cayenne. Come on, you're not gonna to try to forget about your horrible day without cayenne, are you? 
And then we'll also do a little bit of freshly ground black pepper. And then last but not least, we'll do a little pinch of nutmeg. And yes, of course, freshly grated. I'm insulted by your question. That's really the only kind anyone should use. So we'll grate in a little touch of nutmeg, and then we'll simply take a whisk and mix this very thoroughly. And theoretically, in the few minutes it took you to put this together, our broth or stock will have come up to a simmer, and we are ready to stracciatella. And to accomplish that, all we're going to have to do is slowly pour this in while stirring with a spoon. And as you can see, I'm using the freakishly small wooden spoon. And what's going to happen as we stir that mixture into this hot simmering liquid, it's going to form what appears to be thousands upon thousands of tiny little torn rags. Which, by the way, is what stracciatelli means. And as soon as that's stirred in, believe it or not, that's it. All we're going to do is leave the heat on until this comes back up to temperature and starts to simmer again. And you'll notice when you first stir this in, it's going to look kind of cloudy and weird. But don't worry. Just keep stirring, leave it on the heat, and it will go from looking cloudy and weird to looking clear, but still weird. But that's fine. That's what it's supposed to look like. And of course, like everything we serve, we're going to taste it one more time before we dish it up. And once we're happy with the seasoning, we will grab a ladle and go ahead and serve this up into some hot bowls. And personally, I think all those millions of little tiny rags are so interesting looking. You don't really need a garnish here. But I did notice a little parsley on the cutting board. So I tossed it in. I didn't want to waste it. As well as a little bit of chili flake. And then last but not least, a couple optional drips of olive oil. Since you really should include a little bit of fat with every meal. And that is it. Our stracciatella soup is done. You pair that with a nice simple green salad and maybe some crusty bread. And you're talking about an incredibly fast, incredibly simple, and yet profoundly satisfying and comforting meal. It really does make everything seem like it's okay. And suddenly that idiot at work does not seem like that big of a problem. And you've probably already thought, wow, this would be an easy soup to adapt and add lots of different things to. Yes, absolutely. A lot of people like to throw a handful of spinach in here or Swiss chard, as well as adding some additional meat, whether it's chicken or sausage. You are, after all, the David Lee Roth of this raggedy broth. So please feel free to adapt this and accessorize as you see fit. So even though you weren't in a good mood after work, and you didn't have any time or energy or ingredients for that matter, you still probably will be able to pull off something like this. And if you can, everything's going to seem a lot better. And that's because it is a lot better, okay? So anyway, I really hope you were paying attention and heard what I was stracha telling you, because this really is a soup everybody should have in their repertoire, especially after one of those days. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy Italian rice croquettes, also known as rice balls, if you form them into balls. But this video was shot at a recent family dinner at my Uncle Bill and Aunt Angela Dardawini's house. And I really, really love these and I wanted to show you how they make them. So here we go. Now you can make these completely vegetarian if you want, but we like to do chicken giblets. That's right, gizzards, a few hearts. I got a couple pounds there. Uncle Bill puts them in a pressure cooker with a little bit of water, about a cup, and some salt. And he cooks those in the pressure cooker for about 15-20 minutes until tender. And yes, pressure cooker lids are hard to get on. Anyway, 18 minutes or so later, our giblets were done. Simply drain them and let them cool a little bit. And then we're going to chop those up. So besides the giblets, we're also going to need, of course, rice. So we're going to boil two cups of rice in salted water. All right, when it was nice and tender, we dumped it onto a sheet pan to cool down a little bit. We want to work with this while it's warm but not hot. So I'm just going to leave that on the sheet pan till it cools, transfer it into a large bowl, and the rice is ready to go. All right, once our chicken gizzards and hearts were cool enough to handle, Uncle Bill chopped them coarsely in a food processor, just a couple on and offs. He likes it really chunky. See that? Still pretty big pieces. And you can certainly do that by hand. And once those were all chopped up, we added them to our warm rice. And that's basically the base of the rice croquette. All right, so that's ready for the rest of the ingredients. And I got to give you a little warning. I will have all the specifics on the blog, as I said, as far as amounts. But they're not real big on measuring stuff around here. So we're going to guesstimate. You really just wing it. But I'll get you close. So we're going to put in a couple cups of grated Parmesan cheese. You could use Pecorino Romano. Any nice grated Italian cheese will work. Some fresh parsley which Uncle Billy doesn't usually put, but we kind of forced him because we had some. A little bit of breadcrumb, a couple eggs, and a little bit of marinara sauce. All right, not too much. And that's basically it. So I volunteered here to mix it up. I grabbed the wooden spoon, 
and I started mixing, and you really want to get this thoroughly, thoroughly mixed. And at this point, Uncle Billy slapped my hand and said, what the hell are you doing? We don't use a spoon for that. We use our hands. So he washed his hands, and he got in there, and he got in there deep, and he mixed this properly. So you want to use your hands for this. You want it really, really thoroughly combined. You're just going to go in there, and you're going to mix it and fold it and smash it together until it looks like that. Then, before we form the balls or the croquettes, depending on what you're into, we're going to wrap that, and we're going to refrigerate that for about an hour until it cools down and it will firm up nicely. Makes it much, much easier to form. All right, so this was about an hour or so later. You can let it go longer, but you definitely want to let it cool down, and then you form your croquettes. And, of course, we're not measuring this either. He just takes out a little bit and forms it with his hands into the classic croquette, kind of a football shape. American football, that is. Not that, you know, boring stuff the rest of the world plays and calls football. All right, and the rest of the process could not be simpler. After your rice balls or your rice croquettes are formed, you're going to simply roll those in plain breadcrumbs until they're coated. It's going to stick very easily to that semi-sticky rice, and that is it. So we line those up on pans. You can do these way ahead of time if you want, and it's never a one-person operation. My mother Pauline was rolling them. My Aunt Angela was rolling them. So they're not really authentic Italian croquettes unless the whole family pitches in. Once your rice croquettes are breaded, we're going to simply pan fry those in some vegetable oil. We put about an inch of oil in a heavy skillet on medium high heat, and you're just going to cook those nice and brown. Now, Uncle Billy was very insistent that these should go pretty dark brown. I thought they were ready to turn there, and he was like, no, don't turn them yet. So I listened to him. Why? Because he knows what the heck he's doing. He's done these a thousand times. So when he thought they were brown enough, we turned them over. Okay, but nothing too complicated. Just brown them on all sides. Everything in there is basically cooked. You're just heating them through and getting a nice crispy outside. Now, I really love the chicken gizzards in there, but where the meat is exposed to the oil, it does get a little darker than the rice, but I don't think that looks bad at all. And of course, the parsley cooked a little dark too, but again, that's an optional ingredient. Uncle Billy normally does not put parsley, but like I said, we had some fresh parsley and we basically made him add some. Once they're browned all over, you're going to transfer those to a paper towel to drain and serve immediately. These should be served nice and hot. We like to throw some fresh lemon on the plate. You can also serve this with some tomato sauce or an aioli. You know, pretty much anything works. They're so delicious. And there you go. You know what's coming next, right? I'm going to bite into one of these, and it's so good. The cheese, the rice, the little bit of tomato, and of course the chicken gizzards and hearts make it awfully good. Just a great rustic, homey, comforting, delicious snack or appetizer. Great for parties. So thank you so much, Uncle Billy and Aunt Angela. Love you guys. Thanks for sharing the recipe. All the information is on foodwishes.com, as usual. And as always, enjoy Pumpkin Zeppole. That's right. We're going to do a seasonal take on this very simple Italian donut. If you happen to be looking for something a little out of the ordinary for your upcoming Halloween party, these could work. All right? They may not be as scary as those bleeding eye truffles or those super spooky spider cupcakes. But nevertheless, I think they're very appropriate and will be very, very well received. But anyway, let's go ahead and get started with this ultra simple batter. And the first thing we want to do is put together our dry ingredients. So we'll start with some all-purpose flour, to which we're going to add some baking powder, not baking soda, baking powder. And we also want a pinch of salt, as well as a generous spoon of cinnamon, and some freshly grated nutmeg. And you don't have to use fresh nutmeg if you don't want it to taste quite as good. You can go ahead and dust off that old can in the pantry. And then all we're going to do is take a whisk and mix this enthusiastically for about a minute. And that's in lieu of sifting. Sifting is so 20th century. So we'll give that a proper whisking. And we will set that aside while we work on the wet ingredients. Which will start with our secret ingredient, ricotta cheese. So I'm going to add some full fat ricotta to a mixing bowl. And then to that we will add our pumpkin puree. And as always I'm using pure canned pumpkin. That should be the only thing on the ingredient list. All right, we don't want to be using pumpkin pie filling here. And by the way, on the blog post, I'll explain why you never, ever want to use fresh pumpkin for this. So please check that out. And then we're also going to need some sugar, but not too, too much. This is not a super sweet donut. And then last but not least, we need two large eggs. And believe it or not, that's it. 
So at this point, we'll take a whisk and mix this thoroughly. And I may have mentioned this before, but one thing I always like to do when I'm mixing something is try to remember what I forgot. And as I was mixing this, I looked over and realized I never put the vanilla in. So I'm going to stop and add that. A nice little splash of real vanilla extract. So that's not a bad tip to pass along. Instead of just mindlessly stirring something, try not to forget to remember what you may have missed. And then once we have that mixed nice and smooth, we'll go ahead and mix our wet ingredients into our bowl of dry ingredients. Or should we do dry into wet? I never can remember. Although for this, I'm almost positive it doesn't matter. In fact, I know it doesn't matter. But anyway, we're gonna take a spatula and mix our dry and wet ingredients together to form what's either a very, very thick batter or a very, very loose dough. And as soon as that's done, assuming your oil's hot, we can start making zeppole. And the way we're gonna form these and get this batter into the oil is by using the old two spoon method, which simply means you scoop some with one spoon and then use the second spoon to push it off into the oil. And I'm showing you that in the bowl here because I didn't know if I could film it over the top of the fryer. So you can practice that move a few times in the bowl. And then once you think you have it down, we can head over to the fryer where we're gonna fry these at 375 for about two minutes or so. So using the old two spoon method, I'm gonna drop six in here and not from too high up. You don't wanna splash yourself. So get low. And what we'll do is we'll let those fry for about a minute, at which point we wanna turn them over, which by the way, they may do by themselves. But anyway, like I said, we'll cook them for a minute. We'll turn them over. And all that's gonna take is a little nudge with your strainer. And we'll give the other side about a minute for, like I said, a grand total of about two to two and a half minutes. At which point, as usual, we will remove those to a rack to drain and our pumpkin zeppole, also known as the world's easiest donuts, are done. And you are not going to believe how light these are and how hot when they first come out of the fryer. So be careful. But these really are incredibly light, not to mention really delicious. And that's serving this plain. But we're not going to serve it plain. I highly suggest you give these a little toss in some cinnamon sugar. And if you're not into cinnamon sugar, you could just use plain powdered sugar or maybe some kind of icing. That's up to you. You are the boss at making sure people go nuts for your donuts. But personally, I really do think that cinnamon sugar looks and tastes great. And would that have been easier in a larger bowl? Yes, yeah, significantly easier. But eventually I got them done. And that, my friends, is one nice looking pile of seasonal donuts. And look how gorgeous that color is. I mean, if you don't think that's a great color, you're not that good at colors, because that is beautiful. And in addition to their impossible lightness and gorgeous appearance, the taste is also excellent. They have a sort of subtle, but still identifiable pumpkin flavor, which is obviously helped by the cinnamon and nutmeg. And what I think is very important, they're not too sweet, right? There's nothing worse than a too sweet donut. And for me, these are just right. So I really do love how these come out. In fact, these delicious fritters are so fast and easy, I'm actually a little concerned you're gonna make these too often. So please, I implore you, use this video responsibly, okay? So I really do hope you give these a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. This is an Italian omelet, kind of borrowing a few French techniques and French goat cheese. This is a really simple, easy, fast, delicious way to do a quick little omelet. So I have my stainless steel pan on medium heat with a good couple tablespoons of olive oil. All right, you need a good amount of oil in this one. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swirl the oil around to coat the pan. Now, in general, the French omelets are fairly gently cooked. You usually don't want any color on it. This Italian omelet is gonna be cooked a little hotter and I want a little bit of golden brown on there. You'll notice I only have three eggs there and I'm using a big pan, so I want this really thin. It's almost like a flourless, eggy crepe, more so than a thick omelet. So once the egg hits the hot oil, it's gonna kind of bubble up and the bottom's gonna seal. You're gonna lift up the edges that are cooking with your spatula, tilt the pan and let the raw egg run underneath, which is gonna kind of create these layers of eggy goodness. And it will also cook a lot faster because if you just let it sit there, the bottom will get too brown by the time the egg on the top is cooked. So once it stops kind of running, once it doesn't really have enough eggy liquid to run under, I'm gonna turn off the heat. I'm gonna use my spatula just to even out the raw egg that's left. It's a very thin layer. That's gonna finish cooking just with the heat that's underneath it, okay? So the heat's off. This is in real time, okay? I'm not editing this, so that's how long it took. 
I'm going to crumble an ounce or two of fresh French goat cheese. I had some chive plants that were desperate to be trimmed, so I got some fresh chives, black pepper, and there was no salt in the eggs. So I'm going to give it a nice big pinch here, big sprinkling of sea salt. Then I'm going to fold up the bottom third and then the top third, kind of like a, you're folding a letter for an envelope. Okay, see it's got that nice golden brown, but not too dark. Brown omelets are bitter omelets, so you really don't want a dark brown. I'm going to scoot that down towards the end of the pan. And I'm just going to flip it over on my plate. And that, I'm sure there's an Italian word for it, but that's a, just a really thin, nice Italian omelet. All right, it's very tender. It's very creamy and custardy inside because I didn't cook it very long. And I use that lift and pour the egg underneath the system that you can rewind and watch again. And that is unbelievable. Look at that melty goat cheese. Beautiful, fresh herb. Unreal. Anyway, that's what I had for breakfast. Hope you enjoyed that. Anyway, there's not really any ingredient list. It's eggs, cheese, and, you know, you saw the rest. I hope you give that a try. And as always, enjoy. Farinata! That's right, this is like my new favorite food. It's incredibly delicious, very comforting, super easy to make, and this very rustic Italian oven-baked pancake, for lack of a better description, is made with garbanzo flour. And the first time I made this, I could not believe how such a simple batter could produce such a tasty and interesting dish that apparently is really good for you. So step one, in a mixing bowl, we have our garbanzo bean flour. Now I found this next to all those specialty gluten-free flours at the regular supermarket. But if you can't find that there, any health food store is going to have it. And to our garbanzo bean flour, we're going to add enough warm water to make basically a thin batter. Not too hot, just barely warms fine. And they say you should stir it in gradually, but you know what? I've never been a big fan of what they say. So I just dump it all in and whisk, and it works perfectly. So I'm not sure why all the recipes say add it gradually, but suit yourself. And we want to mix that up until completely, completely smooth, so keep whisking. Yes, if you want to dirty your blender or immersion mixer, you can use those. So we're going to mix that up completely smooth. And at that point, all we're going to do is cover it. I'm going to use a plate instead of plastic wrap. Because I love the earth, I want it to be nice for your grandkids. So we're going to cover that with something, and we're going to let it sit there for two hours at room temperature. So you're going to need to go find something to do for a few hours. What did I do while I waited? Just chilled. And after two hours, we're going to uncover it, and it's going to look like this. Yes, it gets a little foamy. So at this point, you're going to need to take a spoon or a ladle and skim off that foam. My sources deep within the Farinata subculture tell me that foam is what people have trouble digesting. And if you don't skim it, this recipe will be much noisier. All right, so we're going to skim off as much of that as we can. And like I said, it's going to make it more artsy, less fartsy. And after that, we're going to add the last couple ingredients. We're, of course, going to need some salt and a decent amount of it. We're also going to add some olive oil. And then one optional ingredient that's not in the traditional recipe, but it is a common addition, some very finely minced rosemary. And we're going to stir that in very well. And we're going to let that sit there for about 10 minutes while we preheat our oven and prep our pan. So on the stove, we're going to place down a 10-inch cast iron skillet, and we're going to place that on high heat and get it smoking hot. And by the way, while we're doing this, you're definitely going to want to preheat your oven to 500 degrees. So that's ready to roll. And once we think our pan is really hot, we're going to pour in some additional olive oil. Yes, a lot of it, but don't worry. Olive oil is really, really good for you. Or at least that's what a doctor that worked for the olive oil company said. And why would they lie? They have to take an oath. So pour in the olive oil and then stand there looking at it. And as soon as you see that first little wisp of smoke, quickly pour in your batter. And it would probably help if, unlike me, you poured it right in the center. I kind of went in from the side, but don't worry. It's not going to matter. But you're going to pour in that batter. And then you're quickly, but very carefully... Transfer that into the center of your preheated 500 degree oven and let that bake for about 25 to 30 minutes or until it looks like this. And I remember thinking the first time I made it before I'd even tasted it, I said to myself, look at that, that's going to taste good. And I was right. And by the way, this is one of the few things we make I don't make you let cool a little bit. As soon as you can, transfer it onto a plate. You want to serve this right away. It's not nearly as good cold. And then traditionally, all this is garnished with is freshly ground black pepper. And you might be thinking, I'll just use that stuff I have in the can. It's worked fine for the last seven years. Why change now? Trust me, fresh black pepper for this, please. And as soon as we've pepperized that, we're going to go ahead and take our pizza cutter and we'll cut this up into, I don't know, six or eight portions. That's probably what they get in Italy. In LA, you probably get 16 portions out of this. In Chicago, of course, this would be a single portion. So it depends on where you are. But anyway, you decide. You're the Heidi Fleiss of your slice. 
And then as soon as that's cut up, serve it immediately. This is way, way, way better hot than cold. And because of that extra hot oven and that olive oil, we're gonna get a beautiful, crispy, crusty exterior. And yet the inside's gonna stay nice and moist, kind of dense, but not unpleasantly so. Just very, very earthy and comforting and satisfying. Just truly delicious stuff. After this first bite, I was like, what are you doing? Just use your hands, come on. And if you have not made this before, before you go putting a bunch of toppings on it, try it just like this. It is so good, you'll know why it's not traditionally topped with anything. Of course, having said that, do not be surprised if you see a future tricked out version and the possibilities are as vast as they are exciting. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I really, really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Torta de Rizzo. That's right, this delicious Italian rice pie is generally made as a dessert, but it's also wonderful in savory form, which is what we're gonna do here utilizing some leeks and spinach. And besides making for a very easy lunch or side dish, this is also perfect for playing a practical joke in your family. Yes, you tell them you're having pie later, and then you bring this out and crush their dreams. But don't worry, one taste and all will be forgiven. So let me show you how to put this together. And step one is sauteing the leeks. So we're gonna put a large skillet down on medium heat with a little bit of olive oil, and we're gonna dump in a couple chopped leeks with a big pinch of salt. And we're just gonna saute those until they're kind of soft and sweet. And that might take five minutes, that might take 10 minutes. I refuse to commit to a specific time, but you'll know. Just give them a stir once in a while, keep an eye on them. And when they start to get pretty soft and just pretty in general, that's pretty much it. And when they reach that point, they really should look something like this. And then what we're gonna do at that point is make a little space in the center and we'll toss in about three cloves of finely minced garlic and we'll go ahead and mix that in and saute that for about a minute. So stir that garlic in, let it cook for about 60 seconds and then all we're gonna do is turn off the heat and just set that aside until needed, which is gonna be very soon. So our leek and garlic mixture set and it's on to the rest of the ingredients. The first and probably most important is the rice. So we're gonna need a couple cups of cooked rice. Okay, this recipe is perfect for when you have leftover rice, quite possibly from a Thai dinner the night before. And then to that, we're gonna add some chopped, cooked, fresh spinach. And as long as you squeeze it very dry, you can use frozen spinach, no problem. But of course, we're gonna use fresh because we're better than that. But regardless, make sure it's squeezed perfectly dry and chopped pretty fine. And then to that, let's go ahead and add our leek mixture. We're also gonna need some beaten eggs to kind of bind this together a little bit. So we'll pour those in. And then a whole bunch of freshly grated Reggiano Parmesan. And for this, it's totally fine to use the fake cheap kind. I'm just kidding. It's totally not all right. Use the good stuff. And then after the cheese goes in, let's go ahead and season this up with some salt, of course, and a good amount. This will be totally bland if you undersalt it. We'll also put in some freshly ground black pepper and of course a couple shakes of cayenne. And yes, one of these days I will do a video explaining the cayenne fetish. And then I think we should also give it a little pinch of nutmeg. Of course, we're gonna use freshly grated. By the way, can I call that a nut? Because if it's not and I call it a nut, people will go nuts. But anyway, a little bit of nutmeg. And then let's go ahead and spatulate this until it's thoroughly, thoroughly combined. And take your time, chopped fresh spinach is notorious for kind of clumping together. And we don't want any pockets of pure spinach. And as I'm mixing this, I should tell you, this is perfect for using other summer veggies. Just cook the veggies tender, chop them up and throw them in. It's fine, trust me. So give this a very thoughtful mixing. And once you're sure that's happened, just go ahead and set that aside while we prep our pan or dish. And in my case, I'm using a glass pie dish but really any heat proof pan or dish is gonna work. And what we'll do is we'll grease this with a little bit of olive oil, brush that all over. And then I like to give it a little extra sprinkling of cheese before we dump everything in. And I really don't know if that has any effect, but you know what, I'm not gonna take any chances. And then yes, you guessed it. Let's go ahead and transfer our mixture into the dish and we'll take our spatula and we'll smooth that out and make sure it's all perfectly distributed or distributed if you prefer. And then once we've done that and that surface is nice and smooth, let's go ahead and give it a little old tapa tapa just for good luck. And then before we pop this in, let's go ahead and dust the top with a little more parm. And that is ready to bake. So we're gonna transfer that into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 35 to 40 minutes, or until it looks like this. It should be lightly browned around the outside, around the outside, around the outside, and a little firm to the touch. And at that point, we have many options. We can eat it piping hot like this, we can let it cool to just barely warm, which I think is the perfect way to serve it. Or there's even some freaks in nature that like this cold. So you really can enjoy this at any temperature. But like I said, I like mine warm. So let me cut a slice. And here, unfortunately, my fancy pie spatula serving thing was not flexible enough to get in here. So I switched to the palette knife, which worked better. And right about here, your family's finally realizing they're not having dessert pie. But don't worry, one taste and they're totally gonna forget about your cruel joke. 
So we'll go ahead and serve that up. And that spinach and leek torta de riso is done. So let's dig in for the official taste. And you can see the texture fairly dense, but still nice and moist. And like I said earlier, you can totally adapt this, use all kinds of different peppers and vegetables, different cheeses. Although, you know what? Don't do this with kale. We're doing too many things with kale. Let's just relax with the kale for a minute. But anyway, just very tasty, very delicious, very comforting. And as the old saying goes, and by saying I mean commercial, this is good and good for you. So I really hope you give this a try. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Italian wedding soup. If you grew up in the Northeast and are Italian or know Italians and went to weddings, you probably had this soup. So what I'm gonna do is take a beef soup bone, a beef shank. You wanna look for one that has a nice big piece of marrow bone in it. I'm gonna brown that on both sides in the soup pot and a little bit of vegetable oil. I'm gonna add the classic mirepoix, celery, carrots, onions. I'm going to add a couple quarts of cold water. Okay, I'm going to throw in a bay leaf, a few cloves of garlic, some black peppercorns, and we're going to make just a simple beef stock. We're going to bring this up to a simmer and then back the heat down just so it does that. A slow, gentle simmer for like four or five hours. You're going to simmer it until the meat falls off the bone. You're going to add more water if necessary to keep the level sort of around which you started at. I want to end up with about a quart of beef stock. Okay, so while our stock is working, I'm going to make the meatball mixture. This is boneless beef short ribs that I want you to put in the freezer till they're firm. Then I want you to cut it in cubes, put it back in the freezer until it's just almost frozen. It shouldn't be hard, but it shouldn't be soft. All right, it should be just very, very firm and cold to the touch. All right, so half frozen, I'll say. So as the meat is firming up in the freezer, let's get our wet ingredients ready. I have an egg, some crushed garlic, some fresh Italian parsley, heavy cream, the secret ingredient. All right, give that a whisk. Then I'm gonna add Parmesan cheese and fresh breadcrumbs. That's the inside of a loaf of Italian bread, one cup, that I just pulsed on and off in a food processor to make a fresh breadcrumb. Very important, you don't use dry breadcrumbs. It won't be as tender. All right, the meat's been in the freezer about 15 minutes, so it is firm to the touch, not frozen, firm. I'm gonna add my salt and pepper, and I'm gonna pulse that on and off until it resembles a, I don't know, like a sausage mix, so like a coarse grind. Because it's cold, it's gonna work. Add the breadcrumb mixture, and we're gonna keep pulsing on and off until it basically comes together like a ball. Now you're thinking, wow, that's gonna be really tough and overmixed. It's not, just relax. Because you're using such cold meat, and because of that cream and fresh breadcrumb mixture, these meatballs are gonna be so tender. All right, so refrigerate that, I have a bunch of kale. I'm gonna take the stems out. Very simple, just pull it right out. I'm gonna give that a rough chop. The other ingredient is something called pastina. A little tiny pasta. In fact, these are shaped like stars. Look at that, so cute. Look at that fingerprint. All right, I'm gonna strain my beef stock. That took like five hours. And like I said, I had about a quart when I was done because some evaporated. I'm gonna to add to that a quart of chicken broth. That's right, it's gonna be half beef broth half chicken broth, which makes the ultimate Italian wedding soup. And what may seem kind of minor, but is really important, about a teaspoon of tomato paste. All right, bring that to a simmer. Taste for salt and pepper. I'm gonna add my kale, and I'm gonna let that simmer for 15 minutes. In the meantime, perfect opportunity to make our meatballs. I'm gonna use a little tiny sorbet scoop here and just form them into little balls. You can roll them in your hands if you want, make them neat, or you could just scoop and have them irregular. It doesn't really matter. But I like those little scoops for that kind of a job. Makes it really easy, and they all sort of come out the same size. And by the way, this is kind of a big batch of meatball mixture. I only used about half for the soup, and I saved half for spaghetti meatballs. So you can just refrigerate any extra. All right, the greens have been simmering for 15 minutes. I'm going to add a quarter cup of the pastina. I'm going to let that cook for five minutes. It's not going to be totally cooked, but the pasta will almost be cooked. At that point, I'm going to carefully slide in our meatballs. Come on, stupid inertia. All right, those are in. Give it a stir, and that simmers for 15 minutes. By that time, meatballs cooked and tender. Pasta, very tender, and slightly, slightly has thickened the soup. All right, shouldn't be thick, just a little bit of, I don't know, heavier viscosity in the broth. Not a thickness, a richness. And check out this great final shot. Sure, it's out of focus, but at least the lighting's bad. Sometimes I like to garnish this with just a little bit of fresh black pepper, maybe a little extra Parmesan cheese sprinkled over, and that's pretty much it. 
It is so delicious and comforting, and those meatballs are so tender. You just gotta give this a try. Seriously, so good. And don't wait for a wedding to make it. It's not a hard recipe. You can make the meatballs ahead of time and so forth. Give it a try, so delicious. All the ingredients are on the site. And as always, enjoy green hummus. That's right, we're making a very delicious green hummus using fresh basil, white beans, and garbanzo beans for a delicious and super, super, super easy spread or dip. So here's how you put it together. I'm gonna start with a big old bunch of basil. This is from my backyard. So beautiful. I'm gonna pick off the leaves. I'm gonna throw that into some boiling water, believe it or not, just for a few seconds. This is like real time, this is like 20 seconds just to sort of lock in that green color. So basically what you do is you pop it in that boiling water, that simmering water, 20 seconds or so. All right, fish it out with a strainer into some ice water, which stops the cooking. And when you squeeze it out, you're left with beautiful bright green basil that will actually hold its color. Now you've seen us use that trick for pestos before. Now, if you want to skip that step, you can. But basically, as your hummus sits out, it can turn kind of gray and ugly. So I like the trick of blanching the basil first. So I had about a third of a cup packed of basil leaves. Throw that into a blender with lots of garlic, some lemon juice, some olive oil, not all of it. I like to put most of my olive oil in at the end, as you're going to see. I'm going to dump in my garbanzo beans and my white kidney beans, some black pepper, and a good amount of salt. You need enough salt here, otherwise it's going to be very bland. All right, so I'm going to pulse that on and off a couple times to get it going. I don't want to have to add a lot of liquid here to dilute it just so it, you know, purees easier. So this will puree very smooth, but you got to pulse a couple times, use a spatula, mix it up, pulse a couple times, and so forth. When it starts to puree, and it looks like that, then I add the rest of my olive oil, which is another couple tablespoons. I heard a long time ago that if you blend olive oil too long, it gets bitter in the blender. So that's why I just start it with a little bit. Once it starts to puree, then I put the rest in. I don't know, it probably does nothing. Who knows, you could probably put in all the oil at the beginning, but you know, better safe than sorry. So right there, I was in good shape. This pureed very nice and smooth. If you're an idiot like me, you can actually keep the blender on and use your spatula to kind of help things along. Not recommended. Because if you're not paying attention, you can lose the tip of your spatula, and then you're throwing away your rubber-infused hummus. Are right, you gonna taste and adjust your seasoning? Make sure it's got enough salt. Maybe you need more lemon juice. Maybe you need more pepper. Up to you. You're the boss of your hummus. So I love regular hummus, but when you add the deliciousness of fresh summer basil, very, very excellent version. Okay, so green hummus, call it what you want, pesto hummus, basil hummus, you make up your own name, and then people will think this is your recipe, and you will get all the glory, which is fine. I don't need any glory. I'd rather have the money. And I know all the grocery stores now sell, like, tubs of hummus, but it's expensive, and it's not as good as this. And this took, like, two seconds to make. In fact, you probably make this and go, you know what? i got to have a party now. What am I going to do with all this dip? And then you start calling some friends. And then, of course, it was time for the obligatory taste... And man, I'm not lying, so delicious. If you like hummus, you're gonna love this. If you like pesto, you're gonna love this. If you like anything on a chip, you will love this. Anyway, I hope you give this a try. All the ingredients are on foodwishes.com, as usual. And as always, enjoy gremolata. Gremolata is a fantastic Italian condiment slash sauce, and it goes on top of rich meats, stews, soups, things like that. This is traditionally served on the famous Oso Buco, the braised veal shanks. So what it is, is a couple tablespoons of finely minced parsley, raw garlic, not cooked garlic. If you ever see someone trying to serve a roasted garlic remolata, I think you should slap them. Actually, no, don't do that. Physical violence is never the answer. But you should give them a stern talking to. It has to be raw garlic. And then we're going to freshly grate some lemon zest. Use a microplane or a zester. You just want the yellow surface that has all the lemony goodness. Some people add salt and pepper to their gremolata. I don't because usually what I'm putting it on is already perfectly seasoned. So that's up to you. We're going to mix that together with just enough olive oil to make it wet. So I put a little in and I stirred it around. And I said to myself, that's not enough olive oil. So I put in another little splash. And then I said, that is enough olive oil. So you mix this up. Now this is meant to be eaten right away. 
You don't want to be keeping this for, you know, days and days in the fridge. I have used it the next day. It's okay, but really made to be used right away. This is really good on almost any kind of stew or rich soup where you have, especially where you have smoked meats, cuts through the richness, cuts through the fat, and just brings the dish up a whole nother level. Anyway, that's how you make gremolata. You're gonna see me use that on a lot of things this fall. And you know what? When you make it and try it on one of these types of dishes, you're gonna understand why, because it's so good. Go to the site, get the ingredients, and as always, enjoy. Pork and beans and greens, or at least my Italian version of pork and beans. And as you know, beans and greens, very popular for New Year's in the South. So uh, they say if you eat beans and greens, usually black-eyed peas, uh, you're going to have a very prosperous new year. You know, no guarantees, but it's not going to hurt. All right, so we're going to take our mortar and pestle, and we're going to grind some herbs. I got some black pepper, some dried rosemary, some fennel seed, salt, some hot pepper. All these are on the uh, site, by the way, ingredient amounts. Some cumin and some dried oregano. So I'm going to make like a southern-style dry rub, only with Italian ingredients. So I'm going to grind it, not quite to a powder, but, you know, pretty well ground. I'm going to add a couple cloves of garlic. I'm going to mash those in. And because of all the friction with the salt and the spices, that's going to mush down to a nice kind of paste, almost like a wet sand. I'm going to put in some brown sugar to kind of caramelize things, a splash of vinegar, and a splash of oil. All right, give that a mix. So that's where we're going to put on our pork shoulder pork roast. So I want you to buy a big old pork shoulder, boneless, and we're just going to cut it in chunks. Now for this recipe, you can just roast that whole shoulder and slice, you know, pieces just like a pork roast. But what I like to do is cut it in, I don't know, six or seven, eight pieces. And you can just follow the muscles in between the uh, layers of fat. It's pretty easy. Trim any excess fat off if you find it. And that way, I can cover this with that wet rub, or a wub, as I call it. And what will happen is you'll get extra caramelization, a little extra crust. I like the crust. All right, I don't care if it's uh, super, uh, you know, moist and tender. I want it kind of crusty and chewy. So we're going to put that in the oven at 350 for about an hour. I'm going to turn them over. I want a nice crust on both sides. You can see the fat coming out, some of the juices. I'm going to put that back in for another half hour. And you're going to see all that caramelization from that rub. I'm sorry, the wub is on there. And look at that. That's beauteous. So that was about an hour and a half altogether. But basically what you want is the outside's kind of crusty, not burnt, but kind of crusty and, and chewy. And the inside is like, you know, fork tender. All right, on to the beans. These are just white kidney beans, cannellini beans. That's one can, some lemon, some garlic, and arugula. Not that prepackaged baby stuff. I wanted full-grown adult arugula, arp arugula, if you will. All right, all the senior citizens got that joke. All right, we're gonna take a pan with a little bit of olive oil sliced that two cloves of garlic, put it in the cold oil, bring it up to temperature, medium heat. When the garlic starts to sizzle, add your beans, add your red pepper, a little pinch of salt, and just cook that on medium heat until the beans get a little kind of sticky. Just a little bit, maybe three or four minutes. Don't let the garlic burn. I'm going to pour in the juice of a lemon that's going to kind of deglaze things. A splash of chicken stock. Stir it around. We're going to add our fully grown adult arugula. And then you're going to stir that around for like one minute, no longer. Turn it off because the heat from the beans and the stock are going to wilt that arugula perfectly. If you wait till it's perfectly wilted in the pan, by the time you plate it here, it's going to be overly wilted. So just when it starts to wilt, take it off the heat. I'm going to put some in a plate here. Spoon over some of my lovely beans, garlic, hot pepper. I'm going to top it with a chunk of that caramelized pork with that beautiful Italian wub on there. Of course, you're gonna drizzle some of the juices over it. And uh, there you go, my version of beans with greens, the New Year's Day classic tradition in the South. And like I said, a little Italian spin. All right, let me take a bite of this. Mmm, oh my God. I mean, you can't fake sounds like that, listen. Mmm, oh, so delicious. And, uh, you know, I know it's usually black-eyed peas and collard greens, but hey, I went with white beans and arugula. And you can't go wrong with a chunk of pork on things. You know, I've said that for years. Simple country home cooking, very rustic translation. There's no recipe, really. It comes out different every time. But anyway, if you go on the site, there'll be some kind of ingredient list. And uh, give it a try. 
And as always, enjoy. Chambat, that's what my family called it. There's the real name, Chambata. Uh, that's thanks to Scott in Boston who helped solve this childhood mystery. I always wondered where the name came from, and you're going to read about that today. Uh, it starts with some sausage, sometimes. Olive oil and garlic that my aunt Joyce, who made this for me, sweated down. All right, she did that before I got there, so I wasn't able to film it. But you know how to saute onions and garlic and sausage uh, until they're translucent. Now, basically what this is is a vegetable stew that is uh, simmered in a tomato mixture. So what she took was a large can of whole peeled tomatoes. She pureed that with her stick blender. She also had a small can of tomato sauce. So basically she had about 36 ounces, just over two quarts of uh, tomato puree when she was done. She also put in just a splash of water to rinse that out. We never waste stuff. All right. At least she doesn't. I don't know if I would have done that. But anyway, that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, she threw in some chopped basil, about, I don't know, half a bunch. Salt and pepper to taste. That's up to you. I like to put in some red pepper flakes. Uh, she went with just black pepper. Uh, you know, she was the chef that day. I don't argue with the chef. But if you want a little spicier, some uh, pepper flakes are nice. And here's the other essential ingredients. Potatoes, green beans, uh, zucchini, which was always in there. And we always had that, a lot of that around in the summer, of course. Uh, green and red bell peppers, and s I hope you're sitting down, cut up hot dogs. You got to read the blog today. I'll explain all that, okay? So what she does in the simmering, well, it's not simmering yet, but it will be. In the soon-to-be simmering tomato mixture, she's going to add her potatoes, which you can see she cut into like two or three inch pieces. Her cut up peppers, again, two, three inch pieces are fine and her zucchini and what you're going to do is you're going to simmer the potatoes the zucchini and the pepper in the tomato mixture again it was already uh, started with the sauteed onions and garlic and a little bit of sweet italian sausage i'll have all the amounts on the site today you're going to add that and you're going to cover that and you're going to simmer that for about 15 or 20 minutes and what will happen is the vegetables will start to soften slightly now she was worried here she's like i gotta switch to a bigger pot i said you can't we're already filming. You can't switch pots halfway through. So she added her blanched green beans. Now I'm going to explain on the site today why you don't want to add raw green beans to a tomato sauce. It's a very scientific. I'll, I'll sound like Alton Brown as you read it. All right, so she stirs in her green beans. And then, yes, hot dogs. Now this was always made growing up with some kind of sausage. And I think my grandfather, who made this dish the most often for me in my childhood, uh, and I probably ate this thing three times a week at least in the summer, I just think hot dogs were the cheapest sausage available, and I think that's why he used them. But any sausage will work. It is delicious with hot dogs, believe it or not. All right, so simmer that for 15, 20 more minutes more, maybe even more than that, until the potatoes are tender, the vegetables are tender, and you have an incredibly flavorful vegetable stew. Hey, you vegetarians, of course you can leave out the meat. But uh, try it with the hot dogs. It's really good. Of course it's good with any kind of Italian sausage, sweet, hot, you name it. Visit the site. Uh, I think interesting article today. And enjoy. Enjoy.